Today is the 7th anniversary of the Nintendo Switch, my absolute favorite console of all time. From the hardware itself to the software lineup we've gotten over the years, I think Nintendo has absolutely killed it this generation, both in terms of amazing first party supports, but also in terms of getting some awesome third party games on the console too. So yeah, I... I have a very big Nintendo Switch collection, and today I wanted to go over every single game that I own. So grab some popcorn and get ready to listen to me rant about 1-2 Switch. You know, I always like that because this game has a 1 in the title. For me, at least, it's always been just the first game I, uh, you know, have alphabetically in my collection because it is the first Nintendo Switch game. I think this game gets a little too much hate. I know that might be a hot take, but hear me out. Was it overpriced at $50? Absolutely, no question about that. Should it have been a pack-in with the Nintendo Switch back in 2017? Probably. But if you have the right group, this game is actually a decent amount of fun. And the same can be said for its sequel, Everybody 1-2 Switch, but it's definitely not as good. <laughs> you know, they tried to add this uh, MC Horus character here, and I don't like what he's cooking. But there are still some fun mini games in this one. You know, they have, I mean, they basically just have musical chairs, but that's kind of fun. And they have the color shoot or photo shoot one where you have to try to replicate the color given to you with your camera on your phone. It was definitely cool to see Nintendo attempt a Jackbox style game that uses uh, cell phones instead of just their own controllers. But it didn't really work out. I mean, for $30, I got my money's worth out of this game, but I can see why a lot of people didn't like it. And if you're wondering why I'm showing everybody 1-2 Switch now, you know, I'm going in alphabetical order in this video, but I do have a couple of rules, as you'll see as we go through. If it's a sequel, I just go ahead and put it with the original game, so like, yeah, this has an E in the uh, in the title, but I don't care. It's going with 1-2 Switch. I'm not going to separate these two games that are part of the same series. Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp. I learned last year that I'm not really a big Advance Wars fan. I love Fire Emblem, but I think when you take away the character from Fire Emblem and the consequences, and you just fill the game with a bunch of kind of just nameless, you know, units that you use per level, a lot of the appeal is lost on me. I get that this game has a very dedicated following, and I'm super happy it got a remake, but not for me necessarily. Adventure Academia The Fractured Continent, so yeah. This is going to be inevitable with a collection of this size. There are a lot of games in this video that I have not played, and this one's still sealed, as you can see. I don't typically buy games that I don't intend on playing. Pretty much everything in my collection is something that I want to play eventually. However, there have been some impulse purchases that are like, okay, if Wario64 tweets this for $10... I'm probably just going to buy it, why not? Maybe in the future if I want to sell it, I can for a little bit of profit. But typically I just buy these and then they sit on the shelf. I think this is a visual novel of some kind. Nope, I was completely wrong. Magic Weapon School, get ready for a new JRPG adventure. Build your party of unique students with 10 different species and over 80 personality traits to choose from. That's funny that there's different species when they're talking about students. I assume this was all humans, but I guess I was wrong there. Control your students in real time and guide them to victory against the monster horde. So it's not a visual novel. Maybe I'm more intrigued in this game than I thought. I think I do have a couple visual novels on the Switch from uh, P-Cube as a publisher. I typically avoid they, they publish a lot of that kind of stuff but this one once again this you know these games pop up for cheap sometimes and i'm just like yeah why not eterno blade 2 from a core cell this is a sequel to a 3ds game that i always thought looked really cool and the sequel came out on switch and i saw this for cheap on ebay one time and i was like you know what that's something i'll definitely get to eventually i don't know if they ever ported the first eterno blade to switch but it's just a really cool 2d hack and slash kind of game that i always thought looked super interesting here we have our first limited run release. You're going to see a lot of this logo down here in the bottom right in this video. This is something I got from a blind box. I did a video about a year or two ago opening a bunch of blind boxes from limited run. Every year they do a buyout sale where they just sell the games for a little bit cheaper, but you also just get a random game. This was back when I didn't have that many limited run games. So I was like, you know what? I'll take the chance, see what I get. So we'll see a couple of games in here that I maybe wouldn't have bought necessarily. Although this one I did think looked kind of cool. You're basically like partying with a devil or something like that. I don't know exactly what the gameplay is actually like, but I definitely like the aesthetic of this game. AI, the Somnium Files, Nirvana Initiative, or I, the Somnium Files. I never actually knew how to pronounce the titles of these games. I'm missing the first one, so I haven't played too much of this. I started it, and then they were basically asking you questions at the start of the game, like, did you play the first game? And I was like, oh... 
I, I really should pl probably play that first, right? But that game is very expensive, so I just haven't gotten around to buying it and then playing it. But I actually have the special edition for this game. I'll go over all my collector's editions at the end of the video. But this is a visual novel, I believe, from the creator of the Zero Escape series. I love 999 on the DS. Never played its sequels, but uh, this one always looks super interesting to me. And I wanted to pick up the sequel before it got pricey like the first game. I don't think that really ended up happening. I think this game's actually pretty cheap, but the first game is still very expensive. Alex Kidd in Miracle World Deluxe. I haven't played this one, but it's always cool to see Sega just bringing back random old IP like this. I mean, I, I shouldn't say random. Alex Kidd is not a random IP. I mean, this was a very prominent game on the Master System. But uh, yeah, Alex Kidd in Miracle World Deluxe, published by Merge Games, so Sega didn't do it themselves. But there are a couple games on the Switch that... Uh, Square Enix and Sega and I think a few others have just kind of outsourced to other publishers in a weird way like Panzer Dragoon is one that's I think Forever Entertainment did. I, I do have that one so we'll look at that in a bit but uh, yeah there's a lot of games like that on Switch where the original major publisher I guess didn't want to deal with it so they just give it to like a smaller more uh, more indie sized publisher which is just kind of weird but still cool nonetheless. Alien Isolation, the collection, this is another limited rum release. This came in not too long ago, so I haven't gotten a chance to play it. I'd always heard great things about Alien Isolation on the 360. I think it's, like, pretty much considered the uh, the team that made it. It's, like, their best game. So I was kind of always expecting a sequel to come out, and then that just never happened. But they ported it to Switch. I think it's a pretty good port. It has all the DLC, so definitely a cool one to have. Animal Crossing New Horizons. I kind of fell off this game faster than a lot of people, I think. I love New Leaf on the 3DS. It's one of my most played 3DS games. I maybe put 50 hours into New Horizons, you know. I was working retail at the time of when this game came out, so in general, life was a little hectic to say the least. I was working a lot of overtime during that, during that very trying time in the world. So Animal Crossing wasn't something that was at the forefront of my attention, but it's fine. I think that, you know, they added a lot of content to it with the Happy Home Paradise DLC and updates over time. At launch, I think it was definitely a little bit too bare bones, but I like the new crafting elements and stuff that they added. I think they did take a lot of steps towards making Animal Crossing a better series overall. I just hope they can follow up with an even better sequel to this one. Another code of recollection. This one that just came out a couple of weeks ago. I played through it, didn't do a review of it because uh, this game's pretty niche and I figured a review for this would probably bomb on my channel. But this is a remake collection of Trace Memory for the DS as well as another code uh, R on the Wii, which only got released in Europe and Japan originally. I really like this game. I, you know, I played Trace Memory for the first time when this was announced. I think I prefer playing a visual novel on the DS if I can, because I don't know. I, maybe it's because I played 999 when I was a kid, but it kind of just feels like visual novels are at home on the DS. Even, you know, beyond 999, you know, there's Professor Layton and Ace Attorney. But they did a great job with this remake. You know, they gave it really nice visuals, great, you know, score. I uh, really like the characters. It's a it's a good remake. If you have not played Trace Memory and you don't have a DS or something, I would definitely recommend checking out this this collection of both games. And I mean, yeah, if you're in America, this is the only way to play the second game without modding your Wii or Wii U or something. So definitely a cool game for Nintendo to bring back for sure. Ark Survival Evolved. So back in 2022, I actually got a sponsorship opportunity from Wildcard Studios to do a video on the eShop Ark Dino Discovery game. And at the time, I was like, oh, cool, this is my first sponsorship opportunity. I'm going to go out and buy Ark Survival Evolved on the Switch because I had always heard it's super bad. It was horrible, worse than I could have ever imagined. I think they did re-release the game, right? They they kind of fixed a lot of it, but I wanted to play this original version of Ark Survival Evolved on the Nintendo Switch, and it is just horrible. You know, I was going through Nintendo's YouTube channel downloading trailers for this video, Whenever there is a trailer that is live action for 50 seconds and then there's 10 seconds of gameplay at the end, that's how you know you have a stinker on your hands. ARMS! This is another one of those early 2017 Nintendo Switch first party games from Nintendo. I love this game. I I didn't play it too much when it first came out, actually. You know, I, I of course I got it at release, but I, I think it was around the time that Dr. Coil came out, which was, I think, the end of support for this game, essentially, and around December of 2017. That's when I really got into it. That's when I really started playing the party crashes, going for badges. I really like the characters of ARMS. I like the world. I like the music. I like the gameplay. I know for some people it's a little shallow, but... I, I love this game, and I, I really hope we get a sequel. I think Men Men being in, in Smash Bros. is, at the very least, it gives me hope that we might get an ARM sequel. The only issue is the developer 
makes Mario Kart. So why wouldn't they just work on Mario Kart? <laughs> but yeah, I really like ARMS and I hope we get a sequel one day. Ari and the Secret of Seasons. Yeah, this one I actually found at Goodwill Outlet. So I paid like 25, 30 cents for it. I have nothing to say about this, but we found it at Goodwill and I, uh, I mean, I wasn't just going to leave it. We actually found two copies of it. I have another one in the closet, but yeah, this is a random game from Modus. Join Ari on a grand adventure full of enemies, puzzles, and discovery. Maybe it's fun. I don't know. We've got a couple of Assassin's Creed collections here. So Assassin's Creed, the Ezio collection, as well as Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered, which includes Liberation, which is the Vita game. I don't have the Rebel collection. I still need to get that. Assassin's Creed is a series that like, I like it. And I want to enjoy it more. I've only played through two all the way. And then I played a lot of Odyssey as well as mostly Origins, actually. Origins I played way more of than Odyssey. And I really liked Origins. Of course, at that point, that was when they were already like rebooting it and making it more RPG focused. It's one of those things where there's just so many games in the series at this point that it's just completely overwhelming. I started Brotherhood after I finished two, like, I don't know, five years ago. And I could already tell like Brotherhood was a significant improvement over two, but I just kind of fell off of it. Maybe I'll go back to it eventually. I don't know if these Switch ports are the way to do so. Maybe, maybe I should play it on PS4 instead. I remember, I think it was... I think it was three I remember seeing in a Nintendo Direct, and it just looked like it was chugging, man. So I'm not sure if I would ever play these on Switch necessarily. Astral Chain from Platinum Games. Now, this is one of my absolute favorite Nintendo Switch games. I adore this game. This was kind of a an eye-opening moment for me when it comes to Platinum Games, because at this point, I had tried to play Bayonetta 1 on the Wii U back in like 2014, and I didn't really like it. But then Astral Chain came out, and I was just immediately like, oh, man. This is so good. Seeing this new IP from Nintendo and Platinum come out so strong in 2019, which is one of the Switch's best years, was just so refreshing. And then it kind of gave me that lens that I needed going into 2022 to play through Bayonetta 1 and 2 and really enjoy them more than I had ever before. And then Bayonetta 3, which I think rivals this game actually in some ways in terms of quality. But Astral Chain, if you have not played it, this is one of the best action games ever. Certainly one of the best action games on Switch. I highly recommend it if you are a fan of what Platinum has done with Bayonetta, with Vanquish, with Nier Automata. Definitely give Astral Chain a chance. Astria Ascending. I never saw anybody talking about this game really, but it kind of reminds me of what Vanillaware does. It's a 2D kind of hand-drawn looking JRPG. Never got a chance to play it, but it looked really cool. Astro Knight from Funstock. This was another one of those Wario 64 games where I think it was $10 on Amazon one day and I was like oh this looks kind of cool has a very nice like black and white 2d art style I like games like this you know there's no physicals of this on switch but like box boy I like that art style <laughs> uh you know I, I like when indie games go for the style I haven't played this one it's a one bit metroidvania love metroidvania so this is something that even though I bought it just because it was you know cheap on Amazon it's actually something that I think does look pretty cool here we have the Atari 50 the anniversary celebration I like going for these collections on Switch, even though I, I mean, this one's not even open. Uh, I just like having a modern way to play these games whenever I would want to. You know, there's not very many, you know, use cases where I'll be like, oh, I really need to play some Atari games, but it's cool to have these on Switch. I have a couple of the Pac-Man ones or the Bandai Namco ones, and you'll see as we get further into my collection that I just have a lot of collections and older ports of games from previous console generations on the Switch. All right, these next several, I'm going to go through a little bit more quickly because I haven't played most of them. However, I'm very intrigued by this franchise. So I was going for a full set before they get super expensive because I do, you know, I don't do too much predictive buying on the Switch, but this and another series in particular, which we'll get to when we get to the L games, I have a feeling these might get kind of pricey. So we have the Atelier. I think this is the Dusk Trilogy here. This was a Play Asia release, so it's in English, but there's no ESRB down here. This has Atelier Aisha Deluxe, Atelier Esha and Logi Deluxe, and Atelier Shally Deluxe. All of these are PS3 games, so had to get this. Atelier Liddy and Suel, Atelier Lalua, Atelier Sophie 2, Atelier of Ryza, and this is the one that really got me intrigued by this franchise because this is like the more modern trilogy of Atelier games, which actually looks like it has a lot more like modern JRPG kind of combat elements on top of all the, you know, synthesizing mechanics of the Atelier series. So this is the series that I really wanted to get into the most. We also have Atelier Ryza 2, Atelier Ryza 3, Atelier Marie Remake. This just came out last year. And finally, Nelk in the Legendary Alchemist Ateliers of the New World. Yeah, that's a lot of... That's a lot of Ateliers. Now, I actually did play Atelier Marie Remake last year. I finished it, and 
maybe not the best first impression. At that point, I already bought most of these games because, you know, Rise looked really cool. Atelier Marie Remake, I mean, this is the first Atelier game. They didn't really do much to modernize the mechanics. I like the art style, I like the music, I like the vibes, but it was just kind of an archaic little monotonous uh, synthesizing simulator. With, I mean, the, the combat was just really mundane, and the friendship stuff wasn't really as in-depth as I would like, so I'm hoping that's just because it was the first game in the series, maybe the remake just didn't do enough to modernize it, I'm hoping Atelier Ryza and, and like Sophie too, I know that one was newer, I hope I enjoy those more, if not, maybe all of these will get listed on eBay, because this is... This is a lot of ateliers, like I said. Here we have Away, Journey to the Unexpected from a plug-in digital. I remember seeing this, I think, in a... Either, it was either like an indie showcase or it might have just actually been in a full-blown direct. This game has a super cool art style where it uses like 2D models, but it's in like a 3D environment. I thought this looked super cool. It ended up not getting great reviews, if I recall, but it's something that uh, I actually got this from one of the limited run blind boxes. So kind of worked out that way. Still haven't gotten a chance to try it out, but this one I always thought looked uh, pretty interesting. Balan Wonderworld. I mean, if nothing else, I'll, I'll give them this. That's a pretty cool character design. Botan Kaidos 1 and 2 HD Remaster. This is one of my biggest uh, backlog shames of 2023. I was so excited when this came out or when it was announced back in February of last year. And they did do a physical release only through, you know, Play Asia, or, you know, those types of websites. So no a English release in America, but this does have English on the cartridge and it has like the English spine and everything. If you aren't aware, these are GameCube JRPGs that use like card and deck building from Monolith Soft, the creators of Xenoblade. And Xenoblade is one of my favorite series of all time. So I've always wanted to check this out. I love the art style. Um, I, you know, maybe I'm not the most keen on like deck building games, but I always wanted to give this a shot. I actually bought it digitally. So that's why this is still sealed. Played a little bit of it. It's one of those things where, and you know, you, we'll get to this a lot in this video. JRPGs are really long. <laughs> So even if it's a game I really like or a game I'm really excited to try out, sometimes I just don't have the time to really sink my teeth into it. It's unfortunate, but I guess that's just kind of the way things go. But I'm hoping to eventually go back and at least play the first one. Like, I have to at least play through and beat Bot and Kaidos 1, hopefully this year. But then there's also, like, Xenogears and Xenosaga, which I want to play probably even more than Bot and Kaidos. But I'm also kind of waiting for those to get remade because I think at least Xenosaga will. So I, I don't freaking know anymore, man. Here we have a bunch of Bayonetta games on the Switch here. I have all of them physically. So Bayonetta 1 didn't get a physical release on the Nintendo Switch until 2022, right before Bayonetta 3 came out. Before that, it was only included as a download in Bayonetta 2. So I already had this game, but I thought it was really cool that they went back and actually gave it a physical release because at that point, I think it might have already gone back up in price, but there was like a, a physical version in Japan, like the Climax Edition or something, that was just super expensive. So it was really nice to see them give America and Europe a physical release of this game by itself. And then of course, yeah, I have the first print copy of Bayonetta 2, Bayonetta 3, and Bayonetta Origins Cereza and the Lost Demon. Now, I already talked about Platinum quite a bit with Astral Chain, but Bayonetta 3, I really like this game. Like, I got it early. If you remember back on the channel, I was making videos and giving my thoughts on it before it even came out. And I got a lot of scrutiny because it ended up being that a lot of people didn't like this game. They didn't like the story. I don't get it, man. <laughs> I really do think that this is far and away the best Bayonetta game. In fact, Bayonetta 1 and 2, I appreciate those games. I think they're good, not great. Bayonetta 3, I think, is a fantastic game. And that comes from the story, that comes from the gameplay, even the presentation and the performance on Switch. I didn't really have any hiccups. I know some people had a lot of issues with the performance on Switch. I never really noticed anything. Maybe my eyes just weren't working that day, but I thought Bayonetta 3 was a slam dunk from Platinum Games. And then Bayonetta Origins, Cereza and the Lost Demon, I mean... I don't know. I, I was really positive on this game when it came out. And I do think it's really good, but I don't really feel anything towards it. Like, I, I would be fine if this game didn't exist. It's cool that it does exist, and it's cool that it, you know, got a physical release. I don't know if this one should have been full price necessarily, but I uh, I enjoyed it for what it was. Bendy and the Ink Machine, only at GameStop. I didn't realize this was a, a GameStop exclusive. Uh, I actually got this from a bundle with a couple other Switch games because I needed... I think it was Tetris 99, which we'll get to. I think it was included in a bundle of those. So quite frankly, I don't have much interest in this one. Big Brain Academy Brain versus Brain. Now this, this is a good Nintendo Switch game. I grew up with Big Brain Academy on the DS. I never played Wii Degree on the Wii, but it was really cool in 2021 to see Nintendo revive a franchise like this. You know, I think there are certain Nintendo franchises like Endless Ocean that we just kind of assume that Nintendo will never bring back. But Big Brain Academy Brain versus Brain 
they announced that holiday. They released it for 30 bucks, and it was a lot of fun. I love the art style. I love my boy, Dr. Loeb. They had some really cool online elements. There was a lot of like cool customization you could do with your character, which gave me a lot of incentive to play more, play with my girlfriend. I, I really like this game, and it's something I, I want to go back to and play more. Bill and Ted's excellent retro collection. Now, on the one hand, I'm ashamed here. I bought this because of FOMO. So at the end of last year, Limited Run had to delist this game because their license expired, which frankly kind of sounds a little bit shady. I will not lie, but I don't feel too bad because as I mentioned, I'm going for all these like collections of old games and whatever your opinion on Limited Run is, you know, I, I get it. If you don't want to support them, that's fine. I have chosen to support them because I want these games physically. This is such a cool thing to exist. I'm not even a Bill and Ted fan necessarily, but to have this collection of old NES games and Game Boy games from that era of a licensed, you know, Bill and Ted game, I think that's really cool. I think it's really cool that Limited Run is bringing stuff like this back. They're bringing back Felix the Cat from Konami. Like these things would not happen without them. I don't know how so many people that claim to be, you know, big on game preservation. I don't know how you can say you love game preservation and not think this is just really cool. Even if like taking out your opinion on Limited Run as a company, this with my thumb right here covering that logo, this is really cool. Here we have two copies of The Binding of Isaac Afterbirth Plus. I actually just picked up this one recently and this is the original print from 2017 with the, uh, the ugly spine. <laughs> they did do a physical release recently or maybe like a year or two ago of The Binding of Isaac Repentance, I believe it's called, which has even more content. Binding of Isaac is a game that my brother like freaking loves. Like I think thousands of hours in this game. So I saw a lot of it growing up and I also just, I enjoy it, but it's not something I ever like got crazy into. When this came out in 2017, that was definitely like the most I played it, maybe 10 hours, but I know there are crazy, crazy Binding of Isaac diehards. I can't compete with that. Bioshock The Collection. So back in, I think 2020, 2K decided it would be a good idea to release three different collections on the same day so they released the bioshock collection they released the borderlands at legendary collection and they released the xcom 2 collection which isn't really a collection but i guess it includes all the dlc i don't know why they thought releasing all of these on the same day was a good idea i think it was also around the same time that like xenoblade came out on the switch so just kind of poor timing in general but bioshock the collection having it on switch once again just all of these collections bringing it making the switch you know back in 2017 it was such a big deal when a big third party game would come over even if it was from that ps3 360 you know seventh gen era bioshock is a franchise that's I'll, I'll be honest here this might give me a lot of scrutiny i really like bioshock infinite i've tried to play the first bioshock a couple times and i really liked watching my brother play it when we were younger but when i go back to it now i don't know i kind of just have a hard time getting into it and i know that's like crazy because bioshock is one of the most loved games ever made but i don't know i think it's just like a headspace thing i need to be in the right headspace when i play bioshock so whenever i get to that point i will have this collection has all three games bioshock infinite i did really enjoy from what i played blasphemous 2 yeah i'm missing the first one that one's pretty pricey i think it was a limited run release this is a 2d metroidvania game with just this absolutely sick art style, man. I hate to do the Dark Souls thing, but imagine like a 2D Dark Souls game with like pixel art. This game looks freaking beautiful. I, I have the first game digitally, played quite a bit of it, really enjoyed it. Then it want this game to come out and get super pricey. So I think I bought it when Best Buy had their buy to get one. So haven't got a chance to start this because I still need to finish the first game, but Blasphemous is awesome. Here's a fun one, the Blaster Master Zero Trilogy. I love NT Creates. NT Creates is freaking awesome. Love pretty much everything I've played from them over the past, you know, six or seven years. And this one has this really cool slipcover from Limited Run Games. I got this on eBay for, I'm not even joking, $30 for all three of them. I don't know if the person that listed it uh, didn't realize what they had. I think they saw listings for just the slipcover for 30 and thought, oh, it's worth 30 I kind of feel bad, but it's not like I'm flipping it. Like, I love this series, so... I'll take the good deal. I do genuinely feel a little bit bad about that because the person must just not have known. But uh, Blaster Master Zero, I still haven't played the third one, but Blaster Master Zero 1 and 2, I actually did a lot of videos on my old channel when they came out. I adore these games. I love Blaster Master. I have a Blaster Master Zero shirt. I have a little pin of the Sophia 3. I love the series. Uh, like I said, though, I still haven't finished the third one or even started it, actually. But Blaster Master Zero 1 and 2, I can attest, are very good games. This one has all the DLC in there, so like Shantae and stuff, which is really cool. And then Blaster Master Zero 3, I still need to get to.
But that's not all, because I also have the Blaster Master Zero Trilogy. I saw this at PAX West, I think, either last year or maybe the year before. This is a really weird release. If you go on eBay and you search Blaster Master Zero Trilogy, you'll see what I just showed in the slipcover. But you'll see a lot of copies of this game without the ESRB. But I was at PAX West last year, like I said, the year before. I can't remember which. And NT Creates always has a booth. I always check it out. I usually end up buying something there. And I noticed they had copies of this game with the ESRB logo. So I don't know like how limited this was. I don't know if it was ever really sold in like stores. But it's all three games. One cartridge has the DLC for the first two games, I believe. Yeah, all DLC from Blaster Master Zero 1 and 2 comes preloaded. This is a... Pretty cool release. Gonna stay sealed because I have the other games physically in there uh, open, and I think I have three digitally. But um, yeah, this is this is a cool one. Blood Rain and Blood Rain 2 revamped. Once again, I just always love seeing older games come to the Switch and just modern platforms in general. I had Blood Rain as a kid, although admittedly I never really played it that much. It's something I have like a weird nostalgia for in that I didn't really play it, but I always had it on my shelf. I think I watched my brother play it some growing up. Seeing these two come to the Switch is super cool. There's also that Blood Rain like 2D, I think it's Fresh Bites is what it's called, that newer Blood Rain game that came out recently that has a physical copy on Switch. I don't have that, but having these on the Switch is awesome. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, and I guess I'll just show it right here too. A Bloodstained Curse of the Moon 2, Missing the First Curse of the Moon. I, you know, despite loving Into Creates, which they made this Curse of the Moon 2, and then uh, despite liking Castlevania from what I've played, I kind of feel weird playing these games without really diving deeper into Castlevania. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's dumb, but you know, I started Curse of the Moon 1 a couple years ago, and I was like, man, this is really cool. I, I've, I freaking love this game. But then I stopped myself because I was like, man, I haven't even played Symphony of the Night. So I don't think I get to appreciate this. I, I'm i not trying to, like, gatekeep it for myself, but I feel like I need to go back and really play a lot of the more classic Castlevania games before I get to appreciate Bloodstained. I know this one didn't get as great of reviews as the Curse of the Moon games from Indie Creates, which is funny because this was, like, the main game. But yeah, I feel like I need to go back, play through the Castlevania Anniversary Collection, play through the Advanced Collection, and at the very least play Symphony of the Night. Like, I have to play those games before I can truly appreciate what Bloodstained is as a modern revival of Castlevania. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's what I've kind of been doing here. And then here we have Blossom Tales of the Sleeping King and Blossom Tales to the Minotaur Prince. These are pixel 2D uh, kind of Zelda likes, top down 2D Zelda likes on the Switch. This one was a pretty big deal when it came out because the eShop wasn't just a hellscape at the time. So, whenever a high quality indie game came out back then, it was a big deal. Uh, I didn't really hear too many people talk about Blossom Tales 2. I'm sure it might be uh, even better, but definitely happy to have these physically. Blue Reflection Second Light. Now, I think this might be our first example of me doing something a little dumb. Well, I'm sure there's already been other examples of that, but uh, <laughs> I have decided to go for a couple publisher sets. NIS America is a, a publisher I think we've actually avoided so far, but Koei Tecmo, this is published by them. I think it's actually, this is basically an Atelier game, but like more modern setting, schoolgirl setting. Um, it's made by Gus, which is the same developers of Atelier, which is why I bought it. Wanted to get all of those games, so that's why I bought this one. Here we have the Borderlands Legendary Collection, which includes Borderlands 1, the pre-sequel, and Borderlands 2. I still want to get Borderlands 3. That came out last year on the Switch. Borderlands is a series I kind of conflicted on. Like, I've only played 2 and a little bit of 1 back when it came out, and then 2 I played um, maybe in like 2013 or 2014 on the PS3, so I haven't played the Switch versions. It's a lot of fun. But it's, it's kind of like this, I have this thing where I feel like, is a game actually good if you're only having fun because you're playing with friends? Does anybody else ever get that? Like, I don't know if Borderlands is actually like a really great game, or if I just really enjoyed it because I was playing with friends, because I know if I played it alone, I would not have that great of a time, but I mean, it's designed for multiplayer, so I don't know if that really is fair to the game. I'm not sure if I'm making sense here, but I don't know. Borderlands, if you have, if you have a group of friends playing it with you, it's a lot of fun. Otherwise, though... Eh, it's kind of boring. A Boy and His Blob. I remember seeing ads for this in Shonen Jump magazine. I used to get it monthly out of subscription for Shonen Jump here in America back in the day. I remember seeing ads for this game on the Wii, and when they finally brought it to the Switch, I was like, oh, I'm so excited to play that finally. Still haven't played it, but <laughs> super cool that this is on Switch. I've heard that original game on the NES, or those original games. I think there's a couple of them. I've heard they aren't that great, but this new game on the Wii was a lot better. I think it's a new game, right? Like, this isn't 
this isn't really a remake. I, I Sorry, I shouldn't say it was a remake. I think I might have. This is a new game, I'm pretty sure. But I always thought it looked really cool. Love the blob, of course. Bravely Default 2. Now, we just heard on Twitter recently that we might be getting some Bravely news this year. This is one I haven't gotten to, unfortunately. But Bravely Default as a series, and in general, the Square Enix underline font series, you know, Octopath, all these games, they all interest me so greatly. But it is just one of those things where JRPGs take a lot of time. I think this game looks awesome. But I'm not going to play this without playing the first game, without playing Bravely Second. Probably not even without playing through Octopath, which we'll talk about when we get to it, which I have played some, but Bravely Default 2, still on the backlog. Cadence of Hyrule Crypt of the Necrodancer featuring The Legend of Zelda. This game is awesome. I, it was a really exciting time in 2018. I feel like, like I mentioned with, uh, with Astral Chain, like the Switch was just in its stride, man. Just every announcement felt just so exciting. You know, we were getting those franchise staples like Animal Crossing and Luigi's Mansion, but then we were getting new stuff like Damon X Machina, Astral Chain, and then a crazy indie crossover for The Legend of Zelda with Crypt of the Necrodancer, a game I had played and I enjoyed, which we'll talk about when we get to it, but uh, yeah, this was unexpected to say the least. I was really optimistic we would get more indie crossovers with Nintendo IP, and I guess maybe we kind of did with Advance Wars because WayForward made that remake of those games, but I was hoping for more stuff like this, like just an entirely new game, a genre Zelda had never been in, a rhythm, turn-based dungeon crawler kind of game. Uh, yeah, we never really saw anything else like this from Nintendo, but Brace Yourself Games, awesome developer. I played, I think it's Rift of the Necrodancer, that's their new game coming out. I played that at PAX West last year, super excited for it, but if you haven't played Cadence of Hyrule, really cool game. Here we have the Capcom Fighting Collection. I think it's awesome how many collections Capcom has made on the Nintendo Switch. Still haven't cracked the seal on this bad boy, but kind of like the Atari one, just always nice to have these. I mean, look how many games are in this. You got Gym Fighter. You got, is that Cyberbots? Like, there were games in here that, like, I don't think anybody had ever even heard of. I think there actually might have been some, like, Japanese exclusive games coming over to America for the first time, which is just super cool. Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. This is a, uh, this is a weird one. You know, you look back to 2018, a few months before this came out, we got Tropical Freeze on Switch for 60, which was more than it cost originally, but then they ported this for 40, which was the price it cost originally, but then they removed some of those like 3D world levels, but then they added these really cool Odyssey levels. This is a conflicting release for me. I would say this is the definitive version just from the content because they added DLC to it. Otherwise, if there was no DLC, I would almost maybe say the 3DS version is because the 3DS version has the content from Mario Odyssey, and those levels are fantastic, but you know, it's, it's a Wii U game, right? Like, there was so much, like, inherent, like, gamepad DNA in Captain Toad, where you had to touch the blocks to make a move, you had to spin the wheel on the gamepad to move something up, like, there was so much little stuff like that, that when porting it to Switch, it, like, it doesn't translate that great. You have this little cursor on the screen at all times. It's fine. I don't think it's that big of a deal, but it does feel a little like there was no other option. But either way, Captain Toad is a freaking fantastic game. So happy it came to Switch. Captain Tsubasa, Rise of New Champions. I got nothing, man. I don't know why I bought this. Here we have a couple of those Castlevania collections. I mean, these are the only two on Switch right now, I think. Uh, we have the Anniversary Collection, which I've opened. I've beaten the first Castlevania game. I have made my, 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 I have embarked on my journey to become a Castlevania diehard fan. And I, I mean, even, the, even playing the NES Castlevania game. I enjoyed it, so I I know I'm gonna like the more modern, you know, advanced uh, GBA games and the of course Symphony of the Night and the DS games when they inevitably do a DS collection. So Castlevania, um, even Kid Dracula on here, I really enjoyed what I played of that. But I mean, this is a lot of games to get through before I eventually get to what I presume will be much better games here with uh, Circle of the Moon, Harmony of Dissonance, Aria of Sorrow, and Dracula X. Catherine Full Body. I remember being. When did this game come out? I want to say it came out in like 2012 or so. I remember looking at this game in GameStop as a wee lad, maybe 11 or 12. I'm not sure exactly when it came out, but I, I was pretty young and just being like, damn, I want that game. <laughs> but obviously I couldn't ask my grandma to buy me Catherine. That's not, that's not going to fly. So I never got to play it when I was younger. Eventually when they released full body on PS4, I finally played it. It's fun. I like the story mostly. I mean, the gameplay, that that's the thing, right? You're here for the story and the characters, but the gameplay, eh, you're just jumping blocks, counting sheep. I don't know. It's fine. This one has a, uh, a little keychain. But hey, if you want something from Atlas that isn't Persona or SMT, 
definitely give this one a shot. Cat lateral damage at Remy Oustered. You know, I don't know if this game really needed a, a Remy Ouster because it was a PS4 game originally, I think. It's always weird when a game that, like, is already in HD gets a remaster. I guess we just got Last of Us 2 remastered on PS5, but uh, it's I guess it's weirder coming from indie games. I don't know. I played this game on PS4. I think it was a PS Plus game. Uh, it's fun. You just play as a cat destroying stuff. And this was actually a limited run blind box game I got because uh, they published it. It's not one of their, like, numbered releases, but it, it was eligible for their blind boxes, which is why I have it. Here we have Celeste, just got this one recently from a buyout I did from my friend Caleb. I had this game back in like 2019 from an LRG and I sold it and I was, I regretted selling it, but it actually kind of worked out because the game went down in price. I remember I sold it for like really high because I needed money at the time and it was like pretty pricey, but they've recently re-released it through Fangamer, but I'm glad to have this cover specifically because this cover is beautiful. And then uh, he also had the the alternate cover. This is just an empty uh, box with uh, the thing because Limited Run used to sell like the alternate arts for their games so you could buy them separately but super happy to have this love celeste i don't think it's as great as everybody says it is but it's a really really solid tough 2d platformer i really enjoyed it just not you know my it's not my game of the year 2018 or nothing chaos head noah slash chaos child this is a visual novel i guess kind of like p cube spike chunsoft might be a, a publisher i should maybe stay away from eh anime game has a cool steel book it was cheap. Chicken Range from Fun Box Media. So I actually bought this because it came with one of those like Wii style attachments for the Joy-Con that make the Joy-Con look like a gun. I bought it because of that because I wanted to do a funny stream back when new Pokemon Snap came out when I was trying to, you know, do like some quirky stream content. And I was like, you know, taking pictures of the, the Pokemon, but with a gun. So it was like I was shooting the Pokemon. Uh, yeah, I, I maybe had three viewers for that stream. But <laughs> yeah, this came with a little gun attachment, which is why I bought it. It's just one of those really cheap kind of light gun looking duck hunt type of games. It's probably not very good. Chocobo GP just got this one last year. Uh, this is one of those Play Asia releases where it's in English, of course, but does not have the ESRB. Whenever I can avoid getting the little Saro rating down here, or like the Asian uh, little rating down here, I always do that. So sometimes it means paying more, as you'll see with a lot of the Final Fantasy stuff and Dragon Quest stuff, but it's worth it to me. I'm stupid, but hey, I like it. Uh, Chocobo GP, on the other hand, I do not like <laughs> this game. This game blows, man. So it released a couple years back, and it was free to play, and there was so many horrendous microtransactions like just just some of the worst microtransactions i've ever seen in a video game and then later they they released like a full version where you didn't have to do any of that stuff or pay any of that stuff where you could unlock all of the characters and costumes in the game just by playing and that's when i finally you know jumped on board and, and started playing it the game isn't very fun i you know we'll get to a couple other uh racing games here like kart racers on the switch that i are, are good games but this doesn't even compare. I, I and I know I shouldn't compare everything to Mario Kart, but man, this one's not very good. Chrono Cross, the Radical Dreamers Edition, once again, just so cool that a game like this gets a physical release in 2022, I think is when this came out. That's awesome to me. Uh, haven't gotten a chance to play it, but, um, you know, hopefully they eventually port Chrono Trigger. I don't really understand why they would port this one and not not Chrono Trigger when that's the one everybody wants unless maybe they're remaking that one from the ground up. I know like there's a lot of licensing stuff with that because of Akira Toriyama and I think uh, Shueisha maybe, but give us Chrono Trigger. Come on, you you, you remade it or ported it to the DS. I, I think you can figure it out, Square Enix. Come on, people. The children yearn for Chrono Trigger, not Chrono Cross, although I've heard this is a very good game that they had to fix because I guess when it came out there was a lot of issues with it, but I guess they fixed it eventually. Clive and Wrench, I got this, I think, on Black Friday from GameStop last year. Uh, this was a sealed copy. Like, this is this 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 is a sealed copy. They sold me this, and it was listed as sealed. Love you, GameStop. Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics. Now, this, this is peak video gaming right here. I think, it, once again, like, with Big Brand Academy, similar vibes here. I think it is so cool that Nintendo will just be like, you know what? <laughs> let's bring back clubhouse games now it's not even that like noticeable that it's a a successor to clubhouse games on the ds because that was a lot of card games and while this does have card games in it it's a lot more like general tabletop board games like the little foosball and the chess and the uh, man kala and stuff but having full online on this having the you know two-player games that you can play like this as demonstrated on the box art this was a lot of fun i got a lot of time out of this game and uh yeah i hope we get more stuff like this from nintendo in the future they freaking remade we play tanks bro 
That is awesome. Caller X Malice. I I said P Cube earlier. I I think I I think I mis misunderstood. I think I I I misrepresented what P Cube does. I think they do do a lot of visual novels. I was thinking of Axis. Axis is the publisher that does a lot of visual novels that I typically steer clear of. But this was ten dollars on Amazon, so why 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 not? Why not? All right, so now we have a few mana games to go through. Collection of mana. Is it mana, mana? I've always said mana, but sometimes I might like interchange them. Mana, mana. Uh, this one came out back in 2019. Super cool. It got a physical release. I played through Final Fantasy Adventure back then, and I started Secret of Mana. Um, Final Fantasy Adventure for a Game Boy game? Uh, low, low key? Probably one of the best Game Boy games I played. <laughs> I really enjoyed my time with that game. And then Secret of Mana, I enjoyed what I played of that as well. I just never got the chance to finish it. And then Trials of Mana, this was really cool because it was the first time they ever localized the SNES game, which was kind of weird because at that same E3, they had announced the remake of Trials of Mana, which I also have, which we'll show in a second. But uh, super cool. This came out. I didn't realize until very recently, this never came to other platforms. Like you cannot play Trials of Mana, the original version on PS4. What, what, what are you doing, Square Enix? Bring, bring it to everything. Come on. But yeah, on top of that, we also have Legend of Mana, which I played a little bit of, and uh, it's like more like a god game, kind of. Like, you have to, like, plant your home base. I, I didn't really know what was going on, so I kind of stopped playing it. And then, yeah, the remake of Trials of Mana. So, uh, Mana, I mean, they have that new game coming out. What is it called? Echoes of Mana? Mana? That game looks freaking beautiful. I would love to at least get through Secret of Mana this year, maybe. But, uh, yeah, Mana is a series that uh, I'm definitely interested in but haven't played too much of. Only that original Game Boy game. Colors Live. This was a weird one to see come back. So if you aren't aware, this was like a big deal on the 3DS eShop back in 2011. All the kids had Colors 3D because, you know, we didn't have Flipnote at the time. So we had to have some sort of drawing app on our 3DS. Colors 3D filled that niche perfectly. You could do like layers and stuff. This came to Switch with a pressure point sensitive pin that I had to try out. In fact, it's actually on my desk, funnily enough. I don't know why it's sitting over here. But yeah, you plug it into the audio jack of all things and it has like this little nub that uh, can sense pressure. So just a really cool, unique accessory for the Switch and uh, weird to see the series become a series. Here we have Connect Tank from uh, Natsume. And another classic collection from Konami, the Contra Anniversary Collection. Haven't cracked the seal on this one because, frankly, I've played a lot of these games already over on, like, 3DS Virtual Console and Wii U Virtual Console. But there's some stuff on here I haven't played. Uh, Contra Hardcore, Probotector, Super Probotector, Alien Rebels. I don't even know. What is it? What is, I don't know what's going on here. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not that familiar with Contra. I know I've played Super C and Contra 3. Those are the games I've played through on Virtual Console in the past. I haven't messed with a lot of these other ones, but uh, Contra's fine. I don't know. I'm not the biggest fan of, like, the run-and-gun genre, if you want to call it that. It's, like, it's not quite a beat-em-up, but it's, you know, using guns. I also don't like beat-em-ups, as we'll get to, but always love to see a nice collection of classic games. Here's another really recent one, Cooking Mama Cookstar. If you if you don't remember, back when this came out, there was, there was like, a whole crypto mining bit blockchain drama with this game where people thought it was, like, using your switch to the mine bitcoin or something i think it actually that that might have ended up being true i don't even remember man that was a weird time i think it all got fixed like i don't think i don't think i'm at risk I, if i ever decide to play cooking mama cookstar but this is uh it's weird man that was a weird thing that happened. And then here we have the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, as well as Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled. I don't have Crash 4 yet. I've heard that game's really good. Crash is a series that I, I grew up with, right? I played Crash Bandicoot 1 on the uh, PS1 when I was younger. I had uh, Crash. I had Crash Team Racing on PS2, as well as... Oh, God. There was another PS2 Crash game I had that was like a platform. I can't remember the name of it. But Crash is fine, you know? I don't think it's anything too special. Crash Team Racing, I think, is a, a much better game than, like, these platformers. And maybe Crash 4 will make me a, a, a fully-fledged Crash fan. But uh, I don't I don't think this game deserves all the hype. I think Spyro, which I actually don't have any... I don't have the, the Reignited Trilogy on Switch. I think Spyro is much better than Crash Bandicoot, in my opinion. But uh, that's just me. Ross Code. Now, this one got a lot of hype back when it came out. I think in, like, 2019, 2020. Might be off base with that release date. I uh, haven't heard much about it since, but I, I remember there was like a lot of hype for this game when it first came out, and I think it was pretty cheap on Amazon when I bought it. Crisis Remastered. The only Crisis game I've played is Crisis 3. I played that back on the PS3. I love FPS games. I mean, Call of Duty is like my my my, my child. 
I, I play way too much Call of Duty. That's a fun fact for my Nintendo fan right here. But uh, I love FPS games. Crisis 3 was a lot of fun when I was younger. Always wanted to go back and play Crisis 1 and 2. And, I mean, they ported them all to Switch. So, uh, really cool that they did that. Need to get the other two on Switch. But, yeah, this also has art cards. Or singular singular art card. Yeah, just, just one. There it is. There's our first NIS America game. We have Crystar here. So a year or two ago, I decided I already had like a lot of NIS America games. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to go for a publisher set. I've already done or I've, I've mostly gotten a publisher set for like Square Enix. And of course, a first party Nintendo. NIS America is a kind of like more niche. They, they make more niche games. But I decided I wanted to go for a full set of games from them because most of their games look very interesting to me. And while I don't know if I'll have time to play most of them, these are games I would like to play. They make a lot of like six or seven out of tens. You know, I think that's around what the Metacritic score for Crystar is. And I thought this game looked like a lot of fun. I don't know. I like I like budget kind of janky anime games. I, I can't help it, man. This game looks like fun to me. They also released that Cry Machina game late last year. I had it pre-ordered through Best Buy through the buy to get one and FedEx lost my package, so I don't have that game. Here we have the physical edition of Cuphead on the Nintendo Switch. Fun fact about my YouTube channel, this is one of my most viewed shorts on YouTube. I just went through the little little funnies they have in here. They have like little comic strips in the, uh, in the physical copy of this game. Cuphead's fantastic. Not much to say on it. It's really hard. Uh, I don't think I have actually finished it. I think I got to the final level and it's kind of like bailed out. So I need to go back and do that. But Cuphead is a lot of fun. Never played the Delicious Last Course either. Um, obviously, I didn't finish the main game, but uh, Cuphead is, is a fantastic game with a beautiful art style. Damon X Machina. Now, listen, if you, you might already know this. If you watch a lot of my videos... I am an absolute massive Damon X Machina head. I love this game. Like, if I were to, like, point blank give you three hidden gems on the Switch or, like, underrated games on the Switch, this would be one of them. Like, this would be one of the games I recommend. I'll admit, I don't have much experience with the, the mech combat genre. I tried playing Armored Core 6 late last year when it came out, and I know it's from From Software, so I know, I know this might sound crazy. I didn't really like what I played of that game, and I know Damon X Machina is based on like Armored Core, like it was supposed to be like a, a spiritual successor to Armored Core. I think this game is better. The story is really dumb, but the combat, the visuals, it's all so much fun. Playing with friends, just grinding out missions, almost like a Monster Hunter game for materials. I love this game. I cannot wait for Titanic Scion. Hopefully we get a release date for that this year, but I'm guessing they're going to save that for the Switch 2 at this point. Um, yeah, I, I freaking love Damon X Machina, man. Here we have Danganronpa Decadence, or Decadence? Decadence? Probably Decadence. Uh, this is a collection of all three games. I've only played the first Danganronpa game. It's good. I, I played it on Steam back in like 20, 2018 or something like that. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it enough that like I will I will play these games eventually. I, I enjoyed it to that level. At this point though, I would probably replay the first game. So I have to do that. And these games are kind of long and there's a lot of reading, so I kind of, you know, when I play a visual novel, I kinda I kinda just fall asleep like a little baby because I'm just I, I you know, a lot of reading makes me tired. But uh, Dang and Rappa, it's pretty good. Darksiders War Mastered Edition. I bought this one specifically to do a short, but also because Darksiders looks badass. I mean, just I mean, Mim, Mim will look at this and say, "Hell yeah, absolutely." But this was a misprinted copy where they uh, didn't do the red up here where the Nintendo Switch logo is, and the spine is all all sorts of jank here. And the back, I mean, the back basically looks normal. But uh, yeah, this is Darksiders War Mastered Edition. Darksiders doesn't really need much of an introduction. I know a lot of people said this was like a Zelda like on the 360 back in the day. Um, these did come to Wii U as well. Never got a chance to play them, but I would like to eventually because I like Zelda and the games look cool. Um, there's also Darksiders 2 and 3 on Switch, as well as Darksiders Genesis, which I think is more of like a, a Diablo clone. So super cool that all these games are available on a Nintendo platform. DC Superhero Girls Teen Power. I have no shame. And you want to know why? Bam. Nintendo. Nintendo published this game. Yes. Nintendo, for some, for some reason, Nintendo was like, yes. This year, in 2021, we must publish a DC Superhero Girls Team Power. Like, we just we just have to do it. I don't know why they did it. I really don't know. It's not like there was a dearth of games in 2021. 2021 isn't my favorite year of the Switch, but there was plenty that came out. Yeah, I was going for a full set of Nintendo published games. This was one of the last games I needed, so I had to pick it up. Uh, I'm sure it's fine if you like DC Superhero Girls, but it's a game for kids, so I'm not really going to... 
I'm not going to be a critic of this game. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's my place to say if this game is good or not. Here's a certified Wii classic, Day Blob. Another game kind of like a boy in his blob, funnily enough, uh, that came out on the Wii that I always really wanted to play and I just never could afford it as a kid or I just never got around to buying it as a kid. So seeing it come to Switch was really exciting. The physical of this game and the second game are like weirdly, like, not necessarily expensive, but they don't really pop up that often. And when they do, it's like European. So getting one with the ESRB is a little bit harder. Let me know in the comments below if you've played this on Switch, is this a, a platform that you should play the blob one? Because I know it was designed for the Wii, so would I be better off playing this on the Wii? It looks like it supports the Pro Controller. But uh, yeah, I don't know if this would be better to play on the Wii or if I should just play it on Switch. Probably just Switch for, you know, ease of convenience, but really cool that this came to Switch either way. Deadly Premonition, A Blessing in Disguise. This is a sequel to Deadly Premonition, of course. This is a game from, I believe, Swery is the developer's name. Deadly Premonition is like the room, but for video games where people... Like, they know it's not a good game, but they kind of just, like, l really like it. I haven't gotten around to playing the first game, so, of course, I haven't played this, but I've always been very intrigued by the series. The fact that it is a series with multiple games is crazy. I don't know, did this ever come to other platforms? I remember when it was announced in that, I think, 2020 Nintendo Direct, it was just crazy that Nintendo was, like, reviving this game. Nintendo, I don't think, was involved with this. They didn't publish it, but the fact that it came to Switch exclusively, at least at launch, was just really weird. Still have some stickers on this one. We have a Diablo 3 Eternal Collection. This has that uh, that Ganondorf, I think it's Transmog, is that what they call the the little, little, little armor sets in Diablo? Uh, Diablo is a series I was always super interested in, and I actually finally played Diablo 4. Uh, well, I, I didn't really finally play it. I played it like before it even came out. I had like the early edition of Diablo 4 on my PS5, and I really enjoyed it. I don't know if I enjoyed it enough to go back and play these older games, because they also did Diablo 2 on Switch. I think it's only digital, but uh, I don't know. Diablo, it's a fun game. Maybe, I don't know if there's like a local co-op where I only need one one copy of the game, but this might be a fun game for me and my girlfriend to play through. She likes uh, Minecraft Dungeons, which I know is like baby's first Diablo game. So maybe this will be fun for us to play together or something. Um, I'm not sure how it runs on Switch. I'm not, I don't know. Maybe it may, let me know in the comments below. Is Diablo 3 on Switch? Like, is that a good version of Diablo? Would you recommend? Is it worth it for the, the Ganondorf skin? Here we have a bunch of Digimon games, kind of like the Atelier series where I haven't really gotten to these, but I know I will enjoy them and I do eventually get to them because I know, I know it's not Pokemon. I get it, but I love Pokemon. <laughs> So, given that, I feel like, you know, I like JRPGs, I like Pokemon, I'm probably gonna like Digimon when I eventually play it. So we have Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth, this is the complete edition, I think this, is this two games? I thought this was two games, I guess I'm crazy, this isn't two games, is it? It's just Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth. As well as Digimon World Next Order, now, I'm not too positive, let me know if you know in the comments below, I think this was exclusive to Bandai Namco Store, because ESRB copies of this game are very expensive. Like, like very expensive, like way more expensive than they should be. So when I saw it pop up for, I think like 30 or 40 one day, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to get this before it gets even more pricey. I know there's like a bundle that came with like a shirt or a hat or a keychain or something, but even just by itself, this, this game is pretty, pretty expensive. This is an older game that they ported to the Switch, I think just last year. And then we also have Digimon Survive. This game was delayed for so long, I feel like, but it eventually finally came out. It's a Digimon tactics game, I think. Here's a certified banger, the Dio Field Chronicle. That's right. I like this game. You know, it was in that period in 2022 where Square Enix was just releasing like eight games a week for some reason. They kind of just sent it out to die. I wish they had given this game a more proper marketing push, given it some more room to breathe, maybe worked out some sort of exclusivity deal with Nintendo just to give it that more, not, not because I want it to be exclusive, but because typically when Square Enix works with Nintendo, first of all, the game ends up being a banger, which this is, but also I feel like it just gets way more attention in general. I mean, just look at what happened with Octopath 2, a game sold much worse than the first game, which I mean, yeah, it's going to happen with the sequel, but you get what I'm saying, right? When I feel like whenever Square Enix works exclusively with Nintendo, the game just gets way more attention, but this game has some really interesting gameplay mechanics where it's i'm not gonna say it's like fire emblem because it's not but it's like it's like turn based but like real time and you have like the, all your units and you're moving them at the and like real time very interesting gameplay i'm not gonna sit here and say it's like a 10 out of 10 game but people i think slept on this game you can get it really cheap now i paid full price for it i don't regret doing that but i think it's like a 20 dollars game now a uh, really cool game but it definitely has a budget keep that in mind like when you're playing this game you'll notice through the cutscenes and stuff this game has budget written all over it. Disco Elysium is one that I've just gotten recommended a ton over the past couple of years. I don't really know much about it, but 
I figured if I get recommended it so much, I, I probably should give it a shot at some point. So it got a physical, was pretty cheap on Amazon, I think. So I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll go ahead and buy that. Here we have a couple of Disgaea games. So we have Disgaea 1 Complete, Disgaea 4 Complete Plus. They had to, they had to include the plus there, as well as Disgaea 6 Defiance of Destiny Unrelenting Edition. Now, funnily enough, the only Disgaea game I've actually played is Disgaea 5 which I don't have physically. I still need to get a copy of that and Disgaea 7 for my, my NIS America set. Uh, Disgaea is... I think it's like just enough in between that Fire Emblem tactics gameplay and that Advance Wars gameplay to keep me intrigued. There's so much going on in this game. When I first played Disgaea 5 back in 2017 when the Switch came out, I was just completely in over my head. Like, I had no idea what was happening. So I had to watch like a lot of videos of like, how do I... What do I do? Because... <laughs> Having a, a tactics game where you have to like rent and buy units and like fuse units and stuff. I don't, I don't know if there's fusing. I can't really remember. I didn't finish this guy if I probably put like 20 hours in it, but having a game like this, I, I, I needed some, some guidance. And once I finally started learning it, learning the like jumping mechanics of like getting on top of other characters and like, you know, using them to propel yourself further. And then even playing Mario plus Rabbids and learning that that was kind of like taken from Disgaea a little bit. Uh, Disgaea, I have a lot of appreciation for the series. I don't know if I would ever go back and play some of these older ones like Disgaea 1 Complete. I really hope just for the sake of like my OCD, they do 2 and 3 as well. So you can have all of them on the Switch in a complete format. That feels like something that they should definitely do. But uh, Disgaea, pretty cool series. Just not something I put that much time into. I would like to play more. Uh, I don't know how well reviewed these more modern ones were. Six and seven, which just came out uh, late last year. Seven did. I'm not sure if those are well liked. I know they switched to 3D, which is kind of like a, I don't know. I don't know if I like the 3D graphics in these games, but Disney Illusion Island. This came out last summer and I played through it with my girlfriend. Really enjoyed this game. I think this was a lot of fun. It is a very kid-friendly Metroidvania, baby's first Metroidvania, but if you're playing with a loved one or a friend or whatever that doesn't really play games that much, it is the perfect vibe. I mean, Mickey Mouse, you can't really go wrong with this art style. has the art style of that, um, I don't know what the actual show was called, but that, that more modern Mickey Mouse show that has a lot of crazy clips on Twitter. Uh, this is made by the people that made that Battletoads remake for Xbox. They did a really good job. I kind of wish it wasn't so long. Like, it, I, I remember thinking, like, man, this is kind of getting long in the tooth, but we persevered. We pushed through it. The story's fun. You know, once again, just, just a kid-friendly Metrovania. You really can't go wrong with this game if you get it for cheap. Doki Doki Literature Club Plus. This is a very recent pickup. I don't really know what to do with this game at this point, man. Like, I, I want to play through it, but I know. You know? Like, I know. I know. I know what this game is, which I just wish... I had avoided that somehow and then played it back when it came out in like 2015 or whatever, but it's kind of hard to get into when I, I know what's going to happen, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, eventually I'll get through it, but it's kind of like in a weird place for me now. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. I mean, this is this game really needs no introduction. It has a new funky mode. I'm actually one of the people that think this game is a little overrated. I do really enjoy it. And upon a second playthrough, I definitely liked it a lot more than I did originally. Um, you know, back in 2014 when it came out on the Wii U, I was definitely one of those people that was like, oh my god, 2D platformers. And I love 2D platformers, but it wasn't really what I was looking for at the time, especially because I had just played uh, Country Returns 3D the year prior. So to get another 2D Donkey Kong so fast was just a little too much in my opinion. But you know, playing through it again on the Switch, I definitely enjoyed it more the second time through. Uh, this game has some incredible level design i i get it the the freaking the the background like connects to the platform so it all looks like really organic and i get the like from like a design perspective that's really cool but i don't really think donkey kong controls that well or at least he doesn't feel that good i know it's not like a game you're supposed to run through like mario necessarily but yeah it's a good game it's a great game it's a great game this is a great 2d platformer i don't know if it's like the greatest of all time though like a lot of people will say Tropical Freeze is one of the best 2D platformers of all time. I would not go that far. Here we have it, Doom 64. I freaking love Doom. I do not have the classic collection, which has Dooms 1, 2, and 3. They also released that like Slayer edition, um, but they released Doom 64 by itself. And of course, I also have Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. This is like the Steelbook edition that Limited Run did. Really unfortunate that they had to go through Limited Run. I mean, this... There should be no excuse for this. Come on, Bethesda. Like you release the first game, just just release the set, just release Eternal on your own. You don't need you don't need the little limited run company to help you with Doom Eternal. I feel like that was a little silly. But Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, I think, are some of the greatest modern FPSs of all time. In fact, they probably are 
the greatest modern FPSs of all time. I know some people think Eternal was a step down from 2016, but I couldn't disagree more. I think Doom Eternal is better in every way. And I mean, I already freaking loved Doom 2016. Like this is a fantastic game, but Doom Eternal, I think just did everything much better. The action was more kinetic, the movement, the hook shot, like there was so much improvement in Doom Eternal in my opinion. I freaking love this game. Haven't played it on Switch. Not sure how the Switch version is, but uh, this was a lot of fun. I have played Doom 2016 on Switch. And maybe, you know, maybe that was like my 2017 rose tinted glasses going on with the Switch back then, but I thought it was a fine port. I can't imagine Eternal's much worse than that, but maybe in 2024, maybe don't play these versions. Here we have some uh, Double Dragon games. So we have Double Dragon and Kunio Kun Retro Brawler Bundle. This has, wow, this has a lot of games in it, huh? <laughs> I didn't even realize how many games this had. 18 games in this collection of River City and Double Dragon games. But then we also have Double Dragon Gaiden Rise of the Dragons. This one just came out last year, as well as Double Dragon Neon. Now, if you can't tell, if you can't tell by me owning all three of these, I don't really like beat em up games. Like, they're fine. I, I played Dra Double Dragon Neon. It it's fine. It's a fun game. But, and you know, like Scott Pilgrim, which we'll talk about when I get to it. I think Scott Pilgrim's fun. But typically speaking, I don't like beat up games that much like whenever i play them i just kind of get frustrated i don't think the level design is ever really that good um but i don't know there are a couple key instances where a beat em up game hits and uh double dragon neon it was fine i haven't really played um this one at all and then even river city ransom actually weirdly enough like the original nes game i played that a lot on my 3ds back in the day on virtual console and i thought that was fun uh double dragon though like these classic ones i never I never enjoyed playing those i'll, I'll admit um, and I haven't really played any of these Japanese-only River City games. I didn't know there were so many. Here we go again. Another DS classic coming back for the Nintendo Switch. Just like Big Brain Academy. Just like Clubhouse games. We have Dr. Kawashima's brain training for Nintendo Switch. And bam, look at that. It came with a stylus. Yeah, this one's really weird because it's one of the few Nintendo Switch games that Nintendo made that didn't get localized in America. I saw something about how they like got sued maybe in America for like saying that it can fix your brain <laughs> i don't know if that was true or not but there has to be a some reason i mean this game was localized in english it came out in europe as you can see here i have the european copy but yeah it never came out in uh north america which is just really weird i mean it's just more brain age but for switch i mostly bought it because i wanted the stylus not that you really need a stylus for the nintendo switch but kind of cool dragon ball xenoverse 2 for nintendo switch this is one of my most played nintendo switch games if it wasn't obvious from the Dragon Ball hat in almost all my videos, or the giant Dragon Ball wall scroll, or the fact that I'm always talking about how much I love Dragon Ball, I freaking love Dragon Ball! And Dragon Ball's Universe 2 is far and away my favorite Dragon Ball game. I haven't gone back and played Tenkaichi 3 in a long time, that was my favorite growing up, but Xenoverse 2, over the years, has gotten so much DLC content, to the point where, like, if you load up the game for the first time today, and go on the eShop and look at all the DLC, it's overwhelming to the point of, like, Come on, guys, just release a complete version, maybe, and uh, stop selling all that DLC, because it is it is outrageous at this point. But as someone who was playing this back in 2016 on PS4, and then got it on Switch, of course, in 2017, and just keeping up with this game over the years, I adore Xenoverse. I fell off it a couple years ago, you know, there's, they're, still, they're still trucking along, they're still releasing DLC. I've, I've pretty much retired, I've played through it on Switch, I've played through it on PS4. Um, I, I think I'm good, you know, even though I love this game so, so much. I think I'm good. Like, I don't really need to play it anymore. I have, I think, 200 hours in the Switch version and probably another 60 in the PS4 version. At this point, I'm good. I'm just waiting for uh, the new Budokai Tenkaichi game on PS5. I'll be playing it there. But uh, Xenoverse 2, absolute banger. Super happy it came out early in the Switch's life cycle, playing this game in bed, doing the expert raids and stuff. A lot of fun. And then we have Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, which frankly disappointed me quite a bit. I know this game, uh, like is pretty well loved and still gets updates they just released the uh the end of z dlc i didn't really like this game when it came out i'm not sure if i should go back and play it again i, I thought about it and you know maybe i'll play all this new like trunks dlc and i think they did a bardock dlc and of course they did um you know like i said the end of z stuff maybe i'll go back to it and i'll enjoy it but i had so much hype and anticipation for this game they announced that cc2 was making a dragon ball game uh, cyber connect 2 and they are the developers of Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm, which is my some of my favorite anime games. I love the Ultimate Ninja Storm series. So when they announced that CC2 was making a single player game based in the Dragon Ball Z universe, I was like, oh man, this is going to be heat. The gameplay is not that fun. All the enemies in the single player have like this really annoying super armor. 
it got really annoying. Maybe they maybe they patched it and fixed it up a little bit, but I was kind of just annoyed playing through this game, but maybe I should give it another shot. And then finally, we have Dragon Ball The Breakers Special Edition. This game is awful. It is Dead by Daylight Dragon Ball. I don't think it's fun. It runs bad on Switch. I, I don't like this game at all. And I realize now, as we, as we end off here on the Dragon Ball section, I don't have fighters. I know I didn't have the Super Dragon Ball World Mission game, that like the trading card game. I still want to get that. I could have sworn I had Dragon Ball Fighters on Switch. Maybe we'll come to it. Maybe it got misplaced, but I thought I had that. I definitely have it digitally on Switch at the very least then, because I, I know I played a lot of Fighters on Switch. That's okay, though, because we have a lot of Dragon Quest to get through instead. Here is the triple pack of the first three games. These are ports of the mobile versions, I believe, and they don't really look that great in my opinion. I would prefer a Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster kind of situation on these if we could, but still cool that they released and cool that they got a physical, I would hope for a remake trilogy of all three. Maybe that's why we haven't seen Dragon Quest 3 HD 2D. Maybe they're doing all three. That would be awesome. Let me have Dragon Quest 11 Echoes of an Elusive Age S Definitive Edition S. I guess the S is at the end of this. Uh, they were really promoting the heck out of this game in 2019 to the point of annoyance. Hearing that freaking Dragon Quest theme every Nintendo Direct that year was, uh, was quite something, but Dragon Quest 11, I only played a couple hours of it. Once again, just JRPG kind of fatigue, not fatigue. I want to play these, but they're just so long. I mean, this is like a 120 hour game. Probably I haven't had the time to go through it, but what I did play a lot of was both of these Dragon Quest Builder games. I really like Dragon Quest Builders. <laughs> I, you know, I, I remember when this was announced, I actually really wanted to import it from Play Asia, but I was like 14 or 15 at the time. I think I, maybe 16. I don't know. I was young, young enough to not have my own debit card. So I was like trying to scheme my way to get like a little Visa gift card and then buy it from Play Asia. Never worked out. Ended up not doing that. But when it eventually came to Switch, I finally picked it up and I really love this game. And then later that same year, or maybe like the next year, they released Dragon Quest Builders 2, which is even better. I wish this game had less of a long kind of tutorial starting section because it takes forever to unlock online multiplayer and for the game to really open up. But these are really fun kind of town building Minecraft type games. Um, I, I love these games. I also really love Dragon Quest Monsters of the Dark Prince. Now, this is similar to Bot and Kaidos last year. This is part of the backlog of shame. I did not finish this game. I hyped it up. I talked about it in my top 10 Switch games of the year. I know I never went back to it. Something happened and I lost track of time. And then I just, I, I loaded it up one day and I was like, I don't know what I was even doing at all. Not that the game's complex. I mean, there's always like a marker on the, on the screen, but uh, yeah, I kind of fell off this one. I really liked what I played. I put like 20 hours into it, but man, these games are long. <laughs> I don't want to complain about it too much because I like long games, but I really enjoy them. And I really enjoyed this, but I guess it kind of just came out at a bad time. But for my first foray into the Dragon Quest Monster series, I really liked what I played. Then we have Dragon Quest Treasures, another Dragon Quest spinoff. This one's focused on the characters from Eleven. Uh, this one looks interesting, but I, I really didn't hear too many people talking about it. And then finally, we have an Infinity Strash, Dragon Quest, The Adventure of Die. This one is a Play Asia release, like a lot of those actually. Um, and this one, uh, kind of stinky. I only played like an hour or two of it, but man, it doesn't run great or look great on Switch. I'm not sure if the PS5 version is much better, frankly. I was really excited for this. I like the Dragon Quest Adventure of Die manga. Um, I read a couple of the volumes they released recently through Viz Media, and I really enjoyed what I read of that. So I was like, oh, cool, they're making a game based on that. Um, and of course, they did that new anime recently. Uh, the game's kind of boring, but I don't know. It's cool it exists, I guess. They really released like freaking five Dragon Quest games in the past two years. What are they doing? Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. This is just another one of those cases of a 360 or PS3 game coming over to the Switch, which is just inherently kind of exciting to me. Uh, at least it was at the time. I actually just bought this last year when they started showing off Dragon's Dogma 2 quite a bit. And I was like, oh, this looks really good. Bought this, loaded it up. And I was like, wow, I don't like character building games. I, I don't like having a build. <laughs> I realize that now for certain JRPGs and like the like team building, I like team building, but having like a build for a character specifically like a Dark Souls, I'm not a fan of that. There's a reason Sekiro is my favorite from software game. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And Dragon's Dogma is all about building that character out um, and like, you know, like stat allocation. I'm good with like, you know, simple oh, my, this armor does this, this armor does this, you know, get your hand warmers, get your leg warmers, those do different things. But uh, when you have to like, when you do all these different stats and stuff and you're like, you're fully on your own when it comes to what type of character you want to play, I get a little overwhelmed, I'll admit it. 
Dynasty Warriors 9 Empires. I love the Warriors games. We haven't seen any of them up to this point, I don't think, but I, I really like Warriors games. I uh, haven't played like an actual Dynasty Warriors game in a long time, but um, you know, I love the, the anime tie-in ones I do. I love the Nintendo tie-in ones. I play a lot of, I think, Dynasty Warriors 5 Empires on 360 when I was younger. My brother had bought it, and I, I really enjoyed that, so I've always wanted to go back and play like an actual Dynasty Warriors game again. But when they release so many of the anime tie-in ones, I kind of get my fill just through that. The End is Nigh, this is a cool one. This is from one half of the original team that made Super Meat Boy. Not as good as Super Meat Boy, not even close. Um, as well as I think Tyler Gleal, they're making that Mugenix game now. Of course, Body of Isaac creator as well. So uh, cool, I like I like that guy, I like, I like the developers. Uh, end, end is Nigh is a fun game nowhere near as good as Super Meat Boy, but it wasn't trying to be Super Meat Boy. It's just another type of a uh, 2D platformer with a cute little, little, little guy down there. Ender Lily's Quietest of the Night. This game is really good so far. I actually just started it after they announced Ender Magnolia. I had had the physical copy for a while now, um, but yeah, I, I, I started it after that Nintendo Direct where they announced the sequel. Only a couple hours in, but this game is awesome. Really cool story and like lore going on. Really cool combat where you play as this little girl, but she has like these spirits defending her. Um, and it's a Metroidvania, so pretty much checks every box and what makes a game interesting and fun to me. I'm really enjoying this one so far. Espagaluda 2. This is a shmup that limited rum released. I have a couple of shmups from them. Shmups are a genre, or shoot 'em ups are a genre of games that like I don't really have that much experience in. So I kind of just started buying some of them because I was like, I wanna I wanna learn more about this. I guess I should get the uh I think Konami has a like arcade collection of games that has a lot of shmups on it. These are more like bullet hell esque, I guess. Not not so casual. You know, you can't just jump into this without already being good, maybe. I'm not sure if I'm just talking on my ass right now, but this one popped up on Limited Run when I was making another order for something else at the time, so I was like, oh, okay, I'll check out this eventually. Ever forward, I got swindled into buying this game at PAX West. <laughs> not swindled. Uh, the game looks cool. I don't really know much about it, but uh, it was $10 at PAX West. They were like, hey, if you buy this, we'll get like a free steelbook, and I was like, okay, and, and then I bought it. Thanks, thanks, PM Studios. Fashion Dreamer. This is the spiritual successor to Style Savvy from Sin Sophia. Really intrigued by the fact that Nintendo did not publish this game, but uh, it's more Style Savvy. You dress up girls and make them look pretty. It's Style Savvy. Here we have the two Fatal Frame games that came out on the Switch. Fatal Frame Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, as well as Fatal Frame Maiden of Blackwater. This is the Wii U one. Still, still need to get this on Wii U. Uh, definitely... Definitely one I'm still missing over there. Uh, always wanted to play these games. Super cool that they got releases, even if they weren't in uh, uh, North America. As you can see, neither of these have the ESRB. But uh, yeah, really cool to have these games on Switch. And once again, more more Koei Tecmo stuff for the, uh, the Koei Tecmo set. Here we have a couple of Fate games. I am so out of my depth when it comes to Fate. These were recent pickups. VGP reprinted them. Fate Excella, the Umbral Star. I, I had actually bought this game back in 2017, I think. Maybe, yeah, maybe 2018, early 2018. This is a Warriors clone. Um, I bought it because there wasn't really much that coming out on the Switch at that time. And I was like, oh, I want to try some more uh, games I haven't really experienced before on the Switch. So I bought Fate Excella, the Umbral Star. It is it just, like I said, a, kind of pretty much just a Warriors game, but, but worse. Maybe it wasn't really in my place to buy it because if you're a fan of Fate... You're inherently going to already be attached to these characters and stuff, so maybe it wasn't really a game I should have bought at the time. And then this one that was also just restocked, Fate Excella Link. I think this is a different type of game. I'm not, not too positive. And now we get to the Final Fantasy game. So as you can see here, I have two copies of the Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster. This one, I'm not going to open it up. You can see it, this, is the, this is the real copy. <laughs> this, is, this is the special edition. I, I will show that when we get to all that stuff. But this is the special edition for Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster on the Switch. This one's still sealed. Like I said, not going to open it up. Don't need to bother with that. Uh, I did buy the uh, Play Asia uh, kind of world release they did here with no ESRB just to have a copy to play and put into my Switch. Uh, played through Final Fantasy 2, 1 and 2 for the first time last year. Really enjoyed 2. I, 2 gets so much hate on mine. I thought that game was awesome. Like That's one of my favorite NES games now. And then I played like half of 3, and then I kind of got lost, and then I stopped playing it, had that whole thing happen again, and then I went back to it, and I was like, I have no idea what I was doing. So I'll probably just have to restart 3 eventually. Maybe I'll just play the uh, the DS version, because I think I got the idea, right? I, I think I played enough of 3 in this Pixel Remaster format, so maybe I'll just go play the, the DS remake. And then, yeah, I was playing through them in order. I know I need to get to 4 and 6 specifically, really just those SNES games. Those are the ones people will always talk about, but I didn't want to skip the earlier games. 
Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion. Played this one on PS5, but a fantastic remake. They tried to like really temper expectations that it wasn't a remake. I guess because of the weird messaging of FF7 remake, which isn't really a remake, it's like a reimagining. This is more of a remake than a remaster because it uses most of the assets from FF7 remake. And I mean, it just looks way better than the PSP version. They redid the voice acting and stuff too, which I think some people had some issue with, but this is my first time playing uh, Crisis Core and I love this game. Then alongside FF7 Crisis Core, we have the FF7 Twin Pack with seven and eight remastered. Uh, I've played through seven, have never finished it, but I played it a lot as a kid, never touched eight. So Final Fantasy, here's the thing, right? I am the, I'm a JRPG guy, but I haven't played a lot of Final Fantasy, which is why I was playing through one and two last year, played a lot of 16, got super into 14. Like I'm trying to get back in and like really round myself out when it comes to Final Fantasy specifically over the past couple years. I played through 13, played through 15. Um, so I played a lot at this point, but I haven't played a lot of the classics. So I haven't played eight, still need to do that. And also before we continue, just want to say how cool is it that this this even has a physical release on the Switch at all, um, alongside Final Fantasy IX, which, once again, I haven't played. They did this weird thing here where you have to hold it like this to, to view the image. I don't know why they did that. Um, I don't think either of these have physical releases on PS4. I think 8 has a standalone one on PS4, but um, yeah, the Switch is the only place you can get one through one through 10 physically, and then, of course, 12 is physical. No 13 on Switch yet, but uh, yeah, this is this is awesome to me. Then we have Final Fantasy X and X-2. Uh, never finished X, but I, I really liked what I played of it. I played it on PS3 way back in the day. And then Final Fantasy XII, the Zodiac Age, I started this one. And I was I was into the vibes. I liked the main character. But yeah, just never continued it. Then we get to some of the more weird spinoffs. I think I actually am going to put Chocobo GP in this section when I recategorize these on the shelf because... It's a Final Fantasy game, but we have World of Final Fantasy Maxima. This one always looked super cute to me back when it came out on PS4, I think in 2016. I think it was it was announced when they announced 7 Remake, I think, actually. Yeah, wasn't it? And um, it's one of those games where <laughs> I think at this point I could probably play it and like get it because I've played enough Final Fantasy now. But I, I remember at the time I, I stopped myself from playing it because, I mean, this is a fan service game, man. They have freaking Zack there. I think that's uh, Firion from FF2, like, there's, or maybe it's just the Warrior of Light, I can't, I'm not, I'm not too positive, but either way, this is a fan service game with a lot of characters from every game in the series, probably shouldn't play it without playing some more uh, mainline games, maybe I could do so now, but I'd rather allocate that time to playing through 8 or 9 finally. And here's one of my favorites from 2023, Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line, I owe this game so much. Because this is the game that finally got me to play Final Fantasy XIV, which is what I spent a lot of time playing in 2023. I had played Theater Rhythm on the 3DS and I enjoyed it back then when I was a kid, but you know, I didn't really have any fond appreciation for the music. Finally getting a Theater Rhythm on Switch and, you know, really listening to the tracks from 7, which, you know, of course I love 7 and 7 Remake, listening to the tracks from 13, which has one of my favorite soundtracks of like any game. I, 13 soundtrack, regardless of what you think of the game, I think 13 soundtrack is like get, like goaded, Go, goaded tier. And even 15, I, I love 15 as well. So, Getting this, playing it on Switch, and really appreciating that music more than I did on the 3DS was just incredible. And then through playing the tracks from 14 in this game, that was what finally made me decide, like, okay, I'm going to really try and play FF14. And that game hooked me like no game has hooked me. I, I haven't played it in a few months, but I still think about it almost every day. I, I wish I had more time to really sink into 14. I had these grand aspirations of catching up for Dawn Trail which is coming out this summer. I haven't even finished Stormblood, so I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line, possibly the best rhythm game ever made. Fire Emblem Three Houses. I like this game. Not to sound weird, I I have conflicting feelings about this game. I really don't like the personification of Fire Emblem. They still have that stuff in Engage, however, I feel like it's much less of a focus. Three Houses was overboard man they went too far with it i don't like the changes to the gameplay they made i think the game is is possibly one of the ugliest first party switch games that nintendo has released the characters and story though are so undeniably great <laughs> that like i can't i can't hate this game too much but it's it's good i the, the characters and story as we'll get to in a second here i, th I actually think i enjoy three hopes more and yeah, we have some Fire Emblem Warriors here. I have the Engage Special Edition, but it's sealed, so we'll get to that. I, I bought it digitally, like a weirdo. But uh, Fire Emblem Warriors, love this game, love Warriors. It's just fan service. I know this game 
got a lot of flack when it came out, but I don't know. It's it's Warriors of Man. I don't, I don't really have high expectations for these games, so when they even slightly exceed them, I'm into it. And then, yeah, Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes. I think this game actually is better than Three Houses because you get those character, um, you know, bonds and all that from Three Houses, which is the best part of that game and the story. But then I think the context of a Warriors game makes more sense and fits better with the the plot of Three Houses with the war, you know, going on between the three different schools. I actually really like this game. This is my favorite Warriors game, like more than Hyrule Warriors, more than like the One Piece Warriors games. This is a fantastic Warriors games. One of my favorite games from 2022, actually. I think this is this is a really good game. Like I know Warriors games are Warriors games and some people just don't like Warriors games, but this one this one is really good. Here we have some fitness boxing games from Imagineer, except actually Nintendo published them. That's why I bought them. Although I could probably I could probably stand to play some of these. And of course, no Switch collection is complete without the Five Nights at Freddy's core collection, as well as Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted. Don't have Security Breach. That game is like weirdly kind of expensive, so I don't know if I'll ever buy it. Uh, I wanted this one because I've actually never played FNAF. I, I think I've played like one, right? I've played FNAF 1. Everybody's played FNAF 1, at least a little bit. I never finished it, even though it's like a super short game. Uh, scary game's very scary to me. I, I'm a little baby when it comes to scary games, even if it is... I mean, this, this, this is essentially a kid's game at this point, but um, uh, once again, the collection kind of got me here. I was like, oh, all the FNAF games on Switch in one bundle? I gotta buy that. And then at the same time, I think I was like, oh, I might as well get Help Wanted too, which is one of the newer ones. Here's another hidden gem on the Switch, Forager. I played a lot of this game back in 2019. I think I got this on Black Friday that year. Uh, this is a, you know, pixel top-down 2D action game where you forge you you craft your way to survival or whatever the Nintendo Direct announcer ever says whenever there's a, a new crafting game, survival farming game announced. Not really that heavy on farming elements, just super, super fun, fast-paced game where you start getting just absurdly OP, where you're harvesting all these materials and you're just doing, like, the screen, like, starts lagging. That's how, like, OP you get in this game. I uh, never went back and played any of the DLC. I'm not sure if that ever even ended up coming out on the Switch, but Forager is a lot of fun. This physical version also includes some stickers and a poster another example of a wario 64 just kind of cheap game i was like okay this is like 10 bucks i think i think actually i think this game was seven dollars when i bought it on amazon or maybe best buy um i don't really know much about for the king here but uh turn-based role-playing game like you like actually roll dice in this game uh, it has a unique art style like all these polygonal models i don't know freedom planet this is another recent one from that buyout from caleb this is it, originally it was going to be a sonic fan game i believe and then they ended up making just their own ip very smart glad they did that i think freedom planet 2 is coming out uh, this is pretty good i mean if you like sonic it's it's more sonic i played this a little bit on wii u back in the day because they had like that wii u event preview back when nintendo was really pushing indies for the wii u because there was nothing else coming to the platform but freedom planet uh pretty cool definitely a higher quality like sonic like that i feel like i don't know i see so many tweets from sonic fans in my twitter feed i feel like i never see freedom planet mentioned even though it's it's pretty high quality all right this one i'm just stupid i i bought this game because i thought oh it's friday the 13th there are a lot of horror collectors this game's gonna get expensive because they actually shut down the servers the Switch version, I think, is worthless now. I didn't pay that much for it, maybe 20, 25 bucks. But uh, yeah, I believe they shut down the servers, or they're going to shut down the servers, and the game is just super cheap now. I know that maybe that logic doesn't check out, because usually when a game's servers go down, the game becomes worthless. But specifically being Friday the 13th, specifically being a Switch game that would be going out of print... I was kind of, that was some predictive buying that ended up not going too well for me. Um, I don't really like these Dead by Daylight type of games where one player has, you know, they play as uh, the, the monster, in this case, Jason. And then there's like a squad of, uh, you know, high schoolers or whatever running around. It's it's the Dragon Ball, the Breakers gameplay. I, I really don't like this type of game. Uh, maybe if I had more friends that wanted to play these types of games, it'd be more fun. But uh, yeah, not really for me. Front Mission first with a Best Buy sticker that I had to cut off because Best Buy puts a big fat sticker on their games when they ship them to me sometimes really annoying but uh this is what i was talking about earlier where uh, like with alex kid this is a square enix game front mission is a square enix game but for some reason they went through microids to publish these remakes we just got front mission 2 i don't know if there's a physical version of that yet uh but this is a tactics uh game using a bunch of like mechs and stuff and tanks and all that cool coolness 
Here's one I always wanted to check out back in like those early Switch days. Fury Definitive Edition. I believe this is just like a, a just a boss rush game. Like this is just bosses. You are just fighting really cool, really awesomely designed bosses in this game. Always looks super cool, super flashy. So I wanted to check it out eventually. Gal Guardians Demon Purge. Uh, this was an NT Creates game. So um, once again, big big fan of Blaster Master and Azure Striker Gunvolt and stuff. Although I don't actually have the Azure Striker Gunvolt uh, Striker pack on Switch, but uh, I wanted to pick up this because NT Creates, of course, my beloved. Uh, cool, cool that it got a physical release, not through Limited Run, through P Cube. Normally, Limited Run handles the NT Creates stuff, but I guess P Cube had to handle it this time because this is actually part of the Gal Gun series, which I am ashamed. I, th this I am ashamed of. I have I have all the Gal Gun games, never played them. Gal Gun Double Piece, Gal Gun Two, and Gal Gun Returns. Uh, these are just f fan service games. I, <laughs> they were like really cheap and in, in my defense, they were really cheap. So, um, I bought these because oh, if I have gal guardians, I got to have this game that is basically completely unrelated, just in name only. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not proud of this one. Here's a weird release from Nintendo that I think a lot of people forgot about game builder garage. This is like the remnants of Nintendo Labo where they were, you know, they, they made Nintendo Labo. It kind of bombed, but they did a lot of cool stuff with like, game development and like just creation with a Nintendo Labo but since it didn't sell very well they decided to make it its own separate application not using cardboard um called Game Builder Garage where you could like make little games kind of like Dreams from PlayStation in a weird way um but obviously not quite as intuitive uh this one I didn't put too much time into I did build the Labo kits so I kind of already got my fill of this I'm sure if you go on there now, there's probably some pretty cool stuff that people have made over the years, but I really didn't see too many people talking about this game when it came out or in the years since. Gargoyles Remastered, super cool that this game got a, a remake recently. I didn't grow up with like the Gargoyles cartoon or anything, but I like to see more Disney stuff going on in the gaming space. I mean, yeah, Disney, big bad company. I, I get that aspect, but also it's just like, I don't know when 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 Disney's releasing stuff like this and Disney Illusion Island, I'm into that. I don't want Disney making a bunch of live service AAA games like Avengers, you know, from Square Enix. But when they're just doing small games like this, remakes of older games, uh, I think that's pretty cool. Getsu Fumiden Undying Moon from Konami and Limited Run. This was an Apple Arcade game, I believe, from Konami. One of the Konami's only new original IP in recent memory, I believe. Um, at least at the time of when they released it. This has a super cool art style, almost a little reminiscent of Okami, not quite to that to that scale. Ghost Trick Phantom Detective, this one came out last year, uh, ports of a DS game, or I guess I should say remake. I mean, they actually remade it in the Resident Evil RE engine, which is uh, a little weird, but um, this is a game I'd probably play on DS. Let me know in the comments below. Uh, should I play this on DS or Switch? I have it on DS already. We found it at Goodwill um, around the time this came out, funnily enough. I don't know if this is something I should play on Switch or just play there. I'm not too sure. Let me know in the comments below. Go Vacation. Haven't got a chance to try this one either, but uh, once again, just one of those weird games that Nintendo published in 2018. They were doing, I don't know, weird weird time. Like, I mean, this is a port or a remake, I guess, of Go Vacation from the Wii, but they Nintendo published it this time. Very weird. This game was nominated for Fighting Game of the Year last year. Have you heard of God of Rock? Because I certainly had it until I saw those nominees. I guess it's like a music fighting game. Yeah, competitive rhythm-based fighter. I'll have to check this one out. Okay, here's one of the few examples of an NIS America game that, I'll be honest, I probably won't ever get around to because I don't think it looks that interesting, but going for that full NIS America set and double whammy, this game got delisted, so I bought it before it got expensive. I'm not sure if it ever did, actually. I think, like, when it initially was announced, it was, you know, leaving the eShop. I think it went up initially, but I think it might have come down. Uh, but I got it for, like, 25 30 bucks back then, and uh, I don't know. It, eh. Cool art style. Gotta Protector's Cart of Darkness. I got a review code of this game, full disclaimer, back when it came out. Uh, but this is a super fun little, like, tower defense game, on rails tower defense game. The princess is in, like, a tank, and you have to protect her as she moves through the level. Um, and there's just hordes of enemies coming. Not super unlike Vampire Survivors. Still waiting on the physical for that game on Switch, but uh, this is pretty cool. A lot of, like, fun references to other games from the NES era. I mean, even just modern stuff, too. Uh, this is This is a fun one. The Good Life. Now, I believe the plot of this game is you're a journalist who, like, investigates animals or something, and then there's also stuff where you play as animals. I bought this game, one, because it's by the, the creator of Deadly Premonition, which I haven't played, as we discussed earlier, but um, I figured that must mean, it, you know, some sort of quality there as well. But I bought it because when I was a kid, I played a game called Dog's Life, and I thought this might be kind of similar. In Dog's Life, you play as a dog, just kind of doing dog stuff and being a bad dog. 
I figured this might be somewhat similar where you play as animals just doing doing animal stuff. Grand Theft Auto the Trilogy. So when I was a kid, I played a lot of San Andreas as well as GTA 4. Never played 5, really, like at all. I think I might have started it at some point, but never really got too into 5. And then never played 3 or Vice City. So San Andreas and, and 4 are my most played GTA games. But even then, it's not like I ever finished them. I, I was the kid that would freaking follow the road road laws you know I would, I would i would practice driving in gta 4 on 360 back in the day but happy to have this collection on switch i know when it came out it was super bad i think they fixed up a lot of the issues although it still it still looks a little funky i played a decent amount of gta 3 on here and i don't really like what they did with the graphics in this collection but hey it's cool to have them on switch I would prefer these games get a proper remake, I think. I think these games, like, GTA is such a, a prominent IP. I think Rockstar should at least pay a competent developer to port them, but really remake them. These games deserve full-on remakes, in my opinion, and they would make so much money doing that. But I guess, I mean, this sold a lot anyway, so I guess they didn't really need to. I don't know. Here we have a Grim Grimoire once more from NIS America. This is like a real-time strategy game. Looks super, super neat. Love the art style. I guess it's a remake. I'm not too familiar with this, like, series, if it's even a series. I mean, once more implies it's a remake but I'm not familiar with it. Here we have two more games from my beloved Inti Creates, the Gumball Chronicles games, Luminous Avenger 9 and 9-2. Isn't 9, I mean, that's the Roman numeral for 9, but, like, is it pronounced that way in the game? I'm not too sure. And then we have Azur Striker Gunvolt 3 with that as well from Inti Creates. Haven't played this one yet. Played the first two Gunvolt games. I bought the Striker pack digitally when it came out, I believe. Or maybe I, I might have gotten a review code back then, actually. But um, still need to pick up that physically. Love those games. So it's only a matter of time before I crack this bad boy open. Happy Birthdays. This is a God game recently reprinted from VGP. Video Games Plus has become like my, my go-to place when it comes to reprints of old Switch games that I kind of missed early on because I wasn't super serious about collecting back then. Uh, this was one that I always thought looked super intriguing where, yeah, it's, it's just a God game. You got little dinosaurs and there's a monkey. Um, this one looks super cool. Might have to have a counter for how many times I say a game looks super cool in this video. Except I won't do that because it would take way too long to edit. Here's Harvestella. This game looks super cool. So yeah, here's Harvestella. This game looked really intriguing to me. I haven't gotten a chance to play it, but um, it got really good reviews. I It was, once again, in that time frame with Diofield Chronicle where Square Enix was just releasing a ton of games for some reason. I don't really know what they were... I don't know what they were cooking... I mean, they were cooking good games, but man, they should have paced those out a little bit better because this game got good reviews, but I didn't hear anybody talking about it. It's a dungeon action RPG game, but it has those those life sim kind of crop farming elements that you would expect from a, a Stardew Valley or a, a Story of Seasons game, but mixed with the, the RPG combats of a Square Enix game. So really weird release timing on this one. I think they could have had it breathe a little bit more if it wasn't released in the holiday. I feel like that would have been good for it. But either way, I hope to get to this one eventually. Has been Heroes. This is a March 2017 banger right here from Frozen Bite, the developers of the Trine series. I played a lot of this game back then. Um, this was one of my first exposures to a roguelike game, and it's, it's similar to another game on Switch I actually still need to pick up physically uh, called Fallen Legion. At least it I remember it being kind of similar, probably not. Um, but basically, you have like these three lanes, and you have three characters in those lanes, and they have different abilities, and you can like kind of combo and stuff. Really fun game. I remember it being kind of janky, but I really enjoyed it. Hasbro Game Night for Nintendo Switch, including Monopoly for Nintendo Switch, Risk, the game of global domination, and Trivial Pursuit Live. I mean, it's just a board game pack. Can't really go wrong with this. Monopoly is always fun. I actually really like Risk. I don't think I've tried Trivial Pursuit on here yet. A Hat in Time. This was like one of those big deal retro revival 3D platformers back in like 2016, 2017. I think it was kickstarted. Was this kickstarted for Wii U? I feel like it might have been. Um, and then it came out and I don't think it was like anything it really cracked up to be. I mean, I know this game has a, a dedicated fan base, but I don't think it was quite what people expected similar with ukulele like ukulele wasn't as good as people had hoped and i remember the developer of a hat in time being like no it's not coming to switch and then it came to switch like literally six months later <laughs> so that's always funny when that happens heave ho from devolver digital and special reserve 
Although, I'm kind of confused now because I definitely got this out of a limited run on Blind Box. Uh, this is a game I know pretty much nothing about, although I like the uh, I like the art style here. Uh, but yeah, this was, this was a limited run release, I thought, but it's saying Special Reserved. I'm pretty sure I got this from a limited run Blind Box. Otherwise, I have no idea why I had this game. It had to be from LRG. But Special Reserve, like, that's a whole nother... That's a whole nother limited company, isn't it? Am I going crazy? Here we have another classic Metroidvania Hollow Knight. I... I don't know, man. Every time I play this game, I, I don't like the vibes. I know, I know, I know. I'm a bad... I'm a bad Metroidvania fan. But every time I play this game, it's all just dark blue and black. And I'm just like, man... I, I get what you're going for, but I don't like the vibes of this one too much. I, I, I mean, I know maybe it's kind of hypocritical because, like, Metroid Dread or something also has, like, pretty dark vibes. But, I don't know, this game is, like, a little bit too gloomy in my opinion. Of course, that's not saying anything about the gameplay. The gameplay of Hollow Knight feels really good. But I find myself struggling to spend too much time in this world. Like, I don't really... I don't like spending time in Hollow Knight. I like playing Hollow Knight. I like the feel of Hollow Knight and getting upgrades and stuff. And it feels really good. But the world, I'm not a big fan of. Hot Wheels Unleashed for the Nintendo Switch. I played this on PS5 and actually really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I wasn't like a super big Hot Wheel head as a kid. I, I really enjoyed collecting the, the Disney Pixar cars, like the diecast ones they released. So I had some Hot Wheels as a kid growing up, but I wasn't like a Hot Wheel head, so to speak. Um, but when this was announced a couple years back, I bought it on PS5 through Gamefly, like on Black Friday or something. And it was surprisingly good. A really beautiful game, too. Like, really nice visuals for a Hot Wheel game. Like, it, you know, they look like actual toys. Um, I, th I thought this was a lot of fun. Just racing on Hot Wheels tracks. Like, that that inherently, like, triggers something in my brain. Like, it's just... This is good. This is a good vibes game right here. House of the Dead Remake Limited Edition. Another lenticular cover here. Another IP. I think... Is this a Sega game? Who, own, who owns House of the Dead? I think it might be Sega. But, um... Another th case where they, they outsourced this IP to another developer, which resulted in a remake that most people really didn't like. This game got really bad reviews, I think. Um, I had never played House of the Dead until I got this remake. Actually, I did get some review code, um, but I thought it was fine, Like at least in terms of what could be done on the Nintendo Switch. You're never going to get that arcade experience at home unless you're using like the Wii Zapper, and even then it's not going to be exactly what you want. Uh, but for my first experience playing House of the Dead, I thought this was good maybe i'm just completely out of my element and it really was just a horrible version but i liked what i played of it of course we have the humongous classic collection of course including freddy fish my boy putt putt spy fox and pajama sam i did not grow up with these games i don't know why i bought this they're still releasing more games from humongous on the eShop, so i assume they'll probably do like a humongous collection too and now because i have this one i'm gonna have to buy the second one ah what have i done Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition. I think this game is awesome. You know, we got a lot of Wii U ports. We've already talked about Captain Toad. We've already talked about Tropical Freeze, Bayonetta. This is like truly a definitive edition game. Like this is the best version of Hyrule Warriors. It took all the content from the Wii U version, all the content from the 3DS version, and most importantly, the character switching from Hyrule Warriors Legends on the 3DS, which just makes gameplay so much smoother, being able to switch characters on the fly, send them somewhere, and then switch to them after they get to that point while you're doing something else. So fluid, so much fun. Just a great Warriors game all around. And then there's Age of Calamity. Listen, I, you know, goes without saying. Huge Breath of the Wild fan here. Huge Tears of the Kingdom fan here. Love this world. Love these characters. Great to see them again. I really was disappointed by Age of Calamity. I think Hyrule Warriors 2018 or 2014, however you want to look at it, is a much more fun game, much more balanced game, much more fluid game. Age of Calamity runs really poorly. You know, they did a great job replicating the art style, but they, uh... I was going to say they replicated the frame rate, but even Breath of the Wild has a better frame rate than Age of Calamity. This came out when I was in my Nintendo Switch hater era because the PS5 had just come out and I was really like picky about performance and I didn't really play it when it came out, but I played it like a year or two later when I was getting back into Nintendo Switch collecting and all that and really catching up on those first party games I had missed during COVID. And I, I think Age of Calamity is just kind of, I don't know, man. I, I really, it's not a bad game, but it's not... I don't think it's anything special. Oh, I showed that game ever forward earlier. This was also from the PM Studios booth at PAX West. They were uh, kind of touting this as a PAX exclusive cover variant of this horror game, Akai, which um, I'm cool with that. You know, it's not a game I was going to pick up anyway, 
but it looked interesting. Uh, horror game, always fun. Limited to 500. I think it was like 10 bucks, 15 bucks. I was like, okay. Akai. Immortals Phoenix Rising had to get the gold edition. Couldn't live without it. So this was widely considered to be Ubisoft's take on Breath of the Wild. It came out, I think, late 2020. I played a little bit of it on PS5. It didn't really click with me, but um, I will say it's cool that they brought it to Switch. Like, they knew out of all of the Ubisoft current games, if there's going to be a game that comes to Switch, it should probably be this one that is pretty clearly trying to be Breath of the Wild. And I think there was rumors of a sequel not too long ago, but I guess that might have been canceled internally. All I know is Gods and Monsters, the original title that they revealed this game under, was a way cooler name. Immortals. Immortals ain't doing it for me. Here we have In Sound Mine, the deluxe edition, including a digital art book. This is a new survival horror experience where you solve mind-bending puzzles with an eerie soundtrack by The Living Tombstone. This one had a lot of hype leading up to its release back, I think, in like 2019. Indivisible from 505 Games is like a 2D action platforming RPG, I believe. Uh, I don't remember what the consensus was, but... I, th I think it was pretty positive. I think people like this game, right? It Takes Two on Nintendo Switch. Now this, this is awful. Don't get me wrong. It Takes Two is a fantastic game. I think it was totally deserving of Game of the Year 2021, uh, although I would have personally given it to Metroid Dread, but It Takes Two is a fantastic co-op game. But this Switch port, man, EA, EA, come on now. It's, I get it. It's a pretty game, but you can do better than this. This port looks like poo poo i know i know the switch is like you know outdated hardware and all that but y come on you can do better than this it'll do two plus another recent pickup so i haven't had t uh, time to try out this one at all but i played it'll do on the wii u like the original game and i really enjoyed it at the time i don't know if it actually holds up maybe i was just thirsty for some sort of a uh, zelda experience on the wii u when wind waker wasn't you know satisfying that itch there was no 2d zelda games on wii u that were new anyway so at the time it'll do one really kind of satisfied my hunger for a zelda game not sure if it'll do two as good not sure if the game ever was actually good but um this one does have a ton of little inserts and stuff which is always nice jojo's bizarre adventure all-star battle r i recently got into jojo's like late last year or maybe maybe it was the year before wow it's been a long time i haven't really been keeping up with manga recently i need to really get on my game again i used to be reading you know pretty much everything in weekly jump weekly as it was coming out i'm not even caught up on one piece right now i know i'm, I'm doing terrible but i read through part one of jojo's and i really enjoyed it but i think you know despite how much i actually really like the art style of the manga I think I'm going to, you know, reset and watch through the anime with my girlfriend. I think that'd be the better JoJo's experience. Um, and then, of course, there was this game, which is just a a port or a remake, I guess, of a PS3 JoJo's game. But then they also added more uh, season pass content, which I'm always cool with. Um, if it's a really good fighting game from the PS3 era and they bring it back and just do more DLC, I'm cool with that. So Jump Force came out a couple years ago, and it kind of got a lot of hate. Like, there was a lot of hype for this game initially, despite the art style. It's like, oh, they're they're finally making a big budget uh, Shonen Jump crossover, as if they hadn't already done that. I don't know why Jump Force specifically had, like, a lot of hype behind it, because they had already made J-Star Victory Versus Plus or whatever. But either way, Jump Stars had a lot of hype behind it. It came out. I thought it was fine. I I played a lot of it on PS4. Um, I didn't finish it, but I did do all of the online trophies before the servers went down. But, you know, the art style just got awful. I, I don't know why they keep trying to do this. <laughs> I just, just stop. It's not good. But what I find really egregious about the Switch version specifically, I believe this came out in August of 2021, I want to say. I'm not sure where the date would be on the back of here. But it came out quite a while after the uh the ps4 and xbox versions of jump force they shut down the servers like not even a full year later so like when they ported this to switch and released it they had to have already known the servers were shutting down my theory is that there must be another jump crossover game releasing because like the game sold very well this game was not a bomb do not let the the critic score and like the consensus now uh, cloud your judgment this game was very popular it sold very very well i'm not to the point where i think they did two season passes for it so I don't know why they shut down the servers. Once again, maybe they're just doing another game soon, but I think it's pretty pretty shady to have released this on Switch and then shut down the servers not even a full year later. I really don't think that's okay. Here we have Katamari Damacy Reroll and We Heart Katamari Reroll plus Royal Reverie. Katamari is kind of similar to Monkey Ball for me in that I always thought the series looked really fun, and then I played it, 
and I wasn't really vibing with it all that much. Uh, I definitely have played more Monkey Ball to really make that statement, like feel a little bit more concrete than Katamari Damacy. I haven't finished a reroll, so I got to do that. I think there's a co-op mode, so I think that'd be fun to play through uh, with a friend or something. But um, then it, I, the controls, man, the controls were really giving me a lot of tr trouble. Maybe I'm just dumb. Yes, I am. Uh, but the controls, I need to get used to the controls, and then I think I'll be fine with Katamari Damacy. But I love the idea of just rolling up a ton of little items until you become super big. Now, I don't have it on Switch, but Donut County, kind of like the inverse where you're putting stuff into a hole and the hole gets bigger and bigger. Uh, super, super big fan of that game. So definitely need to give these another shot soon. Killer Queen Black, this was, I, I remember it was like a really big deal when it got announced for Switch in 2018 at E3. Just a super fun arcade game. Kingdom New Lands and Kingdom Majestic, some of my favorite indie games of all time. I remember I played and reviewed New Lands back in 2017 on the Switch, and I really enjoyed what I played of it, but quite frankly, I didn't really get that deep in it. You know, I wasn't really playing through several runs in a row of Kingdom New Lands, but when Kingdom 2 Crowns came out on the Switch later on, I downloaded that when I had like first moved out of my parents' house, and this game was like my therapy. I would come home from work, and I was, you know, living on my own, and I was like, man, I need to play some Kingdom 2 Crowns. And I remember, I think it was my first weekend off after moving out from my house and, you know, living on my own. My first weekend off, I think I played Kingdom 2 Crowns for 24 hours straight. <laughs> like, I, I, I freaking no life kingdom two crowns such a fun rts game for someone that doesn't play that many rts's at least not the traditional kind on pc like total war and stuff and age of empires like you know i like pikmin that's not really what you think of when you think of an rts kingdom is not what you think of when you think of an rts either but it is such a fun little management rts game where you're you're just going left and right gathering little resources having your workers chop down trees and stuff at nighttime the greed come and they attack your base such a fun game. Cannot recommend it enough. Really love it. They did just release that Kingdom 80s game, which I, I feel like maybe they tried to get the Stranger Things license or something, and then they couldn't do it. Um, it kind of disappointing, quite frankly. They didn't really add enough to it, in my opinion. But Kingdom, once again, cannot recommend it enough. One of my favorite indie games of all time. Here we have some Kirby games. So we have Kirby Star Allies. I When I played this in 2018, I was still on my Kirby hater era. At some point, something clicked with me, and I mean, I know what that point was, it was Forgotten Land, but at some point, uh, something clicked in me, and I became a Kirby enjoyer. So I went back and played Star Allies again, and I was like, huh, you know, this is still probably the worst modern Kirby game, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it on the second run-through. That first run-through, though, back in 2018, when I was still in my Kirby, Kirby hater era, I, uh, I didn't really enjoy it, but playing through it again, I, I did enjoy it. And then when Forgotten Land came out in 2022, I mean, that was what really did it for me. That's when I truly, like... I finally got it. And I, I know that might sound weird because it's just a stupid little Kirby game. Like, there's 2D Kirby games. They're such basic games. What do you mean you didn't get it before? But there was something that clicked in me when I played Forgotten Land co-op with my girlfriend. And then I went back and played Triple Deluxe. I played Planet Robobot. And then, of course, just last year, we got Return of Dreamland Deluxe. I love Kirby games. Like, they're, they're so much fun. When you don't take it seriously, when you're not thinking like, oh, instead of getting this game this month, we're getting Kirby from Nintendo again. There's always all these Kirby games coming out instead of like, oh, not F-Zero or whatever. When you just take it at face value and you, you just trying to let yourself enjoy Kirby, Kirby is like the most enjoyable Nintendo IP of all time. Return to Dreamland Deluxe was freaking incredible. And of course, so was Forgotten Land. I cannot wait to see what Hal does next in terms of a new 2D Kirby game, but also for that sequel to Forgotten Land. I know they're cooking it. They got to be cooking it. I cannot wait to see what they do with the next Kirby game. I know we'll probably get some random cooking spinoff or, you know, some random party game or something, but but even those over the years I've learned to really enjoy. So yeah, Kirby in the Switch era, that, this is when I became a bona fide Kirby fan, and uh, I am so happy to be able to say that because there are so many Kirby games that I've gone back to and I have enjoyed in the years since. Feels good, man. This one I could have sworn was an NT Creates game the first time I saw it. We have Kumao Zhao Ramilia Scarlet Symphony. I just butchered that first word there. Uh, this is a Castlevania style game. It is a Toho game. Um, I'm not too familiar with the Toho project. I know it's like some fan sourced games, but then they just keep making a bunch of them. I think it started as like a shmup, but then there's just a ton of stuff. But this is a really good looking um, kind of 2D Castlevania game. And I, I thought it looked really cool. So I bought it. Labyrinth of Refrain, as well as Labyrinth of Galeria from NIS America. This one recently got a reprint through VGP, so happy to have it. Uh, these are more akin to like an Etrian Odyssey, I believe, from NIS America. But um, of course, going for that NIS America set. 
how to get these. The last worker, this is another one of those Wario 64 pickups. I don't, I, I know, I, I'll be honest. I know literally nothing about this game, so let's learn about it. The Last Worker is an immersive narrative adventure centered around a lone worker's last stand in an increasingly automated world. Kurt works for the world's largest retailer and is forced to choose between capitalism or activism. Having dedicated his life to work, Kurt's loyalty is put to the test when a group of activists ask him to dismantle jungle from the inside. Okay, you know what? That actually sounds pretty cool. I'm glad I bought this. All right, now, when I was talking about the Atelier games, I mentioned that I bought them because A, I wanted to play them and I thought they looked interesting, but B, I was more so buying them early because I didn't want them to get expensive and then I would have like FOMO of not having them. Well, I guess that is FOMO. Uh, there was another series that I kind of had that was a similar thing to that for me, and that is the Legend of Heroes franchise. I am waiting. I am not going to start with Trails of Cold Steel 3. I refuse. They ported 1 and 2 to Switch in Japan, but because it was a different publisher, we haven't gotten those games in America. But even beyond that, I'm not really going to start with Cold Steel either. I know people say you can kind of start anywhere. I want to start with Sky. Xenoblade is my favorite franchise, or at least one of my favorite franchises, as I mentioned earlier, and I have been recommended Legend of Heroes so much. Like, I know, I know I'm going to like the series, but I'm waiting for more remakes and ports of the first games so I can start from the beginning and really go through all of them. And hey, I have plenty of time. I, I can wait. I I am fine with waiting to play all these games because, frankly, it's going to take me a, a hundred years to get through them all anyway because there are so many. Um, so I've been buying them as they come out in the hopes that one day they bring those older games to Switch. If not, I guess eventually I'll break down and play them on PSP or I think they're on Steam, you know, if it really comes to it. But I, I, I have a feeling they'll come to Switch eventually. So we have Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel 3. We have Trails of Cold Steel 4. Legend of Heroes Trails from Zero. I think people said in my comments one time that I could start here, but... Eh, I want to start with Sky. Legend of Heroes Trails to Azur. Legend of Heroes Trails into Reverie. And Legend of Nayuta Boundless Trails. So yeah, that's that's a lot of Legend of Heroes games, and I haven't even started a single one, but I I know I'm going to like this series when I get to it eventually, just waiting for those older games to come over. But now we get to talk about another legendary series here, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I actually have two copies of it. This one came with the um, the Explorer's Guide edition, so it doesn't have the ESRB, so I have two copies of this. Actually, I have three copies of this, but we'll, we'll get to that one later. Breath of the Wild, I'm not sure how much there is that needs to be said that hasn't already been said about this game. What a monumental moment for the Legend of Zelda series. As someone who grew up with Ocarina of Time and, you know, I was playing Zelda 1 and Zelda 2 and I linked to the past as a kid and Minish Cap, as someone who appreciates those older games, I mean, Wind Waker is probably still my favorite Zelda game. Breath of the Wild is so freaking good, dude. Such a breath of fresh air, pun intended. Like, I I replayed it last year before Tears of the Kingdom came out, and it still held up. You know, there's never going to be that experience like playing it for the first time. But playing it again after all those years, after forgetting some of the shrines and kind of the world layout, it... It really holds up. It's not just that first time experience that makes it special. It is a special game, no matter when you play it, how often you play it. It is just a really, really great game. And then you have Tears of the Kingdom, which for some reason people just absolutely hate. I've been pretty vocal about this, but I don't really get the idea that you can not like Tears of the Kingdom, but like Breath of the Wild. You can like Breath of the Wild more from like a personal, more subjective perspective, because that first experience, you know, that hype leading up to the Switch and actually getting it after all those years, that was a big moment. And Tears of the Kingdom is more of the same. But in, in my opinion, it's more of the same, just better in every way. The dungeons are better, the world map's better, the, the music's better, the bosses are better, the abilities are better. Like, every aspect of this game, in my opinion, is better than Breath of the Wild. So while it maybe didn't have the impact that Breath of the Wild had, it's just a better game. I freaking adore Tears of the Kingdom. I also really love Link's Awakening. This was a remake that I wasn't really expecting back in 2019. And having got this, I would have expected more 2D remakes of Zelda games on the Switch, but that just has not happened. So I hope we get the Oracle games or Minish Cap or something in the near future. But Link's Awakening remake, an absolute gem back in 2019. Once again, that 2019 momentum with Astral Chain and Fire Emblem and Damon X Machina and all that. Like Link's Awakening released on the same day as the Switch Lights. Um, just a really great remake. I know there were some performance issues, but it was really only that one area for me in like the swamp. Um, but otherwise, I think I played through this twice. Like, I, I really enjoyed this game. Did not like the uh, the Dompe stuff where you have to, like, build your little dungeon. Did not enjoy that at all. I don't think they needed to add that, but really great game. And then finally, we have The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD. Now, Skyward Sword has a lot of sentimental value to me because it was 
one of the first games I had ever pre-ordered uh, back when I was younger. I, I think the, fir the first game I ever pre-ordered was Pokemon Black. Uh, Skyward Sword would have been the second. And I, I remember when GameStop released it, I think it was like November 11th, 2011 or something like that. I remember picking up that Wiimote bundle with the gold Wiimotes. At some point I sold that because I'm a big I'm a big dummy and I really regret doing that. But Skyward Sword was the first major Zelda game I got on release on my own and it was just such a magical time. I never finished it because I was young. I mean, I would have been 11 when this game came out originally. So I never finished it, even though I really enjoyed it because I think I got stuck doing some of the um, the teardrop stuff. I can't remember what they call it, but like, you know, when you have to go through an area and you have to like get all the little, little gems while you're running from the, the scary guards. I can't remember what that entire section is called. I'm sorry. But um, I think I got stuck doing that when I was a kid. So having this HD version and finally getting to roll credits for the first time on Skyward Sword was just an awesome time. I love this game. I love the story. Definitely my favorite version of Zelda. Probably just my favorite version of the cast in general. I think Gear Him is an awesome villain. I think Fi or Fee is a super cool cool companion i think the loft wings are super cool you know the sky islands are eh, sky islands that's that's kind of weird to say that now because i associate that term with tears of the kingdom but the uh the sky the sky in uh skyward sword yeah it's a little barren and i think wind waker did that idea better in terms of like having islands essentially but um skyward sword an absolute gem it gets too much hate in my opinion i mean i feel like people have kind of come around on it it's it's not as bad as it was but back in like 2014 man People were hating on Skyward Sword, but it's a, it's a really good 3D Zelda game. I do have a couple Lego games on the Switch. So we have the Lego Harry Potter collection. I always wanted to play these as a kid, but I never got around to it. I had Lego Batman. I had uh, Lego Marvel Super Heroes. That was a little bit later. Lego City Undercover, of course. Uh, but that was like my early teens at that point. I uh, never got around to playing this. Never played like the Lego Indiana Jones games. Weird to me that they ported this, but not like Indiana Jones and the Batman games to Switch. I would like to see those come over in the future. Lego Worlds. I thought this was going to be hype, man. Like Lego Minecraft. And then it wasn't very good. And then Lego Fortnite happened. And it's just Lego Minecraft, but good. So... This game kind of has a weird spot in history now that LEGO Fortnite exists. I mean, this is just... It's not a very good game. The Liar Princess and the Blind Prince. This one was really pricey for a while, and VGP reprinted it for like 30 bucks. Really happy I was able to snag it when it was reprinted. And I actually just cracked it open very recently and started playing it. Only a couple hours in, although I think it's a pretty short game. I think I might be like halfway through it. This game's presentation and the story is so sweet, so beautiful. Uh, story's really sad. <laughs> and, you know, if you, if you don't want a sad story, man, maybe... Maybe not for you, but really touching story. I would love to see this adapted into an anime or something because the art style and, you know, like the story, like I said, is so great. But the gameplay, the gameplay is not very good. It's, it kind of feels like a Flash game almost. Like it's, it's, it's kind of bad. Like the game itself isn't very fun. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm being too harsh. In my opinion, like, I'm going to finish. I'm going to see it through because I, I'm really attached to the characters and the story. And the like I said, the presentation is great as, as well. But the gameplay just feels so cheap. It's just a really basic 2D puzzle platformer with occasional action elements where you have to transform into a wolf and do a couple attacks and the enemies just die in three hits. I haven't encountered any boss battles or anything. Like there's not, there's not much complexity. I kind of wish there was no combat in this game and it was strictly a puzzle platformer. But I digress. If you want a cute story, definitely check this out. I'm hoping that the Cruel King, which I also have, we'll show that when we do the special editions. I hope that one has better gameplay. I think that one might be a turn-based RPG, which I think might fit better for this developer's kind of kind of talent skill set. <laughs> you know, um, not 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 to be too too rude here, but um, yeah, if you want a really cute storybook kind of uh, platformer, Liar Princess and the Blind Prince. Life is Strange True Colors. Now, Life is Strange, I played that when it came out back when it was episodic. I was I was waiting for those episodes. I think that game is incredibly cringe. I <laughs> I, I I respect I respect Life is Strange, but I don't really like Life is Strange 1. And I never played 2 or Before the Storm. And I wasn't really like sure about True Colors. I'm not even quite frankly sure why I bought it back when I did. I think it was like Black Friday 2021, and I was like, oh, I want some new PS5 games to play. So I bought it on PS5, and I played it there. I actually think this game is really good. I'm not sure about the Switch port, but Life is Strange True Colors, you know, it was their first time releasing Life is Strange all at once. Like, they didn't do it episodically. It was all released at once. It was by the developer that did Before the Storm, I think. Deck 9, I believe, right? Yeah, Deck 9 right there. And I thought it was a really endearing tale. <laughs> that sounds overdramatic. But I, I don't know. I, I thought True Colors was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the story in this one. Little Nightmares Complete Edition. This is one I've always had my eye on. Played a little bit of it, definitely. 
what I expected, you know, I grew up loving Limbo on Xbox Live Arcade, kind of feels like a little bit like that, not quite the same in terms of its aesthetic, but just a creepy, kind of crawly 2D puzzle platformer, um, definitely lived up to the hype from what I played, need to finish it, do the little uh, DLC, and then play Little Nightmares 2, because Little Nightmares 3 is coming out very soon, this game also had like the weird <laughs> Paku mask, the Pac-Man amiibo support on Switch, why'd they do that? All right, now this was exciting. Live Alive. This was a remake of a Super Famicom game that had never gotten localized in North America. This came out back in 2022 from Square Enix. They remade it in the HD 2D art style from Octopath, and I thought it was okay. I think this game is fine. I I really like the idea of having all these different stories. I think it's eight characters in this game, right? I really like the idea of having eight stories that kind of interconnect. Kind of sounds like Octopath. Octopath doesn't do it quite right either, in my opinion. But the issue with having stories that short is the gameplay, I think, suffers greatly. Like, this game has this, like, weird tactical grid gameplay, but it's really not that in-depth and, quite frankly, not very fun. I like the stories, I like the presentation and the, and the writing and all that, but I don't think the gameplay in Live Alive is very fun. You know, because it never lasts long enough for it to get that deep before you move on to the next character and have to rebuild them from the, from the ground up. I mean, there is the entire ending section where it all kind of comes to a head, no spoilers, but... Eh, I don't like the gameplay on this one, but I do like these stories, so it's like a it's like a 7.5 for me, maybe. Here we have the Lost Child from NIS America. This is another one that had gotten delisted uh, back on the eShop, I think, last year. So I bought it before it got super pricey. I think it's like 100 bucks now. Um, this is their, their SMT game, right? This is their Shemigami Tensei, if you will, I believe is what it is. I remember seeing this one, I think, on the Vita, I want to say, back in those days, and I thought it looked super interesting there, so I always wanted to play it, but who knows if I'll ever make the time for it. Luigi's Mansion 3. Man, this was an exciting game. Now, if you aren't aware, Luigi's Mansion 1 is my favorite game of all time, at least from, like, the nostalgic perspective. I'm not sure if it's, like, oh, it's my favorite game of all time because I think it's the greatest game ever made. No, I don't think Luigi's Mansion 1 is the greatest game ever made, but I really love that game. I have a very special place in my heart for the original Luigi's Mansion game, and Dark Moon on the 3DS, I think, is not very good. I really don't like Luigi's Mansion 2 that much, so when LM3 was announced, I was very excited because I wanted an HD Luigi's Mansion game, but I was also very scared because I, I mean, we knew immediately that it was being made by Next Level, who had made Dark Moon, and I didn't really trust them with Luigi's Mansion, but, you know, I'll take this, like, middle ground we got where they added more unique kind of boss ghosts on each floor of the hotel, but also still have, like, the, the more lighter atmosphere, we'll say, of Dark Moon in this game. It's not quite what I want, but I still think this is a really great Switch game. One of the best for sure. One of the best looking Switch games from Nintendo itself. Absolutely. I just hope we eventually one day get a Luigi's Mansion game that is more like the original. I know that will probably never happen. If we can get a remake of that on Switch in HD or something, that'd be great for me too. I, I, I would be happy at that point. You can make however many Luigi's Mansion games that are like Dark Moon as you want. Just give me a full remake of LM1 where you don't mess up the, the dust particles. Please, please, Nintendo. But yeah, Luigi's Mansion 3 is great. I don't want to discredit it at all. I just, I'm just a grumpy old man, and I want Luigi's Mansion 1 again. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe plus downloadable content, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass, featuring the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass for the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe game. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, as, as you can see. But also, this is the... Uh, kind of weird, rare, limited release, I don't know if it was limited, uh, release that they did, I think, in Singapore or something, where they released it with the Booster Course Pass, it has an ESRB logo, I do have a Japanese copy of this, which we'll get to, um, because I didn't think they would do an ESRB copy of this, it didn't release in, like, the U US, I don't think, I don't think you could go to a Walmart and buy this in America, but maybe somewhere else, maybe in Mexico or something, I'm not too sure, but, um, yeah, shout out to Lake Grass from my server for, uh, letting me know this even exists, because I had no idea. I, I had bought the Japanese one, which we'll show when we get to the Japanese games, but this is a very weird, not known very well release from Nintendo. I mean, Mario Kart Deluxe, I don't really need to talk about it, right? We we all know Mario Kart Deluxe, right? Okay, we're good. We don't need to talk about it. It's, it's the best Mario Kart game at this point. With all the DLC, it's the best one. I still like seven more, but this is the best one. Mario Tennis Aces. This was like one of the marquee games back in 2018, which is kind of sad. <laughs> It just goes to show that 2018 wasn't the best year, but despite how people feel about this game now, and despite how people feel about the content rollout for this game, 
I actually really like Mario Tennis Aces. The story mode is whatever, but I think the mechanics are really good. I just wish there was more content to do with those mechanics. And similarly, I kind of I kind of feel the same with Mario Golf Super Rush. I actually enjoyed this game as well. I guess what I learned about myself during the Switch generation, as we get, as we will get to when we talk about Nintendo Switch Sports, I kind of like sports games a lot. Not like Madden or FIFA, but when Nintendo has their spin on a sports game, I'm kind of into it. I definitely like Tennis Aces more than Super Rush, but even Super Rush, despite its horrible story mode, I I had a good time with it. Like it's a it's like a 6.5 7 out of 10, but like. I enjoyed that that 6.57 out of 10 more than I would other 6.5 out of 10s. I don't know I don't know if that makes sense, but I I enjoyed my time with it. And then Tennis Aces I think is actually a genuinely pretty good Mario Tennis game. Um, although I don't have the uh, I, I've never played Power Tennis on the on the GameCube, so I I don't know. Maybe it actually got way worse, but uh, it's certainly a major step up from Ultra Smash. And then Mario Strikers Battle League. This game is just bad. I mean. Is it, is it bad? Is it just lacking content? I'm not really sure. I, frankly, I didn't play it that much because there wasn't much to do with it. If you're not playing online, you're just kind of wasting time in this game, and I didn't really want to play it online. Uh, yeah, this game desperately needed some story mode content or something to keep me engaged, and it didn't have that, so I kind of just fell off it pretty quick. Here we have the newest release for this video at the time of recording, Mario vs. Donkey Kong. I already played through it, still have to do the uh, the expert levels, but uh, this is my first time playing this this version of this game, or, well, this version, yeah, obviously. But this is my first time playing Mario vs. Donkey Kong. I never played it on the original Game Boy Advance. Um, I've played Tepping Stars, I've played the 3DS eShop Mario and Donkey Kong game, and I enjoyed those games, but this is a completely different style of game, and I really enjoyed it. I don't know if I necessarily like it more, than what we've gotten in, in future installments. I In fact, I think I actually don't. I think I prefer the Lemming style, which I know might be crazy to some people, but I think they can coexist. I think this can coexist with Tipping Stars. I know that might sound crazy, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it for sure. I, I hope we get you know more sequels like this. I wouldn't be surprised if we get a sequel to this that is in the same gameplay style, but at the same time, I hope we get a Lemmings again from Nintendo because I think those games have a place too. I know there was a lot of them in a pretty quick time frame. Like there, you know, there wasn't much time to breathe in between all of those Mario vs. DK games we got on the 3DS and Wii U and even on the DS. But um, I hope we get more of those too. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. I think these games are not too good. Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle as well as Mario plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope. Kind of talk about these together. So I, I played and actually 100%ed Kingdom Battle. I did all the DK Adventure DLC. Freaking love that game. Sparks of Hope, I played it like maybe 10 or 15 hours of and just kind of fell off. Then it finished it. It's probably a better game, right? Like I think Sparks of Hope is probably a better Mario plus Rabbids game. But the context of 2017, I guess this is kind of like the Tears of the Kingdom argument. The context of Mario plus Rabbids in 2017 with the release of the Switch and just how hype it was that we were getting this like new weird Mario spinoff, like it was a different time and I really enjoyed it back then. Sparks of Hope kind of came out at a pretty bad time where Bayonetta was coming out and Scarlet and Violet were coming out and Splatoon 3 came out. Like it was kind of sandwiched in between all of these other games where as Mario plus Rabbids in August 2017, like there was nothing else around it except for Poke and Tournament Deluxe which is another Wii U port. So um, Sparks of Hope, I think is probably a better game, but Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle definitely hit better for me. Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, The Black Order. This is one of the weirdest games Nintendo has chosen to revive and publish for the Nintendo Switch. I really enjoy this game. I never played the original Ultimate Alliance games on 360 or I guess on PS2 as well, right? Um, I never played those, but I enjoyed this. I know it's kind of like that you know, stinky Switch performance. And frankly, this game probably should have been on everything, but I guess it wouldn't have existed if not for Nintendo to begin with. So, eh, but um, I enjoyed it as a, you know, this was when I was really getting into the MCU or at least... I was already caught up at this point, right? Like, I caught up before Infinity War, which was 2018, but um, I guess this was, like, peak MCU right after Endgame, which is crazy to think that Endgame was almost five years ago. But, um, yeah, this is a fun online multiplayer co-op, uh, kind of just Marvel beat-em-up game. It's fun. I like it. All right, here we have a whole lot of Mega Man. So Mega Man Legacy Collection 1 and 2 just picked this up as well as a couple of these other collections. I love classic Mega Man. I've only beaten like the first four. Played a lot of five and six, but never finished them. And then seven through 10, I just have not touched at all. So I definitely need to do that. But Mega Man 2 and 3, I adore those games. I, I really, really love 2 in particular. Then I also recently picked up the Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2. Uh, Mega Man X, I need to give another shot because I remember playing it when I was younger and thinking, wow, I, I, I hear so much hype for this game and I'm playing it and I see it's higher quality than the classic NES Mega Man games, but I'm not enjoying it as much. 
uh, maybe that's just me, but I kind of I kind of really just like classic NES Mega Man. Maybe I need to give these another shot, like I said, but I, uh, of course, had to get this for the collection. Then we also have the Mega Man Zero slash ZX Legacy Collection. Haven't tried any of these games, but I believe Inti Creates made them, so I'll probably like them. Then we have Mega Man 11. This game came out, did pretty well, and then they just didn't make Mega Man 12. <laughs> like, I feel like... I feel like that should have happened by now. Maybe it's maybe it's cooking, but I think the uh, the Mega Man like main producer guy, he well not not Keiji Inafune, but the main person behind Mega Man Eleven. I'm pretty sure he left Capcom because uh, Keiji Inafune was already gone at that point. But maybe we'll get Mega Man Twelve one day. This game sold well. I think they said if it sold well, they would make another one. So I don't know what's going on with that. And then finally, the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection. Always wanted to try out these games. Um, there's so many games in this collection. I mean, this is all of them, right? Except for like the Star Force games, which are technically a different series. I mean, this is a lot of battle network to play. So uh, definitely a lot to chew on. Another legacy collection of sorts, the Metal Gear Solid Master Collection Volume 1. Just cracked this open the other day to start playing the original Metal Gear uh, on NES, and, uh, I mean, it's an NES game, uh, <laughs> and then it has the, su the, you know, super high expectations for it, but, I mean, it's Metal Gear, it's fine, and I also loaded up a little bit of Metal Gear Solid, really great voice acting, I, I, I really get what people mean when they say, like, wow, Metal Gear Solid was, like, their first realization that video games can be more than just 2D platformers that are pretty basic and don't have much story. Um, need to play through more of it, but um, yeah, someone who didn't grow up with these games, happy to have this, and eventually play through all of them, although, I'll probably just play one and two and then play the remake of three that's coming out. And then from there, I mean, I imagine they'll probably do a, a based on volume one here. I imagine they'll do a collection two that includes, uh, you know, guns of the Patriots and uh, peace Walker and all that. So I'll be waiting for that. Metroid dread. This is one of my most hated games in my collection. It's one of my favorite switch games. Like Metroid dread is fantastic. It's my favorite Metroid game. I love, love, love Metroid dread, but I bought the special edition of this game and it only came with the steelbook. In my opinion, if you're going to sell a special edition, you should include the steelbook, if you're going to include that, and the regular case. I think the steelbook should be an extra thing, not the main thing when it doesn't have any text on the spine. I hate this. It's such a sore thumb on my shelf. But Metroid Dread, you know, regardless of the, the special edition uh, steelbook case here, Metroid Dread is my favorite Metroid game ever right next to Fusion. I think this game is incredible. Cannot recommend it enough. If you like 2D Metroidvanias, it is, it is top tier. Mercury Steam absolutely cooked with this one. And then we have Metroid Prime Remastered, which undeniably is a fantastic remaster. However, I have tried to play Metroid Prime my entire life. Back when I was like seven years old on the Wii, I remember trying to play Metroid Prime 3. My brother had it. Then I, I had Metroid Prime 1 and 2 on GameCube, tried to play them, didn't really like it. And I have tried it on and off throughout the years because it's always considered, you know, one of the best Nintendo games. I think it is right up there with Tears of the Kingdom and Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time is like the highest reviewed Nintendo game. I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. I This is a good game. Like, I think this is like a solid 7.5 out of 10. I think Metroid Prime is is good, not great. It's, it's, it's fine. The remaster that Retro did for this game is really good. They did a great job bringing this game to the Switch and making it look really good. It's one of the best looking Switch games. There's so much wrong with this game. It feels slow. The shooting's not fun. The combat's not fun. The bosses are pretty good, but the backtracking is too much. I don't know, man. I guess I had different expectations of what a 3D Metroid would be because I played all the 2D Metroids first and especially Mercury Steam's 2D Metroid games. Those games are designed to be played fast. Like they want you to play those games fast, but even, even Super Metroid, you play pretty fast, right? Or at least I always have. I played these games pretty quickly. Metroid Prime is just so slow and I guess that's fine. It's just a different type of game, but I don't think it's for me. And I mean, that's fine. I, I, I'll happily support these games so we get more metroid but 2d metroid that is my jam i will i will stay in my lane and i'll play two and three when they get ported eventually and i'll play four of course and i think four with more modern sensibilities will probably be something i really enjoy and i know saying that i just have like a hit list on me now like people are gonna come at me in the comments but i've made my thoughts on metroid prime very clear i don't want to hate on it too much i think it is a good game it's just not it's not all it's cracked up to be. Here we have another NT Creates banger, Mighty Gumvolt Burst. You know, the first time I played this back in 2017, I wasn't super into it, but I came back to it a couple years later, and um, there's a lot of cool aspects of this game. You have to, like, customize your character with, like, different, like, chips or something, and I don't know. There's a lot of different playable characters. It's just another kind of 2D Mega Man game. Um, it's it's funny because this is the companion game to Mighty Number no. 9, which... 
I just realized never came to Switch, which is super funny, um, where you play as um, Mighty Number no. Nine and the guy from Azure Striker Gunvolt. <laughs> but I guess NT Creates really is the company that people go to when they need a companion game because they made this for Mighty Number no. Nine. They made uh, Curse of the Moon for Bloodstained. Like they make these smaller games that actually end up being better than the main game. It's kind of funny to think about. Metopia. Now this is one I really wanted to play on the 3DS, but at that point, the 3DS was like already old and stinky and like the Switch was new in 2017 when this came out in America. So never played it on 3DS or I think I might have played the demo or something, but uh, waited for the Switch release. And I mean, I wasn't expecting a Switch release, but it kind of just happened that way. And I really like this game. It's not Tomodachi Life. It is no Tomodachi Life. Let's make that very clear. This is not a replacement for Tomodachi Life, but it kind of scratched that itch. It's a lot of fun just putting your friends and family and stuff into a me RPG and have them say heinous things. Um, and also like celebrities and other video game characters and stuff like there's a lot of fun to be had in utopia the gameplay itself not the greatest i mean it's a pretty basic uh rpg i think i was using auto battle for a lot of it because the game's like i mean it's not like a hard game or anything you can kind of just breeze through it but for what it is i'm glad they brought this to the switch they added that super awesome like me maker to the game where you can like really go crazy with the designs of your me's in this game and uh yeah i'm glad they brought this to switch we got minecraft on nintendo switch it's minecraft as well as Minecraft Dungeons Ultimate Edition. Now, I have played through this game. I didn't do any of the DLC stuff, but Minecraft Dungeons, pretty fun game. Like I said, baby's first Diablo, but I played through this with my girlfriend and uh, we both really enjoyed it. I mean, she played it way more than me, but um, yeah, for a pretty basic Diablo style game, but set in the Minecraft world with pretty nice visuals, I, uh, I like this game a lot. And then we have Minecraft Legends, which in my opinion, just why? I don't think Minecraft needed an RTS. I played a little bit of it, didn't run well on Switch at all, turned it off, didn't really look back. And I will say right now, because I'm sure I'll get comments being like, wow, you have such a big collection, what else are you trying to get? Uh, I do want to get Minecraft Story Mode 1 and 2, but those are very pricey on Switch, um, so I need to get those. Here we have a Monarch, another NIS America game. This kind of looked like a Persona style thing where you have like a school system, I believe. Yeah, you follow your ego, not your Persona, your ego. Um, but this looked pretty cool. I think it got like, you know, it's one, it's one of those things like I was saying with Chrysler, it's like, NIS America just makes consistent 7 out of 10 bangers, <laughs> which sometimes just hit really hard, and I think this is another one of those kind of games. Here we have Monster Crown not hiding its uh, art inspiration at all, but I'm okay with that, you know, that's fine with me. Uh, this is just a Pokemon style game, pretty cool. Speaking of monsters, we have Monster Harvest. This was uh, not $15, it was $5 at clearance on GameStop when I bought it. Uh, that's the only reason I bought it, but it actually, I mean bad cover art cute pixel art i mean the pixel art's not anything special or necess necessarily but it, it looks better than the, the art on the front in my opinion and then we get to some monster hunter games now monster hunter is a series i have very conflicted feelings about because i played generations ultimate and i enjoyed it but you know growing up i always tried to play three ultimate and i was like oh what's going on here this is too much for me to handle as a child and then four ultimate and i was like oh this, i don't like playing this on the 3ds and then finally when monster hunter world came out on the ps4 it finally clicked i played like 100 hours of that game i really enjoyed it and then generations ultimate came out played it then it finished it, but I enjoyed it, you know, having learned how to play Monster Hunter from World, which I think was way more accessible. And then Monster Hunter Rise came out, and I played it for, like, maybe five hours, and I just never really looked back. I think the issue was, at the time, I didn't really have any friends playing it. Um, all my friends got it a little bit later, and then, of course, when it came out on PS5, they played it there, too. So, uh, yeah, Monster Hunter Rise is something I would like to go back to, but at this point, I will probably just wait for Wilds. I'm fine with skipping a Monster Hunter here or there. You know, I don't need to play every single entry in the franchise. Maybe once every, like, 10 years, I'll, I'll hop into Monster Hunter and see what's new. Uh, but Monster Hunter Rise, from what I did play, I will say, it was very good. Like, it, it was probably better than World. I really liked the Palamute, uh, the new movement mechanics. Like, it felt like a better Monster Hunter World, and it always annoys me you know, before Monster Hunter Wilds was announced, people were like, oh, when are we going to get the next mainline Monster Hunter game after Monster Hunter World? mf -er, it's right here. I, I, <laughs> I'm not trying to like, it, it sounds like some Nintendo fanboy BS right here, but like, it always, it really irritates me when people try to discredit this game. Even as someone who didn't really play it, it's like, bro, I know you don't have a Switch. I know you want the next main, like big console, like PS5 Monster Hunter. This is Monster Hunter 6. This is Monster Hunter 6. <laughs> let's not let's not let's not get twisted here. This this literally is a mainline Monster Hunter game. And then we have Monster Hunter Stories 2, which I also played like 10 hours of and really enjoyed, but I got in my head thinking about how I wanted to play Monster Hunter Stories 1 first, and luckily for me, 
That game just got announced for Switch, so I will be checking out that this summer. Here we have Monster Menu, the Scavengers Cookbook, based on the art style, at least of the cover. I'm guessing this is actually from the same developers as Disgaea. I know NIS America publishes them, of course, but literally the same art style. Um, I remember I was going to play this game because I thought it looked really fun. And then I went on how long to beat, and it said it was 60 hours or something like that. And I was like, yep, I'm never going to play this game because of that. Oh, here's our first full game download, game card not included. Yeah, I don't have... Mortal Kombat 11 on Switch, but I have the sealed, <laughs> I have the sealed Aftermath uh, set. I guess I should open this and use the code. I don't, maybe it's expired. I don't know, but uh, Mortal Kombat 11 is a fun game. I still need to play Mortal Kombat 1. Haven't, haven't picked up that either. I kind of forgot that was even on Switch until just now, but uh, Mortal Kombat uh, 9 on Xbox 360. I really love that game. I would love if they went back and did like a classic collection. I can, I can picture it now. They can put the two Ks because they always use the K. Mortal Kombat Classic Collection. It's like Deception and all the older ones like that. They need to do that. Here we have the Mummy Demastered and its alternate cover art from uh, Limited Run. This one's sealed. Uh, once again, bought this one from Caleb. But uh, this is from Way Forward, I believe. Super cool looking 2D Metroidvania based on The Mummy. I haven't watched The Mummy, but what a cool movie to get a weird 2D Metroidvania tie-in. Way Forward seems all about that, because they also did that Aliens game on DS that people seem to love. Aliens Infestation, I think it's called. Uh, I also have that one. I, I need to play that too, but uh, yeah, this one this one looks really cool. I mentioned Shmups and Bullet Hells earlier. This is a Musahime-sama. Too good to even have the actual English title on the uh, on the front here, but yeah, Mus Musahime-sama. Another, another bullet hell game here. I bought this at PAX West last year. Thought it looked super neat. Here we have the Mutant Muds collection. They've released this with a couple different cover arts, I believe. Um, this is the only one I have. Mutant Muds on the 3DS, one of my favorite 3DS eShop games. I mean, really what I think of when I think of the 3DS eShop in that era of indie games is like Mutant Muds. Not necessarily Zero Drifter, which I do also have. We'll get to that. I don't think that game's that great, but Mutant Muds. Also probably not realistically that great, but... Back then in like 2012 when there was not much else on the eShop, Mutant Muds hit different, man. My Hero 1's Justice 2, I have the first game digitally. That's what I played. I haven't played this one yet. I don't think it's very good. <laughs> I also don't think My Hero Academia is that good. I, I mean, I'm caught up on it. It's it's fine. I, I don't want to be too harsh on My Hero here for any My Hero fans watching this video. Uh, but these games, I the first game wasn't that good in my opinion, but I've heard this one is way better it's from a uh, biking who recently just did that i think i think they did the jujutsu kaisen game that just came out i believe i might be wrong um my voice is cracked like crazy but uh yeah one's justice 2 hopefully they refined a lot of the mechanics from the first game because i really didn't think that was anything too too special to write home about here's one of those namco museum kind of games they always like to release these there's a couple of them on switch i think this might be the only one i have but namco museum arcade pack just a bunch of classic Namco games, you got Dig Dug, you got Pac-Man, you got, is Mappy, Mappy on here? Do I not have Mappy on Switch? Is that, oh, I think it might be on like Switch Online or something. A lot of Pac-Man though. Splatterhouse, that's pretty cool. Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm 4 Road to Boruto. This did not release in North America, um, or at least, you know, it didn't get an ESRB release, so I had to import this one. Uh, I love, like I mentioned earlier, the Naruto Storm games, so super happy to have this one physically. They did release the Naruto Storm Trilogy physically, but only in Japan. I still want to pick that one up, but uh, super happy to have this one. And then, of course, we have the new release being Naruto Storm Connections, a super disappointing game. Um, I mean, I'm not even one of those people that, like, expected it to be Storm 5. Like, I was expecting another inter interstitial game before we inevitably get Storm 5 featuring a lot more Boruto content, but man, they could have done more with this. Here we have the Legend Edition of NBA 2K20. I don't know why I bought this. I guess I was like, hee hee hee, Legend Edition. I, I don't know. It probably popped up for like eight bucks or something, and that's the only reason I bought this. It's the only 2K game I have on the, on the Switch. Once again, another one of those like weird retro revivals from Microids, new Joe and Mac Caveman Ninja. Uh, I played one of these Joe and Mac games on Switch Online with, with Caleb a couple years ago, and I mean, it was fun. It's just a little 2D beat-em-up game. Uh, I'm not sure how this new one is. New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. Now, this one was, I mean, it was funny when this came out because it was like, they put a U in the title of this of the Switch game. I am one of the uh, defenders of New Soup U, I would say. I think this is a pretty good game. Like, I think this is a fun 2D platformer. It definitely wasn't what the Wii U needed. It definitely came out too close to New Soup 2, which I do think is a better game. But I don't think this is the worst one. It's just kind of another one. New Super Luigi U is really good, but this version of this game in particular is eh, not necessarily the best. They got rid of like the boost mode and stuff. They added Peachette, 
which is weird because they wanted to have playable peace. But at that point, why not just do like playable Daisy or something instead of making these weird like lore implications, you know? And then they also made it so, yeah, one player has to play as Nabbit, who is invincible essentially. So if you're playing with four players, one player is, you know, essentially just invincible, which makes it less fun for them. It's, uh, I mean, you know, it's not the greatest port. And in fact, I would say this is one of the weaker ones that they did it from the Wii U to the Switch. But it gets the job done. I'm glad they brought it over once again. I mean, I think most most Wii U games should come over, even if the port is a little jank. Um, but, eh, it's pretty good. New Tales from the Borderlands. I need to put this with B, I think. I'm going to put this with the, uh, the rest of the Borderlands games now that I have that Legendary Collection. I played Tales from the Borderlands back when it came out and it's fine you know it's a, it's a fun game but i bought this and i was like oh i'm, I'm gonna get back into the borderlands universe they got that movie coming out now i mean that was unrelated because that was announced later but they got that movie coming out now maybe i'll get back into it i don't know if i have the interest anymore i, I mean this game kind of came and went it really just like snuck up they announced it like two months before it came out and then it came out and i don't think really I don't think really anybody cared about this game, which is weird because Tales from the Borderlands was like one of the premier Telltale games back in the day. Like that was one of the highest reviewed. And then this came out and no one cared. Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom. I still want to get the first game on Switch, which is the only one I've played. I enjoyed what I played of it on the PS3 back in the day. Uh, I've heard the sequel isn't as good, but still it's something where uh, level five, Banna Namco, it's Nino Kuni, which is a series I know I've played and enjoyed at least to some extent. I'm going to pick these up on Switch. Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl Ultimate Edition. I actually got the Platinum Trophy for this game over on PlayStation 5. This game's a lot of fun. If you, you know, don't take it too seriously, you calm down. You're not on Twitter rage, raging about this game being released or announced on the same day that Sora was announced or whatever. I remember there was like a whole controversy. People trying to say that Nintendo announced Sora to cover up this game. Guys, I don't think Nintendo cares about this game. But um, if you don't take it too seriously, it's a fun game. I know they did a lot to fix it up. They added character voices and patches, and I think in the sequel, like the sequel looks a lot better. I haven't tried out that one yet, but uh, for, for my money, this was a pretty fun game. Uh, the DLC characters were cool. They added Garfield, which is hype. And I don't know, as far as Smash clones go, I think this is a pretty competent one. This is a pretty cool release. Nickelodeon Kart Racers Collection. I believe this was exclusive to Walmart. It just came out like late last year, but it has the first three Nickelodeon Kart Racers games, Slime Speedway, uh, Grand Prix, I think this one is called, and then whatever that first game's called. Probably says on the back here. No, it does not. But I always wanted to check these out because I like Kart racers, I like licensed games, even if, you know, they're maybe not always the highest budget. Um, and this was a really cool release to have all three on one cartridge with all of the updates. Like, this is the complete experience for these games on the Switch, which is, uh, it's, it's nice that they did this. It was really weird, though, because they did it the same month that they released, like, a download-only code for Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2. Like, make up your mind, game. Are you going to support physical media? Are you going to do weird download codes stuff near automata the end of yora edition this is one of those ports that came out and i think october of 2022 there was just a lot of ports that month of like the most requested switch games ever we got near automata no man's sky persona and there's a couple of others in late 2022 this is a fantastic port of this game i played maybe five hours of it and um you know i need to go back to it and finish it but near automata well even on switch runs really well i mean for what you expect from the switch if you have a playstation play it on playstation i would say but if you want to play it portably or something this is a very competent version of a fantastic game from platinum here we have the Ninja Gaiden Master Collection, another one of those like Play Asia import kind of games. Uh, I've never played the modern, modern, I mean, these are pretty old at this point, but I've never played these more modern Ninja Gaiden games. I feel like I would like these. I like Team Ninja. I like most of what they do, generally speaking. Um, and I know, I mean, Razor's Edge is a classic Wii U exclusive, so there's that. But um, yeah, I always was wanting them to port these games to Switch, and then eventually they did it. And I'm excited to check these out eventually. Here we have a Night in the Woods. This was one of those like indie darling games back, I think, in like 2018 or so. I've heard great things about this. I've heard it's like, I think this is a sad game, I think, right? This is one of those like really that hits you hard in your feels kind of games um, where you play as a cat who I think is depressed or something. But um, this one always looked cool to me. This one I definitely bought more as a novelty than anything. This is Night Trap, which is that classic FMV game. If you aren't familiar with it, I believe the former Nintendo of America president back in the day, like famously said that this game will never come to a Nintendo platform. Here it is. They did it. Knights of Azure 2, Bride of the New Moon. I always thought this looked like an interesting uh, kind of action RPG. Once again, another Koei Tecmo release. And then we have our four Nintendo Labo Toy-Con uh, game cartridges here. I never noticed they have like your name. You're supposed to write your name 
won the cover art. That's weird. But we have one through four. Four, of course, being the VR kit. Three is the uh, vehicle kit. Two is the robot kits. And one was the variety kits. I actually built all of these back in 2018 and 2019 as they came out. I really like Nintendo Labo. Like, I under I get the meme of, like, oh, $80 Nintendo Cardboard. But it was pretty fun. Like, especially the variety kits and the vehicle hit kit. Those two were really cool. But even the robot kit, like, building, like, the little pistons that make its... uh arms move and like in the backpack that you wear pretty cool the piano in the variety kit was a lot of fun to mess with and make the keys it's just like you know you're, the software itself isn't isn't the point the games are pretty shallow and i wish that wasn't the case right i wish these games were more fun had more replay value but you're paying for the experience of building the cardboard and then once the cardboard is built you're probably not going to play with these that much. I do have, I'm not going to show them in this video, I do have um, a second set of these because back when they were clearancing them out, they were like 10, 20 bucks a pop. So I have them sealed in the uh, the big boxes so I can build them if I ever want to again in the future, uh, which I thought, you know, that maybe a little nest egg kind of thing there. But yeah, Nintendo Labo, you know, for what it was, I actually really enjoyed it. And then we have Nintendo Switch Sports. Now, if you aren't a follower of my channel, this is my most played Nintendo Switch game. And you know what? I'm proud of it. I I have such a complicated relationship with this game right here. But at this point, I've embraced it. I am a Nintendo Switch Sports aficionado. I freaking love this game, dude. I had so much fun with it. I'm, an, I'm tired of acting like I didn't. So growing up, I played Wii Sports and, you know, I liked Wii Sports. And I played a little bit of Wii Sports Resort, but, you know, I never played it, like, that much. I think I didn't play it until I modded my Wii in, like, 2012. So I never got that game when it was, like, current. And then Wii Sports Club existed. And then I was like, oh, that'd be really cool if they brought back Switch Sports, or brought, brought back Wii Sports as a online Nintendo Switch game with multiplayer. And they finally did that, and they had these cosmetics that you get weekly. And something clicked in me in those first couple of weeks of this game coming out. I remember I streamed it, getting the cosmetics every week. Eventually, I developed a deep FOMO of not wanting to miss a single cosmetic in this game. So I played it every single week for a full year. They, they supported it weekly with new content for a full year. At launch, this game was bare bones. And a lot of the stuff that they offered as weekly cosmetics certainly should have been just in the base game. Like, I'm talking eye colors and hair colors. Like, that stuff shouldn't be something that is a weekly cosmetic hairstyles even, I don't think should be. It should only be costumes and, like, uh, you know, different types of equipment for the different sports, like uh, the badminton rackets and all that. But I had a lot, a lot of fun with this game. So the way I was playing this game at first was I would just play bowling while watching TV because it was pretty mindless. You can kind of bowl without really thinking and get a lot of points from bowling. So I pretty much spent maybe 120 hours playing bowling. But then right before content support for this game ended, they actually added gold cosmetics for each sport meaning i had to get i think it was a rank or maybe maybe it was s rank i think it might have just been s rank straight up you had to get s rank in each sport to get that gold cosmetic and i was like well i'm not gonna chicken out of getting every cosmetic in this game which made me really deeply learn and appreciate every sport um volleyball which you know at first i hated i ended up really enjoying even though you're so reliant on your teammate in that mode which is really dumb golf which i've never ever been good at a golf game i persevered and i ended up getting like you know like hole in ones uh, birdies that kind of thing i'm so glad they added those gold cosmetics at the end because it made me have a deeper appreciation and understanding of switch sports i really hope they come back with a sequel a switch sports resort that is even better because I, I see the complaints with this game i understand why people don't like it if you don't like it because of the sports mates i think that's kind of silly i think they are better than me's but uh, yeah, I, I definitely think there should be more content in the next one. Here we have No Man's Sky. This was a very late port to the Switch. Actually, it came out around the same time as Nier Automata. So this is one of those games I was talking about there. Uh, this is a, another pretty impressive port. Like, they were doing pretty good with third-party games that month on the Switch. Um, I mean, yeah, it came, what, eight years after No Man's Sky originally released? Or no, six years. I think it came out in 2016. So yeah, six years after No Man's Sky originally came out on the PS4. And, you know... We waited and we got a better version because No Man's Sky was uh, not complete when it released, but they've added so much. Hello Games has done a lot to make this game what they advertised back in 2015 and 2016. And this is a pretty competent port on the Switch, has that full multiplayer, has a ton of all the different like modes and like the base building. And then you can do, I mean, it has everything, all right? I think they've continued to update this version of the game with the others, I believe. Um, but even still, like, I mean, this was this was a really good port of this game, in my opinion.
Here we have some No More Heroes games. So we have No More Heroes 1. I believe this is the Best Buy variant. No More Heroes 2, another Best Buy variant. No More Heroes 3. And then Travis Strikes Again, No More Heroes. Now, the only two I've played are No More Heroes and Travis Strikes Again. Travis Strikes Again was my first No More Heroes game. Probably not the best place to start because I don't think this game is all that great, honestly. I kind of have like a, another, you know, another kind of switch sports situation here. I kind of have a, a deeper appreciation of this game that I've gone back and played through an actual No More Heroes game. Like I, I get what uh, Suda51 was going for with this, but I think if it had released after No More Heroes 3, maybe that would have been received a little bit better. But yeah, No More Heroes I played for the first time when it came to Switch, and I freaking, I love this game. I still haven't played 2 or 3, um, and I've heard those are, you know, maybe hit or miss kind of maybe not better necessarily, maybe not worse necessarily than the first game, but I really like No More Heroes. I love the characters. I love the world and the gameplay. So I'm really excited to eventually get to two and then three. Three had some incredible trailers. I remember that Game Awards 2019 trailer for this game where it's like animated and I I got really excited because I thought they were, Nintendo was announcing some crazy new like alien IP, but then it was just No More Heroes, which is really cool. Like it's a great trailer for this game, but um. Yeah, I think about that trailer pretty often. They had they did they they cooked when, with that animation. Octopath Traveler. Now this is one I played the prologue demo for back when that came out. I think in 2017. So that's pretty much my the extent of my experience with Octopath. I've loaded it up a couple times. I think I started with um, what's his name, Albrick, and then in the prologue demo I played as uh, Primrose. I believe her name is. I really liked what I played of it, but. I do not love the structure, and maybe this is just me not playing it long enough to really get invested, but, like, I don't like how you don't have all the characters at once. I think you maybe can at the end or something, but I was expecting when they announced this game that, like, you would probably start with one of them, and then over your journey, you would get all of them, and then it would be, like, one story, but they kind of ask you to play through the game from different perspectives, and I don't... I don't personally love that idea. I mean, I, I respect, you know, that it's still a cool concept and I I, you know, I know a lot of people love it, but I was hoping that, you know, you start with, let's uh, say Primrose and then you pick up all the characters and that that is the story of the game. Um, I don't like when you have to do like different routes and stuff. Um, that's my understanding of the game anyway. I, I might be misunderstanding how Octopath works, but um, I would like to go back to it and play it eventually. I don't have Octopath 2, but I've heard that is even better. Here we have Odd Worlds Stranger's Wrath HD. This is the original Xbox game that came over to the Switch. I am not a fan of Oddworld. I tried playing New and Tasty back on the PS4. I think it was a PS Plus game, but this is like an FPS game. So I feel like if I were to ever enjoy any Oddworld game, it would be this one. This was like five bucks on GameStop's website, but in 2020, not only did Sega release Mario and Sonic at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, they also just released Tokyo 2020 Olympics with no, with no branding. They also did Sonic at the Tokyo Olympics on mobile, I believe. So they went crazy that year with the Olympics license. But yeah, this is just a Olympics game without the uh, the mascot characters. Although I guess is that like the Olympics mascot? I've never seen that before. Uh, yeah, this is. I don't know why they thought they needed to do this. They already had Mario and Sonic. People are just gonna buy that instead. Omori is a game I have always been super intrigued by. I love the art style. Omori is a game that I always thought looked cool. I know it's a super sad game once again. So this is something I'll be checking out eventually. I wanted to pick up the physical because I think it was getting pretty pricey there for a little bit. Oni Naki from Square Enix, another one of those no ESRB releases. Super happy this got a physical. They just recently dissolved Tokyo RPG Factory into just Square Enix as a whole, I believe. So I wouldn't expect any other Tokyo RPG games in the uh, in the near future, which is kind of sad because I think these games are really cool. I thought I had Lost Fear, maybe it got misplaced. Um, and then I Am Setsuna has a Japanese release, but Oni Naki is more of just like an action RPG. There's no like turn-based elements. Maybe not the most like crazy story or in-depth gameplay. Maybe I think I think the common word going around when this game came out was shallow. But I don't know. I played it back when it came out. I really enjoyed it. Pretty simple game. Not the longest game at all either. Really cool art style. I I like this game a lot. And Lost Fear I also enjoyed. So kind of sad to see Tokyo RPG Factory go. But still happy that this game got a physical release. Another Wario 64 cheap Amazon banger right here. The Opus Collection. Don't have much to say on this one. And actually, it's two back-to-back -back because we have Our World is Ended Here, which is just one of those visual novels from our good friends over at P-Cube. Overcooked 2. Now, I think there is an all-you-can-eat edition on Switch that has the first two games and, uh, you know, more, more content. So I want to get that eventually. Overcooked is so much fun. I've only played a little bit of two, but me and my friend Platinums, or we got all the trophies in the first game. I don't think there was a Platinum on PS4, and that was just so much fun mastering every level. Such a hectic game. 
Um, I can't even imagine playing it with more than two people. Like, I, that's how we were playing it, right? We played it with two people. I cannot imagine playing this game with four players because it would just be so hectic. But Overcooked, I I don't like what this game did <laughs> for the uh, the indie multiplayer scene because I feel like every game since has been trying to replicate what Overcooked is. If there's that game moving out where you're, like, moving, but it's just Overcooked, but it's not made by the, the Overcooked devs, I don't think. I don't know, it kind of feels cheap, but Overcooked started it, so they get a pass, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. Here we have A Waste of Plastic, the full game download for Overwatch Legendary Edition. I already used that code back in 2019. Overwatch on Switch, I'm not sure how it is now with Overwatch 2, but Overwatch 1, I, I played a lot of on Switch. I played a lot of Overwatch on PS4 as well, but um, having a, a, play, a playable version of Overwatch I could play while laying down in bed was awesome. This was the last time I really put a lot of time into Overwatch. I played as Sigma, who was the new hero at the time, um, and I haven't really played since. You know, I never played as Echo, and then I really haven't played anything from Overwatch 2, um, which I know they've added a lot of cool stuff, but they've also done a lot of stupid stuff. My friend just sent me, he plays Overwatch 2 still. They, he just sent me this thing of, like, they, they made the hitboxes, like, really bad on purpose, so you don't have to aim anymore. Not too sure what Blizzard is doing with Overwatch these days, not not for me, but I did really love Overwatch when it was in its peak and its heyday, which I would say was from 2016 to 2019. Owlboy, this is a really cool indie game that took like 11 years or something to make. Like this game was in development for a really long time, has beautiful pixel art, really cool gameplay. Definitely recommend this one. Pac-Man World Repack, this is one I was really excited for when it was announced in 2022 in that June partner showcase because growing up I remember seeing all the Pac-Man World games on GameCube and PS2 at GameStop as a kid and I, I remember just really wanting to play them so that never happened but then they remade it and I was like oh I'll finally get it on Switch it's fine it's nothing special I think it's one of those things like Battle for Bikini Bottom where if you don't play it as a kid maybe you won't appreciate it that much as an adult it's a fine game I, I wish I had played it as a kid though so I could have been more excited for this remake and probably appreciated it even more Panzer Dragoon here from Forever Entertainment, another one of those like Sega IP, I believe that uh, Forever Entertainment did have the reverse or alternate cover, I should say, with some cards in here from Limited Run. Uh, Panzer Dragoon's fine. I like on rail shooters, you know, Kid Icarus Uprising is the, the obvious one, but also like Sin and Punishment Star Successor. Panzer Dragoon is not as good as either of those games, but it's still a fun game. Paper Mario the Origami King. Now, unfortunately, this is another one of those first-party Nintendo games that are on the backlog of shame. There are very few on Switch that I haven't beaten, but this is one of them. I played it for a couple hours. You know, the writing, the world, all that, all of that stuff is great. Intelligent Systems doesn't really miss, in my opinion, when it comes to that, uh, which I know is like a hot take because I, I, I'm saying, I'm saying Color Splash is a good game. That's what I'm saying here, um, but. Origami King's battle system, not a fan of that. Really did not like what I played of uh, the battle system in this game. I think Color Splash and Sigur Star are more fun than this game. But still, I need to go back to it and finish it eventually. I was playing through the games in order, and by that I mean I played Paper Mario 64 for the first time like two years ago, and I was going to get ready to play Thousand Year Door, but then they announced that remake, so I guess I had a little interstitial break with Mario RPG. So I guess it, I guess it worked out, but going to play through Thousand Year Door this year, going to play through Super Paper Mario again, haven't played it since I was a kid, Sticker Star, Color Splash, and then eventually I will get to this and just play through all of them in order. This is a really fun one, Penny Punching a Princess. This is one of the first NIS America games I played on Switch back in the day. Just a little beat-em-up game where you run around brawl and foes and money falls out of them you're just going for you're going for money you, she just wants money that's all she wants i like this one a lot persona 5 royal I actually have a sealed copy of the steelbook edition but also just a regular copy of this game once again that october 2022 time frame just a fantastic port on the switch i think they did a great job i mean it'd be kind of hard to mess this up persona 5 is a ps3 game people seem to forget that but um yeah they did a great job with this persona 5 you know, I, I voiced my my disdain for Three Houses and its social stuff and, like, the monastery and running around doing, like, the, the learning and all that. Um, so, I guess I'm not the biggest Persona fan. You know, I haven't finished Persona 5, but when you're actually in the dungeons and you're, you're doing the turn-based combat, it's fantastic. Like, I love it, but when you're doing, like, the school life stuff, that's, that's where you kind of lose me. So, maybe I need to give it another shot. I've played it. I think I probably put 20 hours into this um, or so. It's definitely a game that I want to finish, even if I end up not like loving it all the way through. I want to, you know, be able to say I finished Persona 5 Royal, the most popular Persona game, but uh, it'll probably be a while before that happens. Here we have the Pikmin series, so Pikmin 1 and 2 HD, or I guess they didn't actually call it HD, it's just Pikmin 1 plus 2, Pikmin 3 Deluxe, and Pikmin 4. All of these games, absolute bangers, except for this one. 
Pikmin 1 didn't really age that well, in my opinion. I, I beat it for the first time last year before this came out. I played it on Wii. But I had played it growing up. I just kind of sucked at it. I sucked at time management, so never finished it back in the day. But I uh, finished it last year for the first time, as well as 2 for the first time, even though I played, once again, both of them growing up. And 2, I think, is a vastly, vastly superior game than Pikmin 1. These ports on Switch are kind of unfortunate because they had to remove the uh, like the fun branding that they had into, like the Duracell batteries and stuff. So that's unfortunate, but I guess it makes sense. Pikmin 3, another fantastic one from the Wii U. This might be another case, like New Soup U, where maybe the Wii U version is definitive. Uh, this one did have some new content, I believe, like a little side story. I don't think I ever played that. But um, hey, Pikmin 3 is... If you like Pikmin 1 gameplay, Pikmin 3 is the ultimate version of that. If you like Pikmin 2 gameplay with the caves and stuff, Pikmin 4 is the ultimate version of that. And I do think Pikmin 4 is the best Pikmin game. Um, this game completely blew me away. Like, I didn't think it would be as good as it was, but they exceeded every expectation. I love this game. It looks beautiful. Really love the gameplay. I like the more casual approach to Pikmin style gameplay where you kind of can just take your time for the most part. You know, they still have some timed elements, but for the most part, you can kind of just sit back and relax and play Pikmin 4. And I really love this game. And if you don't like it, all I can say is Dandori issue. There it is. P.O. Fior, Faded Memories. I know you're all waiting for my thoughts on this one. Another one of those Axis visual novels that I bought because it was cheap. Pixar, now this is more my speed, you know. I have Ark on Switch, which didn't run well at all. It was a very bad port. But Pixar, man, I love, I like me a basic looking visual survival game like Minecraft, like Lego Fortnite, like Lego Worlds, even though Lego Worlds isn't very good. Pixar is just another one of those, except you can ride dinosaurs. I like it. Pocky and Rocky Retry. Now, this one was so cool to see Natsume bring back because it's one of like the most expensive SNES games, I believe. So seeing this get a modern port to consoles or really, I guess it's a remake, right? Uh, seeing this come back was super cool. And with that, we are finally in the Pokemon zone. So Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. I have a complicated relationship with this game as well. When it first came out, I was so negative on it. You know, I'm recording this actually, funnily enough, before Pokemon Day and... Despite how negative I was on this game when it came out, I am begging and pleading that tomorrow's black and white remake ends up being this. This will age poorly because it's going to go up after, but I'm really hoping the black and white remake looks more like this than Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl because I don't like those games as we'll talk about. But let's go Pikachu and Eevee. Now that we have Sword and Shield, now that we have more Pokemon games on Switch, I can look back and I think, you know, this is probably the best looking Pokemon game on Switch in my opinion. I think these games have a really nice art style. And while I didn't like the uh, the catchy mechanics they added from Pokemon Go, you know, I think it's really dumb that you can play in handheld mode and use buttons to throw the Pokeball, but you can't use a pro controller. Like, stuff like that is just really irritating. But if you want a more modern way to play through the original Pokemon games, these are pretty good. Pokemon Sword and Shield, these came out back in 2019, and once again, kind of complicated feelings. You know, I think this game, it kind of feels like a stopgap between what we had on 3DS with Sun and Moon and then Scarlet and Violet, which... Scarlet and Violet in of itself also kind of feels like a stopgap for what we might get in the future, but Sword and Shield really does because of the raids and the wild area. Like, the wild area was just a beta test. We were beta testing with the wild area, but the raids were really cool. I think that is one of the best things they've added to the Pokemon franchise since PSS back on X and Y, so raids are awesome. But the story here isn't that great. You know, I can't off the top of my head think of any, like, banger Pokemon designs from Sword and Shield. The region itself, Galar, like, I think there, there are moments in this game that look really good for a Pokemon. Pokemon game when you're just on like the individual routes but then you go to the wild area and it just looks like an absolute mess Pokemon just pop out of nowhere like uh, Sword and Shield are good I, I know there was a really big competitive resurgence with this game and I believe that but Dynamaxing and Gigantamax as a casual player I didn't really think was that interesting they're fine games but of course no Pokemon Switch collection is complete without the Pokemon Sword plus Pokemon Sword expansion pass and the Pokemon Shield plus Pokemon Shield expansion pass versions. Yeah, they just released these with all the DLC on the cartridge with uh, different inside arts of the uh, the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra. Only played through the Isle of Armor on these. I never played through the Crown Tundra, which I heard was a much better DLC, but um that's the issue with DLC and Pokemon games for me. By the time that the DLC comes out, I kind of like I'm already checked out a little bit, you know, I'm not going to go back and remember my team comp and all that for the single player, so it's hard to make myself go back to these, as we'll see with uh, Scarlet and Violet. Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, these are the only Pokemon games I could not force myself to finish. I I love Pokemon. I would say it's my favorite franchise overall. I, like, I, I love Pokemon. I've played every single Pokemon game 
to completion multiple times, like all of them. These are the only games I just, I couldn't do it, man. I <laughs> maybe they patched it and fixed it some, but the game does not run very well. It looks very bad. They remade Diamond and Pearl, which already weren't my favorite Pokemon games. You know, they needed a remake Platinum because this game has all the slowdown and stuff from Diamond and Pearl. Like. I really don't like these remakes, and I don't necessarily know if I should blame Ilka. This was the first time that the Pokemon Company and Game Freak let another developer handle a mainline Pokemon game, and I don't know if it's their fault. I don't know if it's their fault or if Game Freak and Pokemon Company, once again, like, maybe they get, put them, like, on some weird constraints. I'm not too sure. But as I'm recording this before Pokemon Day 2024, all I can say is, if Ilka is making black and white remakes, which are my favorite Pokemon games... I just hope they had enough time to do it justice. But it's okay because two months later we got the best Pokemon game on Switch, Pokemon Legends Arceus. This is far and away my favorite Pokemon game we have gotten since X and Y. I think Legends Arceus is a fantastic step in the right direction for the Pokemon franchise as a single player casual Pokemon fan. Not casual Pokemon fan, but like I don't do competitive battling. If you do like competitive online battling and stuff and like trading, then yeah, maybe Legends Arceus isn't what you want from Pokemon. But for me, as someone who just wants a really strong single-player adventure, Pokemon Legends Arceus pretty much hit every single box. You added side quests, you added um, a much more fun incentive to catch Pokemon, you added a more fun way to catch Pokemon. It's all way more seamless, like the battle transitions, the catching transitions. Like, this game is so freaking good. Like, it's one of my favorite Switch games. Pokemon Legends Arceus is fantastic. Even despite the performance issues and the fact that the game is kind of ugly, although I would say it's, it looks better than Scarlet and Violet and Sword and Shield, in my opinion. You know, despite all that, this is this is a really fun game. And then we have Scarlet and Violet, which are important to me because this was when my YouTube channel, like, really kind of took off, in a way. Scarlet and Violet did a lot for the growth of my YouTube channel, and I I don't think they're bad games. I think these are I think these are good Pokemon games. I'll say it but they're not finished they didn't finish the game it's <laughs> i understand like the you don't want to hear people complaining about the games you like and scarlet and violet are, are some of those games like if you don't have someone in your ear telling you how broken they are scarlet and violet are fun games but at a certain point i just couldn't handle it anymore and i had to stop playing like for me the post game of a pokemon game is shiny hunting and i don't think shiny hunting in this game is fun when the game is so broken that pokemon spawn literally two feet in front of you they don't make any kind of sparkle sound or anything like i don't think shiny hunting in this game is fun which is one of my favorite activities to do after i finish a pokemon story and just in general the technical issues with this game are unbelievable like it is unbelievable the state this game shifted in. it's also funny because I, I remember when i was uploading videos of this game before it even came out people were like just wait for the day one patch dude and i was like guys there isn't one. People just would not believe me. And then, of course, there was no day one patch that fixed all of these issues. And over a year later, they still have not fixed the issues with this game. But if you look past all of the performance stuff, I do think Scarlet and Violet is a, a good Pokemon game. I like the idea of having the, the three different like main stories that you do in this game. I like Area Zero. It's really cool. I think this generation had a lot of awesome Pokemon designs. I think this is the best set of box art legendaries we've had since X and Y. Like... They did a lot right with Scarlet and Violet. It was just all hindered by the performance, man. It's so sad. And of course, I also picked up the Pokemon Scarlet and Violet DLC versions here. What's annoying about these releases is it only has the first part of the DLC, so it doesn't have the Indigo Disc. I can't remember what the first part is called. The Teal Mask. It has the Teal Mask on the cartridge, but uh, you have to download to get the Indigo Disc. I've heard the Indigo Disc is fantastic, but as I was saying with Sword and Shield, Pokemon DLC, kind of hard for me to get back into. I did try loading up the Teal Mask, and I was just flabbergasted at how bad the game ran. Like, I, I couldn't believe it when I loaded it back up, and I just I just had to turn it off. I, I, normally, performance and stuff doesn't bother me that much, but I think Scarlet and Violet are, like, unbelievably bad when it comes to performance, and I just, I couldn't do it. But we're not done talking about Pokemon just yet because we have some uh, spinoffs to go over. Pokemon Tournament Deluxe. I really like Pokemon. I played it a lot on Wii U. I played it even more on Switch. I actually completed all like the... They have like these bingo boards you have to complete or like challenge boards. Kind of like something that you would see in Smash Brothers. But I completed all of those. I don't think I got all the titles because there was a lot of like online ones where you have to play as a certain character for like a thousand matches. But uh, Pokemon Tournament Deluxe, I really like this game. I'm not great at fighting games, but... 
you know, seeing all my favorite Pokemon, or at least some of my favorite Pokemon, some weird choices in this game, like a Chandelure. I mean, I like Chandelure, but uh, seeing all the, all these Pokemon in like this more realistic a HD art style was really nice and refreshing in 2016, and I'm glad they brought it over to Switch, as I've been saying. I, I'm pretty much okay with every single Wii U game getting ported over at this point, so I'm glad this one did come over. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team Deluxe. Now, the only Mystery Dungeon game I've really played... I've, I've really played two, but I, the only one I finished is Gates to Infinity, and I love Gates to Infinity. I think that's a fantastic game with an awesome story. I played that when I was 12, though, and then I played Super Mystery Dungeon when I was 15 or 16, and I thought that game was also pretty good, but I, I never finished it. I tried playing this, and I don't know if I've just outgrown the Mystery Dungeon gameplay, but I was playing this game, man, and I was like, man, this is just kind of boring. I don't know. I, I really like the art style, like this storybook art style they went for with this remake of the original Mystery Dungeon games, but... I don't know if it's for me anymore. New Pokemon Snap, also kind of a disappointment for me. I know a lot of people love this game, so that might sound crazy, but uh, this game, you know, like the, the gameplay is great. It's a, it's a Pokemon Snap. It's another Pokemon Snap game. That's awesome. It looks beautiful. It's one of the best looking Switch games. They did this thing in the campaign where you have to replay areas over and over because I guess they were self-conscious about charging $60 for a game you can beat in a couple hours. Guys, I don't care. You're bogging down the experience by making me replay levels over again. Oh, it's nighttime now. Oh, it's daytime now. Oh, just play it again for the sake of playing it again. I get having some sort of replay value there is necessary, but new Pokemon Snap, I, uh, I think they just overcompensated when it came to padding it out. And then finally, for the Pokemon collection, we have Detective Pikachu Returns. Uh, I've tried to play the first one on 3DS a couple times, and every time I play it, it's just a snooze fest. I don't know if I'll ever get to this one, but... Uh... It, it, it is certainly one of the games of all time, isn't it? Here we have a Postal Redux. I believe this was a, a limited run blind box kind of game, so not much to say on it. Postal is an interesting franchise. Uh, I know like the more modern ones, those were like the, the PC only, adult only games where you can pee. There's a button that makes you pee in the game. I don't think this is one of those, those types of games though. Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. This one just came out back in January and I played maybe eight hours of it. I didn't finish it. I kind of fell off of it. It's really good, but I don't think it's quite as good as people were saying. Like, I don't think this is a Game of the Year nominee by any stretch of the imagination. It It's clear the inspiration they took from Mercury Steam specifically when designing this game in terms of, like, the speed and the movement of your character from, you know, Metroid Dread. It's, it's clear what they, they took from Metroid Dread here, Mercury Steam's Metroidvania design. They do some cool stuff with the map where you can, like, remember locations to come back to. Um... But I don't really think exploring this game is all that fun, and I especially don't think the combat is all that fun. What I do think is fantastic in this game is the puzzles and the platforming and like the, the obstacle challenges that you do in this game. That is some top-tier level design stuff in Prince of Persia of the Lost Crown. But when I'm fighting enemies, I'm just kind of like, eh. I mean, it's fun, I guess, but I don't know. I, I really like the platforming and stuff. I, I hope if they ever do another one, which they probably won't because this game didn't sell very well, I hope they focus more on that in the sequel. But um, either way, it's 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 a good game. It's definitely a good game, and I recommend it if you like Metroidvanias. Most people have liked it more than I seem to like it, I think, so I'm probably just a weirdo here. Most people seem to think this is one of the best Metroidvanias ever, so if you would like Metroidvanias, definitely check it out. Another NIS America game here, Process of Elimination. I think this came out last year. I believe this is a tactics game from them, so pretty cool. Here we have Quake and Quake 2. As I was talking about earlier, I love Doom. Quake is essentially just Doom in a different in a different font. So I, of course, enjoy Quake as well. Rabbids Party of Legends. This game just kind of came out and no one talked about it. Ubisoft didn't promote it at all. I think it like came out in China at first or something, and then it eventually got localized like years later. Uh, I didn't hear anybody talk about this game, but it's another Rabbids Party game. Uh, Best Buy had it for like $8 during their buy to get one, so I got three copies of it. Two of them are in the closet, but uh, yeah, very, very cheap game. Rainbow Billy, The Curse of the Leviathan. This was a GameStop sale item from Skybound Games. Looks cute. Rayman Legends Definitive Edition. It was kind of weird when they were promoting this game as like one of the main Switch games of 2017. And it just kind of came out. Not really many people cared about it because it was an old game. But Rayman Legends is fantastic. I haven't finished it. I have played through Rayman Origins, though, on the Vita, and I love that game. So Rayman Legends is one of those things where, like, you know, I played around with it on Wii U when it came out there and just never finished it. I need to go back to this game, though, because I loved what I played. I just haven't haven't gotten around to uh, to finishing it up. But love the art style, love the gameplay. Fun, fun co-op gameplay, too. Um, yeah, Rayman Legends is fantastic. Here we have Real Mist from Limited Run. I've never played Mist. But they put it on Switch, so I had to buy it. Red Dead Redemption. This was a uh, peculiar one to see come over to the Switch last year because I don't think anybody really expected this to happen. 
Um, but it finally happened. Red Dead Redemption, I played it on a 360 back in the day, or, or sorry, on PS3, and I love Red Dead Redemption. I haven't played the sequel, but Red Dead Redemption 1 is a fantastic game. Um, I love the story, love the gameplay. I like this more than GTA. Like, from what I've played of GTA in my youth, GTA, San Andreas, and 4, as I mentioned earlier, like, Red Dead Redemption is much more fun, in my opinion. Um, I like the setting more, like, like the cowboy western uh, setting a lot more, actually. So, um, I need to get to playing through the second game eventually, but also I'd like to replay this game at some point because it has been so long and i never actually checked out undead nightmare either which is included in this switch version all right now we have some resident evil collections all of these are stupid because they have a game on cartridge and then you have to download the rest of the game so annoying i hate that they do that but we have the resident evil origins collection which is resident evil zero and one i love both of these games i think zero especially is actually underrated um i like resident evil remake one more of course but i think zero is an underrated game i, I played it a lot as a kid and and playing through it and finally finishing it a couple years ago, I think it holds up fantastically, almost just as well as the first game. Then we have the Resident Evil Triple Pack, which is 4, 5, and 6. Ironically, despite being, I would I would consider myself a pretty big Resident Evil fan. Like, I've played all the remakes, I've played 7 and 8, and I love all of those games, and, of course, 0 and 1. I have never finished 4, 5, or 6. I started 4, and I started 4 Remake, and I'm like, ah, I don't know. I kind of I kind of prefer the other styles of Resident Evil. I know once again just unpopular opinion bow today. But um yeah, I need to go back and play through these. I need to find someone to play. I think 5 5 is co-op obviously. And I think 6 also is, but 4 I need to just I need to get through 4. I'll probably never play the original. At this point I'll play the remake when I do eventually go through 4, but um cool to have these on Switch. I think 4 is the one on the cartridge here. Yeah, it says it down there in the bottom. And then finally the Resident Evil Revelations collection. I also love these games. Uh Resident Evil Revelations on 3DS I think is one of the best looking 3DS games. And having both of these on Switch with online multiplayer was super cool. This is my first time playing Revelations 2 and playing it online. Yeah, once again, just, just a lot of fun. I like Resident Evil Revelations. I like Resident Evil a lot as a whole. I just, uh, yeah, I have the insanely unpopular opinion that I don't love this, this trilogy right here. Well, I mean, these two, I don't think that's that unpopular to say. I don't like 5 and 6 that much from what I've played. I haven't played 6 at all, actually. I, I played a little bit of 5. It's fine. Uh, but 4, not my favorite. Here we have Return of the Obra Dinn. This game was really recommended to me quite a bit back in the day. Super cool art style, super cool uh, concepts. Definitely something I need to check out in the future. Rhapsody, Marl Kingdom Chronicles. I believe this was the first time these two games got localized. So uh, I have the Printing Presents collections. We'll show those when we show like the bigger box stuff. Uh, this is Rhapsody 2 and 3, I believe. And I started the first game through... Yeah, this, this is 2 and 3. I started the first game through the Pretty Presents collection, and I, I was really enjoying it, but it was just... It came out at a bad time for me, so I need to go back to that, but um, yeah, Rhapsody, it's cool to see this entire trilogy of games finally come over to modern platforms, get localized for the first time in some cases. Uh, really cool, really cool JRPGs. Here we have Rank Fit Adventure from Nintendo, of course. A pretty, pretty intensive game. Like, you know, I played Wii Fit growing up, but it's mostly just like fun mini games. This is like an actual workout. Like Wii Fit is mini games that you kind of work up a sweat because you're jumping and doing weird stuff. Rank Fit Adventure, like with the Rank Con, you are actually working out. So if you want a, a good workout game, this is actually a pretty, pretty intensive one. And it's a lot of fun. You can like all, do all the different parameters to like set how hard you want it to be from the start. I, uh, when I first started playing it, I like set it to the hardest difficulty and just right out the gate, just to defeat one baby enemy. They have you doing like 50 push ups. So, uh, yeah, this game is no joke. If you, uh, if you just go all in on it. Here we have Risen from THQ Nordic. Just another one of those like weird 360 games that came over to the Switch. I don't really know much about this. Uh, it kind of reminds me of Dragon's Dogma. I'm not sure how accurate that is. But uh, I believe this was GameStop exclusive, at least for a time. Not sure if that's true anymore. And here we have the River City Girls trilogy. Now, unfortunately, I am missing the first game. I had it back when it came out. I've got it at PAX West, I believe, and I sold it. Um, but I have River City Girls 2 and River City Girls 0. I talked about it earlier. I'm not a huge fan of beat-em-ups, but I think River City Girls is fun enough. I played through the first game and never played 0 or 2, though. But um, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's just more River City, but more modern. Way Forward makes it so inherently. I think anything Way Forward kind of touches ends up being at least a little bit better than some of the older counterparts, at least in my opinion. But uh, River City Girls, pretty cool. Then we had River City Saga Three Kingdoms. This one had like completely different gameplay, I believe. I, I remember watching the trailer for it back when it was announced and thinking it looked pretty cool, but haven't given this one a shot yet. Rogue Legacy, my beloved, haven't really played it much on Switch, but this was one of those like early PS Plus games that I just freaking fell in love with. This I think might have been the first roguelike game I ever played. I love Rogue Legacy. Haven't gotten a chance to try out the sequel, but Rogue Legacy 
one of the first roguelikes I really fell in love with, and I just, I really like this game a lot. Kind of has this whole thing with, like, your family history, so when you die, you inherit traits from your your ancestors, and it kind of just keeps going indefinitely, until eventually, you get lucky enough with your your birth your birthrights, basically, and um, you get a good run-in. Um, Rogue Legacy is a lot of fun. Rune Factory 4 Special, this is a weird one to see come over from the 3DS. They also recently did Rune Factory 3 from the DS. I remember when they announced this in the Direct, they're like, Rune Factory 4 is completely remastered on Switch, and it's just like, I don't know, man. <laughs> this game's kind of ugly. But I, I played Rune Factory 4 on 3DS. I enjoyed what I played of it. It's it's really the only Rune Factory experience I have, and um, this was like 10 bucks on Amazon, so I was like, yeah, I'll, if I ever want to play Rune Factory again, I'll probably start with this, because I remember playing it back in the day, um, and having it on Switch is cool, even if they didn't really touch up the visuals that much. Here we have Ruby Arrowfell. This is another one of those games from the Caleb buyout that I have been mentioning throughout this video. Uh, Ruby is something I have no knowledge of. <laughs> All I know is Rooster Teeth makes it. That's that's the only thing I know about Ruby. But this was made by WayForward. It looks kind of interesting. Saga Frontier Remastered. Saga is a Square Enix franchise that I just have no like knowledge of really. Like I'm pretty out of the out of my depth when it comes to Saga. There are a couple other games that have physical releases on Switch, like Romancing Saga Minstrel Song, and I think Romancing Saga 2 and 3 also as well have physical releases on the switch um, but i picked up this one this is a ps1 game they remastered you know i've i've mentioned you know mana i played through final fantasy adventure i played through some of the dragon quest spinoffs and stuff but i've never played a saga game so that's something i definitely want to do so i can kind of check off like hey at least i've played one of these games maybe i'll try out that new saga emerald beyond game coming out so i think i think that comes out in april maybe it looks pretty good Saints Row the Third, the full package. This is a weird release. I think it was exclusive to Volition's online store, but it's in this purple slipcover, which I think is just really weird. I saw it pop up on eBay, and I was like, oh, that's kind of weird, and I couldn't really find anything about it. It has exclusive box art here for this version of the game, and it even comes with, uh, I think one of them got lost, but it comes with little nubs for your, for your Joy-Con stick. Samba de Amigo Party Central. I thought this game was going to be so much fun, and then I played it, and I was like, wow, this is not fun at all. Maybe it'd be more fun on the Wii with the Wiimote and all that, but uh, Samba de Amigo, not for me, I guess. Save Me Mr. Taco. This is a really cute one. I only played a little bit of it, but basically you start out, you're doing like this octopus invasion, taking taking revenge on all the humans, but then he decides to save this, uh, this lady here. Um, really cute game. Has like a Game Boy art style, which, you know, some people would, you know, take it or leave it, I guess. But I think it's cool. I, I like when games go and really commit to an art style like that and a, a setting like that. And uh, it's a pretty fun little 2D platformer game. Sayonara Wild Hearts is kind of similar to the uh, the Disco Elysium game I showed earlier, where I've just had it recommended a ton over the years, but I don't really know much about it. I know there's like a lot of music and like uh, music vibes in this game, but that's really all I know, to be honest. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game complete edition from Limited Run. I'm so glad that this finally got ported to modern consoles so it could be preserved. It had been delisted from the Xbox Live Arcade years ago, but Limited Run did the work with Ubisoft and uh, the parent company, whoever owns uh, Universal. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, Universal. They had to work it out with Universal, but uh, seeing them work out the deal so that Scott Pilgrim could come back is super cool. This is one of the few beat-em-up games that I really love. I love Scott Pilgrim, the movie. I uh, haven't watched that new anime yet, but uh, this is a really fun beat-em-up game. We got the Scribblenauts Mega Pack here. Uh, I grew up playing Unlimited. I, I remember, like, I think I pirated Unlimited on my PC back in the day or something, like when I was like 12, when I first learned how to do anything on the internet. Um, and then, of course, I got it on Wii U later on when it came out there, or when I got my Wii U, I should say. And I like Scribblenauts. Scribblenauts is fun. Uh, I don't think I've really messed with DC Unmasked because I don't, I'm not really a DC guy. I like Marvel more than anything. And even that, I'm not like super like into anymore. But um, Scribblenauts, it's cool to see these games come over. There's also that Scribblenauts Showdown game, which looked really bad. Severed. Now, this is an awesome one from Drinkbox, the developers of Guacamelee, and they just recently did that game, Nobody Saves the World, which I also really enjoyed. This one was exclusive to the Vita for a very long time because it uses the touchscreen so heavily you're slashing enemies to uh, defeat them. And I believe, I think you have to play this game in handheld mode, it looks like. Yeah, on the back there. It does say Switch Pro Controller compatible, but then it shows no TV mode as an option, so I'm not too sure how the Switch version works, but Severed played it on Vita. Super cool game. Here we have the Shadow Run trilogy. These are like tactical RPGs, I believe. Kind of bought this on a whim. That was when I was really in my like, oh, all these old games coming over to Switch phase. I gotta get all these weird collections of old random stuff. So um but picked up a Shadow Run a trilogy because of that. Then we have a couple of Shantae games here. I do have more of these, which we'll get to when we get to the big box stuff. But we have Half Genie Hero Ultimate Edition as well as Shantae and the Seven Sirens. Uh Shantae is a series I 
I enjoy. Like, I've, I've played a little bit of every Shantae game, right? Like, I've played a Game Boy Color Shantae. I've played Risky's Revenge. I've played Half Genie Hero some. I don't think I've ever touched Seven Sirens, but Shantae is a series that I enjoy. I just need to actually sit down and play through them all to the end someday. We have some Shin Megami Tensei Love. We have an SMT3 Nocturne HD remaster, as well as SMT5. Uh, I played like 10 hours of Nocturne, and I kind of fell off of it. I feel bad about that because SMT4, I've said this before, is like one of my favorite 3DS games ever. Um, so I really wanted to actually sit through and play this game, but I kind of just fell off of it. Um, and then SMT5, I never even started, which I guess was kind of a blessing in disguise because it's getting essentially a new version with even more content on a platform that will probably run way better. So I will probably be playing this on PS5 when it does come out over there. But also, I might pick up Vengeance on Switch. Maybe if I see reviews and they're like, yeah, they fixed all the performance of the Switch version, maybe I'll get it on Switch, SMT5 Vengeance. But uh, yeah, SMT5 is a, uh, it looks it looks awesome, man. I'm so excited to finally play it. Hopefully, I actually do it this year. Shining Residence Refrain. I always thought this game looked pretty cool. Civilization 6. I bought this one for my girlfriend because she likes, you know, like these kinds of like town building games or like, you know, you know these kind of like tactical, uh, really in-depth games. She's, she's into these um She's had an issue playing it on Switch, though. You know, this is definitely like a PC type of game. So unfortunate that it doesn't work too well on the Switch. But it's cool that it came over at all, I guess. Skull Island Rise of Kong. I had to see what all the hype was about with this game. If you aren't aware, this is one of the worst review games of all time. Uh, some just incredible cutscenes in this game. I had to check it out. It, it is that bad. It, it really is. Snack World of the Dungeon Crawl Gold. I believe this was the first level 5 game to make its way over to the Switch, which I think is a... Uh, just a sign of where level five was back in like 2018, but this was a 3DS game that only came out in Japan and then they localized it for the Switch with this kind of remake or remaster. Um, I don't know. Level five just has a really cute art style. I, I like I like level five. They have they almost have like some Nintendo DNA, I feel like, in their design. Um, and this game always looked super cute. Sniper Elite 3 Ultimate Edition has all of the DLC included. I want to get two and four because those are also on Switch. Uh, Sniper Elite is a series I actually enjoy quite a bit. I've only played three. Uh, I remember when I built my first PC back in 2014, um, I think my graphics card came with Sniper Elite 3, and that's why I had it. But I remember thinking that game just looked absolutely freaking beautiful, man. Like, that was my graphical showcase for my new PC at the time, running a, uh, I think it was like a, maybe it was a 1060. I don't even think it would have been that, though. I'm not sure what my PC was running at the time. But uh, Sniper Elite is a fun series. This is the series known for, like, having the super close-up shots of, like, the sniper bullet going through and destroying their, their jaw and stuff. Uh, I like Sniper Elite. Snipper Clips Cut It Out Together Plus. This is one of the best Switch games. So sad that we never got more from this team with Nintendo's uh, kind of cooperation because I think this is one of the best, like, eShop games Nintendo has ever released. Of course, it later got a physical release with this DLC, but Snipper Clips is just a ton of fun single player, multiplayer, like no matter how you play it, I think this game is just an absolute gem, really cute art style, really great music, really great mechanics, really just a unique game. Like I can't really think of any other games that are like this. Um, sad that we didn't get more of it. We have some Sonic games. There'll be more of these later, I believe in the big box section, but Sonic Forces, I, I'm not a huge Sonic fan. That's no, that, that should be no surprise. I think Sonic Forces is like, I think it's fine. I don't think it's as bad as people say. I would say Sonic Forces is about equal to most Sonic games that I played. Colors is my favorite Sonic game. I played that back on the Wii as a kid, and I really liked that game. But I would say Sonic Forces is like equal to Lost World and Heroes and 06, obviously. I haven't really played Adventure, but Forces... I, I liked Forces more than what I played of Sonic Frontiers, I'll, I'll tell you that much. And then we have Sonic Mania, which was, I think, my breaking point when it came to Sonic, where I realized I don't like 2D Sonic. I, I respect this game so much. I love the art style, the music. I just don't like 2D Sonic gameplay. I have, I, have, I have accepted that. It's just not for me. Despite that, I mean, I had to buy Sonic Superstars. Haven't had a chance to try this one yet, but I kind of like the idea of a multiplayer Sonic game. I've heard from a couple of friends that this game is god-awful, but I'll reserve judgment. So I'm very stubborn. Like, I just said I, I've accepted that 2D Sonic isn't for me, but, like, I want to like Sonic, man. There's so many Sonic games. I want to be a huge Sonic head, but the games just aren't very good, in my opinion, and I keep trying. I'm very stubborn about it. Soldom Drop Connect Erase, this is one of those earlier Switch games that I, I think I got a code for maybe back on the eShop when it came out in 2017. Just a pretty basic kind of puzzle game, not quite unlike Puyo Puyo, I believe, um, but this is, a, this is a fun one for sure. Splatoon 2, this was a weird one for me because I think, I think if this had come out maybe 2019, I would have felt a little bit differently towards it. I was really excited when they announced this, though, because Splatoon was one of my favorite Wii U games, if not my favorite Wii U game. So to have a version of it on this new exciting Nintendo console was very, very exciting. 
and then I played it for like a month and then I just fell off of it and I never, I never went back. I played Octo Expansion, of course, which is fantastic, but Splatoon 2, I, I just think they should have taken a little bit more time. I think they were a little too eager to rush out a sequel, which I guess makes sense. It probably was the right decision, but I think the game itself kind of hurt because of that. You know, I think the maps in the first game were better. I think the kind of game flow was better in the first game. I don't, I'm not sure if that makes sense, um, but the single player in this game was pretty good. And then Octo Expansion, of course, was absolutely fantastic. Still the best DLC they've done. I just finished up Side Order, which we'll talk about in a second, but I think Octo Expansion is better. And then Splatoon 3 pretty much fixes all my issues I had with Splatoon 2. I mean, this, this is the best Splatoon game. I will always have that special fond spot in my heart for Splatoon 1, but Splatoon 3 mechanically and visually and just in terms of content is the best Splatoon game. There's no questioning it. Even though I think Octo Expansion is better than Side Order, Side Order offers something so unique to Splatoon that is just really cool. My only issue with this game, my only gripe is the way they wrote out content. I don't know why Nintendo thought it would be fun to like try out something new here where they, instead of doing like the weekly updates like they did for the first two games, they ended up pretty much only updating this game every like three months with new content, like substantial new content. They will they would add two maps at a time instead of doing like one map every three weeks or something. Like I I think the the content rollout for Splatoon three was an absolute disaster, um, which completely killed my momentum and interest in this game. I played it every day for like four months, and then I just I just stopped because there wasn't enough new content being added frequently for me. SpongeBob SquarePants Krusty Cookoff Extra Krusty Edition. This is what my girlfriend wanted. She loves mobile games, you know. Bless her heart. So had to get this. <laughs> this is a, this is just a SpongeBob mobile game that came to Switch for some reason. I I, I kind of I I'm kind of cool with that though. Like the fact that this got a physical release on Switch with no microtransactions, that's kind of cool, right? Star Ocean: The Second Story R. I am so mad at myself for not playing more of this game and not making the time for it last year because I started it. Probably played maybe five hours. This game is freaking beautiful. I think this looks better than the HD 2D games that Square Enix releases. It has like this, it's like 3D environments within 2D sprites. This game looks beautiful. The voice acting is incredible. The story is really engaging from what I played. The gameplay is really cool, although it was taking a little bit, uh, you know, of getting used to for me because it's like real time, but it's like encounters. It was weird. I, I need to learn the gameplay more. I've also started playing the first Departure, uh, the first Star Ocean game, which got remade. That's on the eShop. I started playing that, and this is just far and away such a better remake than that. I'll probably just go back to this and skip the first game, honestly. But yeah, Star Ocean Second Story R. I mean, this was, from what I, from what I played, and I don't want to, you know, rank it too heavily because I haven't finished it. This is one of the best JRPGs that released last year, and I think it's kind of a, a shame it wasn't nominated for anything at the Game Awards. At least I don't think it was. I, I might be wrong. Here we have a bunch of Star Wars games. I'm not like a huge Star Wars fan, I would say, but I enjoy Star Wars games. I, in fact, I think I like Star Wars games more than I like Star Wars itself. <laughs> and I think it's really cool how a lot of these older ones have gotten like standalone physical releases through limited run. So we have Star Wars Episode One Racer. We have Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy. This is the one I'm like the least familiar with. We have Star Wars Code War Two. The Sith Lords. We have Star Wars Republic Commando. Uh, my friend keeps telling me to play this game. I guess it's like a COD campaign, essentially. So this is definitely one I need to check out. And Star Wars The Force Unleashed, which is a lot of fun. This is a remake or port of the Wii game, though. It's not the 360 version, which is really weird. But um, either way, I'm really happy that they keep bringing these Star Wars games to Switch. And I am so, so excited for that Battlefront collection. I will be buying that day one to play online with friends because Battlefront is, is a banger. Starlink Battle for Atlas. This is that Ubisoft Toys the to Life game that they tried to release in 2018 with like that Star Fox content. I have the R Wing like set up on my shelf because it looks cool, but yeah, I don't know why Ubisoft thought it was a good idea to release a Toys to Life game in 2018. Like that was after everybody else had already dropped out. Disney Infinity was no more. Skylanders was no more. But here's Ubisoft coming along, like, oh, let's let's do another Toys to Life game. Like, no, Ubisoft. Sit down. Story of Seasons Friends of Mineral Town. This is a remake of the GBA game. I think it has the content from both Friends of Mineral Town and more Friends of Mineral Town. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I like Story of Seasons, or as it was back then, Harvest Moon. I'm waiting on Story of Seasons Magical Melody, though. That is what I need to see remade. Magical Melody was one of my favorite GameCube games as a kid, and I really hope they remake that one next. They already did A Wonderful Life. I don't have that one, but I'm hoping we get Magical Melody soon because that is... That is one of my favorite farming games of all time. A couple of Street Fighter releases here. We have the Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection as well as Ultra Street Fighter 2, the Final Challengers. It was always funny how they promoted and, you know, really pushed this version of Street Fighter 2 because it had evil, evil Ryu and Violent Ken. I can't believe they called it Violent Ken. And they had that, that weird first-person 3D Hadouken mode. 
That was really lame. And then, like, a year or two later, we got the 30th Anniversary Collection, which just has every version of Street Fighter 2, basically, I think. That was really dumb. Streets of Rage 4, I've heard, is a fantastic beat-em-up, like, one of the best, but I haven't gotten around to it. And here's the prized possession in my Switch collection. My two copies of Super Bomberman are... I bought these for a short. I don't know if I ever uploaded that short or anything. I might have recorded it. But um, essentially, when Bomberman R released, I guess Konami didn't get the memo about the spines on Switch games. As you can see, it's for the 33rd anniversary, which is a funny thing to try and celebrate. But uh, the spine on this game is absolutely disgusting but they reprinted it later on with the proper spine so i had to get both look at even the konami logo down here on this first print one what were they doing bro and here we have another block of a mario game super mario maker 2 uh really great game but similar to splatoon 3 i don't think they did the uh content rollout of this game too too well i feel like actually they should have learned their lesson from this with splatoon 3 but Mario Maker 1 was just a constant zeitgeist thing. Maybe it was just because the Wii U was failing, but there was always something to talk about. There was always a new me uh, costume or amiibo costume to go through and get. There was always new levels being added by Nintendo. And with Mario Maker 2, we only got a couple content updates spread out over the course of like 18 months. I don't know, man. It just didn't do it for me. I, maybe maybe it just comes down to the Wii U gamepad. Like, I didn't really enjoy making levels in this game with the Pro Controller. The Wii U gamepad was made for Mario Maker. Like, out of every Wii U game, Mario Maker, like, makes the most sense on that console. When you take away the Wii U gamepad, it's not as intuitive, in my opinion. Uh, and the, adding the 3D World game style, I feel like, was just kind of weird. Like, it felt like they needed to, like, check a box of something new to add to this game. It's cool they did it, but kind of weird i don't know it, it's still mario maker like you're gonna have fun with this game but i definitely had a more enjoyable experience with the first one but that's okay because then we get to some peak 2d mario fiction right here super mario bros wonder one of my favorite games of all time now this is the best 2d mario game by far in my opinion like i don't even really think it's close i'm a mario world kid i love mario world a lot more than three i know that's I'd say that's like a 50-50 opinion, right? People are always split on Mario World versus Mario 3. I love Mario World, though. And like I said earlier with New Soup U, I enjoy the uh, the New Soup series. But Mario Wonder is just such a breath of fresh air. So many fun and unique ideas crammed into every level. Every level of this game just feels like a, a trip, man. I think I might have said this in my review, but it feels like a 2D Mario game designed with the sensibilities of a 3D Mario game where everything has to be perfect. It feels like that. Like, that's how high quality this is. I think this could stand next to some of the 3D Marios in terms of creativity and level design and just mechanics. Like, this game is so freaking good. The online multiplayer was incredible in this game, too, as well. I know some people kind of slept on that. Maybe you didn't enjoy having the ghost running around, but I think that added such a nice sense of community when playing this game, playing, like, the little hide-and-seek levels where you have to, like, figure out where all the uh, the keys are. Mario Wonder, an absolute goaded game. I hope we don't have to wait until, you know... 10 years past to get a sequel this time, but I don't think we will. Then we have Super Mario 3D All-Stars. I know this collection got a lot of hate, but I'm fine with it. Nintendo's dumb. Like, let's let's be clear here. Nintendo is very dumb for delisting it. There's no question about that. But in terms of the collection itself, like, people were really hyping themselves up over the idea of, like, oh, they're going to remake all of these classic 3D Mario games when it was rumored. Like, people were saying it was going to be, like, a full remake of 64, a full remake of Sunshine, but it is just these kind of up res versions in this collection, and I'm fine with that. Just having a modern way to play all of these incredible games is more than I really could ask for. Like, I don't... I don't really know if I want them to remake Mario 64, you know? That game's jank is part of it now. Same thing with Mario Sunshine. Mario Sunshine is probably my least favorite 3D Mario game, but that game's jank is part of it. You can't really fix that without taking part of what Sunshine is away. And then Galaxy's Galaxy. I mean, you don't really need to do anything to Galaxy. That game's already perfect. I don't know. As a fan of 3D Mario, I was just more so excited to have these games finally playable on the Switch. Mario 64 is my favorite of the three, but even Sunshine, which I just said I don't really like that much compared to the other ones, having this playable on modern hardware was so freaking nice. And then we also got Mario 3D World, which in my opinion is, you know, 3D World, kind of like New Soup U, 3D World wasn't the game the, the Wii U needed, right? It was not the game that the Wii U needed in 2013. The Wii U needed Mario Odyssey. But in the context of having Mario Odyssey, which we'll talk about next, having Mario Odyssey out and then getting 3D World later, they sped up the gameplay. They added this awesome Bowser's Fury kind of expansion side game. This is a fantastic 3D Mario game. I've always said it kind of feels like a new Super Mario Bros. game, but in 3D, which I still think holds true. You know, you're going for the goalposts, you're going for the flag, and the level design is a little bit more basic, 
but it's just a really fun game, even playing a four-player co-op, which is really hectic. 3D World is fantastic, and then Bowser's Fury is even better. I, I hope the next 3D Mario game, I don't want to say I hope it's just similar to Bowser's Fury, but I have a feeling Bowser's Fury was kind of a test bed for making something of an open-world 3D Mario game, which I could not be more excited for. And then, yeah, Mario Odyssey doesn't really need much of an introduction. This game is freaking incredible. Mario 64 will always be my favorite just because of nostalgia, but I, if I had to pick, like, a second favorite, I think Odyssey... I think Odyssey is the best 3D Mario game. This game feels incredible to play. Just moving around as Mario in a 3D environment in Mario Odyssey feels better in this game than it does in any other 3D Mario game, and that is what you need when you're talking about a 3D platformer. The worlds, the level design, the moons I really liked in this game, even though some of them are kind of silly, like it's just like walk over here and grab it. I like that. And 100%ing it was a lot of fun. I even 100%ed Balloon World. Like, I grinded out Balloon World when they added that as a free update. Mario Odyssey, an all-timer. Love this game. Then we have a pair of Mario Party games here. Super Mario Party, which launched back in 2018, as well as Mario Party Superstars. I actually like both games. Mario Party Superstars is is better, right? Because it has all the classic mini games. But I do think Super Mario Party gets a little bit too much hate. I think this is still a fantastic Mario Party game. Um, if you want something a little bit different, you know, it uses the Joy-Con in more unique ways, go for this one. But Mario Party Superstars, I mean, it's undeniable. It has the old boards. It has all the old mini games. It's nice to have two different flavors of Mario Party on the Switch, in my opinion. And for Indie Cube, before making this, to make Super Mario Party and kind of have a, a little bit of a return of form for the franchise was just really nice to see after Mario Party. 9 and 10 and all of those Mario Party games on the 3DS like Mario Party was kind of not great there for like a full decade but with Super Mario Party that felt like the true revival of the franchise and then we later got Mario Party Superstars which was also just fantastic I love both these games Super Mario RPG now this this is a great game listen I'll be honest for a long time there I was a a not not a sticker star defender but like a defender of like the more modern Paper Marios in general because I, I didn't fully get it. I was like, these games are fine. Like, I don't know. I, I didn't really see that much of an issue with them. But after playing Paper Mario 64 and after playing Mario RPG, and, you know, I played Thousand Needle as a kid, but I guess I'd just forgotten a lot of what made that game so special. Um, after playing 64 and after playing Mario RPG, I, I get it now. Uh, I do think Geno is overrated. Mallow... Mallow is the GOAT, but this game's a lot of fun. Pretty basic RPG mechanics, but really fun writing and really cool art style as well. Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz HD. It was kind of weird to see Sega remake the one that people don't like first, right? This is the Wii one that people specifically didn't like. So they remade this first, and then they did Banana Mania later, which I have like the, the bigger version of. Kind of weird to see them do this one first, though. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, a game that needs no introduction like Odyssey. I mean, this is one of the best Switch games. It is the best Smash Bros. game. I don't want to hear no arguments. Oh, Brawl's better. Oh, Melee's better. No. No, this is the best Smash Bros. game. World of Light maybe is a little weak, I guess. And I, I you know, I, I like having spirits because it just allowed them to add a ludicrous amount of, of crossover content. But trophies I do prefer. But the core gameplay of Smash Bros. Ultimate is so good and so refined. The DLC characters that we got, while I don't really care about some of them, like Terry from Fatal Fury, we got Banjo-Kazooie in this game, man. We got Sora. We got Pyra and Mithra. Like, there are so many awesome DLC characters in this game. Even the newcomers in the base game, Inkling, Simon Belmont. Like, this game, this is just a fantastic Smash Bros. game all around. Super Epic The Entertainment War. This was a uh, a limited run blind box game, so not something I would ever buy. Some furry game, I don't know. Sushi Striker The Way of Sushido. This is that weird first party Nintendo game that was on the 3DS, and then before it came out, they actually said, "Hey, it's actually coming to Switch too." It's a uh, it's a pretty fun puzzle game. You just like link the tiles of sushi to uh, throw the plates back at the enemy. Way too long though. Like this game should have been an eShop game in my opinion, like 20 bucks maybe, and it lasts like five hours. But instead, they tried to make the super long sushi puzzle game, and I don't think it really worked out in the end. I wish they had just made a shorter, smaller eShop experience. But um, it's a fun game. I like the puzzle mechanics. I, I would say played on 3DS, though, with the touchscreen over there. I think that makes a little bit more sense for this kind of game. Sword Art Online Fatal Bullet Complete Edition. I've always been very intrigued by the SAO games. I, you know, I haven't watched SAO since I was very young when Season 1 came out and was new and hype and everybody was talking about it. And I enjoyed Season 1 for what it was. I started Season 2 and I was like, oh, this is, 
this is like some weird, weird, I don't know, I, I don't know if I like Sword Online anymore, man, but, um, the games I always thought looked kind of fun, even if they are more budget, as we've discussed in this video, like, I kind of like the, the 7 out of 10, the 6 out of 10 anime game, and, um, I always thought the Sword Art Online games look kind of cool, so I picked up a Fatal Bullet here, haven't got a chance to play it yet, but, uh, I think it was Hollow, like, Reincarnation, there was, there was a Vita game that I thought looked so much fun, and then I, I saw the reviews and it was like not very good apparently, but I still want to give these a shot someday. Taiko no Tasujin Rhythm Festival. Whenever I'm at an arcade, I always like to play on the Taiko machine. A lot of fun, really fun rhythm game. Uh, this one has like a subscription service and a ton of paid DLC. I did like a free trial of the subscription service because there is so much crossover songs in this game from like other game franchises, Nintendo franchises, but also anime. Like they got the Dragon Ball Super theme in here, which is really cool. Taito Milestones. So I think they just released Taito Milestones 2, which from what I've heard has a better selection of games, but just another one of these like arcade collection compilation kind of games. But this one has a lot of stuff that like I'm sure most of us haven't really played or at least, at least I haven't played. Like I've played Kicks, but I haven't played Space Seeker or Alpine Ski or the Fairyland Story on here before so uh, definitely a more intriguing collection in terms of like at least for me lesser known games tactics ogre reborn another one of those games from 2022 when square enix was just pushing it all out at once for some reason this is a remake of the original tactics ogre from the ps1 although it might be more based off the psp version i believe uh, but tactics ogre really cool glad this came back hope we get a new one someday tales of symphonia remastered i was really excited for this one when it was announced because I had always wanted to play Tales of. I had played Tales of the Abyss on the 3DS a little bit back when it came out in like 2012. So Symphonia I'd always heard about because people always talk about Lloyd and Smash. And I picked this up, played it for a little bit. Not not a great uh, remaster. There's a lot of issues with this. I think they might have fixed some of them by now. But yeah, there was a lot of issues with this remaster when it first came out. Like weird flickering in the textures. Um, just a lot of stuff they could have done to improve what is, I think, considered probably the, the most popular Tales of game, or at least, like, the most iconic one, or at least one of the most iconic ones. They should have done more, more justice to this game, for sure. We got a couple of Ninja Turtles games here. So we have Shredder's Revenge, which is the new one from uh, Dotamu or .mu. Always wanted to check out this one because Dotamu, I don't have it physically, but they did the Wonder Boy Dragon's Trap remake, which was just fantastic. I believe they're the ones that did it. Um, but, yeah, really cool. Uh, that this is a modern beat -em up TMNT game. I think that's awesome. And then the Cowabunga Collection, which also came out around the same time, just has a bunch of the classic games, which is, um, once again, just collections, man. I love collections. I go crazy for this stuff. And speaking of collections, Telenet Shooting Collection, don't know much about these games from Edia, but just a bunch of, like, anime-themed shmup games. Granada, Avenger, Psychic Storm. Love the art style here. Temtem, this was a big deal when it came out back in, like, 20... I don't know, 2018, it was finally delivering on that pokey MMO dream that we all had as a kid, and then it came out, and it, I don't know, it, it, it's fine. Petrus at 99, I think it's awesome that this game got a physical release, it included a code for Switch Online, you can try that out if you want, I don't think I ever used it, but uh, yeah, I bought this used one on eBay, this is the one that came with Bindi and the Ink Machine, I believe, as well as Snipper Clips, I, I think was the lot I bought, uh, but yeah, super cool to have this as a physical release on the Switch, I hope we get Alpha Zero 99 eventually as a, uh, as a physical version, but Tetris 99 is a ton of fun, Battle Royale Tetris, I mean, Nintendo, like, low-key got on the Battle Royale train pretty early on, like, that was still, like, I mean, that was around the time that Apex Legends came out, so that was pretty early for the, for Nintendo to react to such a modern trend in such a unique way, and Tetris is a perfect fit for it. Another absolutely incredible Tetris game here, Tetris Effect Connected. This is the best version of Tetris. The music from Enhance is so good. If you've played Res Infinite, similar vibes, um... This game looks beautiful on an OLED display. I cannot recommend it enough. Definitely play with headphones on. Thea the Awakening. This is another kind of kind of Civ-like game, I believe. But this was from a limited run blind box. I wouldn't have bought it otherwise. Another GameStop clearance game here. Time Management Game Collection. Yeah, it was, it was $5. I was like, eh, yeah, why not? But looks like a bunch of mobile games ported to the Switch. Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE Encore. I think next to Origami King, this is probably my other shame when it comes to games I never finished on the Nintendo Switch, because I just never finished Tokyo Mirage Sessions. I've played like maybe 15, 20 hours of it, and I really liked what I played. I just kind of fell off of it at some point for some reason or another, but I enjoyed what I played a bit. Need to get back to it. Love the art style. Love the, uh, you know, I, I'm not like, a, I'm not a big fan of like idols or anything, but uh, I like the vibes of this game for sure. 
Token Rambu Warriors. I do not know what Token Rambu is, but this is essentially like Husbando Warriors, I think. It's just a bunch of guys. <laughs> uh, this is a really weird one that to get like a Warriors game um, from, from Koei Tecmo, but it happened. It exists. It was going up in price. I wanted to get it before it skyrocketed. If that even ended up happening, I'm not too sure, but, uh, yeah, token Rambu warriors, definitely a weird one. Another limited run blind box game here. Treasures of the Aegean trials rising. I think this was the first trials game to ever come to a Nintendo platform. I love trials. Trials is freaking awesome. Trials fusion specifically on PS4. I adore that game and trials rising is just more trials so yeah i totally recommend it if you like trials triangle strategy another one of those hd 2d games that unfortunately i just have not gotten around to but looks incredible i think actually if i were to enjoy one of these hd 2d games to the fullest and actually finish it it would probably be this one i think i would enjoy this more than octopath quite frankly so i definitely need to get to this eventually trip world deluxe from sunsoft and limited run games this is a colorized version of the original trip world uh pick this up because sunsoft the original developers of blaster master i uh, kind of figured this is, this is probably fun right tunic this was a pretty big deal when it came to xbox game pass a year or two ago this is that top down apparently pretty hard uh kind of zelda style game starring a little little cute fox here this one has a really cool special edition that includes like a, a map and stuff and a, a, a manual for the game. Kind of like the original Legend of Zelda manual for NES. Umihara Kawase Bazooka. This is a really weird kind of niche series that there's apparently there's just like a lot of these games like going all the way back to I think the SNES. Like this is a, a very prolific series that's just been kind of quietly existing for decades. Here's my sealed copy of Undertale with the, uh, the Best Buy sticker still. Uh, kind of one there didn't come off quite right cyberpunk bartender action valhalla i love this game this game is fantastic if you want a really fun visual novel filled with drink mixing and great characters and writing and aesthetic and vibes man this game i really like this game when i played it back in like 2018 or 2019. here we have these two valis collections the phantasm soldier i believe these are genesis games i want to say um i had never heard of this before i saw it pop up on lrg's website but uh, they're pretty fun, just 2D action games with a really nice art style, cool protagonist, fun gameplay. I've only played through the first one, but there's a lot of these games to get through. I think they're doing a third collection as well with like a bunch of like different types of PC ports for the Valus games. Very weird franchise that I never heard of, but cool to have here on the Switch. Void Terrarium, another NIS America game, but honestly, even if this wasn't NIS America, I think this game looks super sick. Here we have another one of these Square Enix games that you have to hold sideways to get the full artwork. Various Daylife. Now this, this is an Apple Arcade game, and it got a lot of flack when it was announced in that September 2022 Nintendo Direct because why? Like, why does this exist? More importantly, why does it have a physical copy? I mean, I'm super cool with that, but this is not the type of game you would expect to have a physical copy on the Nintendo Switch, but it just goes to show how Square Enix really was or has been releasing almost everything physically so far this generation, which is really cool. But uh, yeah, Various A Life is an Apple Arcade game. Not the best. Played a little bit of it because uh, I have it digitally as well. It's fine. The Walking Dead, the final season. Now, if you don't know, The Walking Dead is my favorite TV series of all time. I adore The Walking Dead. Just started watching the new show, The Ones Who Live. Very hype, very exciting. My boy Rick Grimes is back, but these Telltale games are all right. You know, I don't think they're anything that special. Season one and two are my favorite for sure. Uh, season three was the weakest, in my opinion, and, and season four is pretty good too. But I wish they had ported all of these to the Switch, or sorry, I should say, I wish they had all gotten physical copies because I think they all came out digitally, but this is the only one that got a physical. And even then, I think it's just episode one of season four on the cartridge because as you can see here it says uh season pass card details on back of the box yeah and get the download download the rest of it as it came out which is always i was always kind of annoying with these telltale releases warhammer 40k bolt gun this is a relatively recent pickup for me but this is a a doom clone essentially a boomer shooter set in the warhammer 40k universe i am so out of my depth when it comes to warhammer 40k but this is a lot of fun here we have a pair of warioware games on the nintendo switch warioware get it together and warioware move it you know i never played smooth moves on the wii and i guess in terms of like what i expected for a warioware on switch that really used the joy con like i guess move it satisfies that itch but neither of these games really are what I wanted when it comes to WarioWare on the Switch. Like, they're both gr good games. Like, I have nothing wrong with them, really. Like, they're both fine. Get it together, I do enjoy more than Move It. But, like, 
WarioWare Gold on 3DS was so good. Like, that is the gold standard, pun intended, of WarioWare. And I was hoping we would get something like that on Switch. But WarioWare Get It Together is like this completely new concept where you're moving a character on the screen, which makes sense because of the co-op aspects. And then Move It is a, a motion party game, which is fine. Um, and I'm glad they tried something new with Get It Together. But I hope in the future we get another more, it sounds kind of weird to say this for WarioWare, but a more classic style WarioWare game on the Switch. Warriors Orochi 4 and Warriors Orochi Ultimate had to get both versions of this. Uh, this one was getting pretty pricey, so I picked it up, and then I saw this was also available, and I was like, you know what? Let's have two versions of Warriors Orochi 4. Love Warriors games. Awesome. West of Loathing, this is that really fun uh, kind of slapstick uh, stick figure comedy game. It was really expensive for a while. I think Limited Run did the original release of it, but they recently reprinted it through Video Games Plus, a Canadian online retailer, so I had to pick this up. Super cool to have it finally. I always wanted to play this one. A couple of Wonder Boy games here. We have the Wonder Boy Collection as well as Wonder Boy Asha in Monster World, and that includes Monster World 4 there. I mentioned earlier, I believe, the Dragon's Trap remake from Dotemu, or Dotemu, or Dotemu, whatever their developer's name is. And that Dragon's Trap remake is what made me a fan of Wonder Boy and Monster Boy. So I had to pick up these collections. Um, I have this one digitally. This one's weird because they've re-released it on Inan's website, I believe, with like even more games. So this is technically the inferior version of this collection, I think. And then Asha in Monster World, I'm not too... I'm not too familiar with this one, to be completely honest with you. But Monster Boy, Wonder Boy, cool, cool series. Here we have the Kickstarter backer edition of the Wonderful 101 Remastered. I was a Kickstarter backer for this port to the Switch. Uh, not a great port, but I mean, as I've said time and time again throughout this video, I'm so happy that really every Wii U game of consequence, except for a few like Xenoblade and the Wind Waker and Twilight Princess HD, like most Wii U games that matter have come over. Even though this wasn't a great port, I am glad it did make its way over to the Nintendo Switch. They kind of just put like the bottom screen stuff on the top screen. So it's kind of like picture in picture. It's fine. Uh, this backer edition, I don't think there's anything different other than the slipcover here, which has like a little uh, kind of thank you note on the back from Kamiya and Inama. So yeah, happy to have this one and happy to support what is a pretty good game on Kickstarter. The World Ends With You Final Remix and a Neo The World Ends With You. Been needing to play both of these games. I started at World Ends With You on DS like 10 years ago, probably, uh, but never got too deep into it. XCOM 2 Collection. I'm going to be honest, I had forgotten I even owned this one because I mentioned the Borderlands one and the Bioshock one. I did not think I had this one. So now I have all three of those like 2K collections they released on the same day in 2020. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I'm going to be honest, I didn't even know I had this one. <laughs> and now we get to my beloved Xenoblade Chronicles here. We start with a Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. This is by far my least favorite Xenoblade game. I know that might be a hot take. Uh, I think the gameplay in this is easily the weakest. The gameplay just in like terms of combat mechanics, but also just exploring and stuff, I think is the weakest. The story and characters are really good, but um, I would still say they're weaker than Xenoblade 2 and 3. I hate to say as such a big Xenoblade fan, but Xenoblade 2 and 3, I think, are just leagues, leagues better than this game, including their DLC. Um, but still, still a great game, just... Pales in comparison to 2 and 3, in my opinion. But then we have Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which is just an absolute masterpiece of a game, play, storytelling, music. Everything about this game is just fantastic. I think it has the best cast of characters. I think it has the best gameplay. Eh, that might be debatable between 2 and 3. 3's gameplay is really good. Um, but in between 2 and 3, we, of course, had Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Torna, which is a fantastic prequel story to Xenoblade 2 following Laura and Jin. Really happy that this ended up getting a physical release. And then, of course, we have Xenoblade Chronicles 3, which, once again, maybe has better gameplay than Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but I prefer the cast and story of Xenoblade 2 overall. When you, you kind of weigh everything, I think Xenoblade 2 is the best Xenoblade Chronicles game, uh, but 3, 3 is not too far behind, and then 1 is like all the way down there somewhere. Here we have Zeo Drifter, another game from Atui, the developers of Mutant Muds, kind of their take on a, a small, bite-sized Metroidvania game. Uh, this one gets a lot of hype alongside Mutant Muds, but I don't think it even, it even comes close to Mutant Muds, in my opinion. I mean, it's still a fun little indie game, but eh, just play Metroid, you know? Mutant Muds kind of did something unique. This is just a worse version of Metroid, or like, just play Axiom Verge or something, you know? I don't know, it's, it's fine. Really getting to the end of my individual games here. So here we have Ukulele in the Impossible Lair. This was Platonic's take on a Donkey Kong Country game, which, I mean, if you know the history there, Platonic is mostly composed of developers from Rareware that had left after the Microsoft buyout or, like, right before, right? So basically, the Donkey Kong Country devs came back 
and made another Donkey Kong Country game, which is just awesome. Yoshi's Crafted World. This is a game that I feel like no one really talks about or even cares about, but I thought it was really good. People always say Wooly World is peak modern Yoshi, and Wooly World's really good, but I think I like this game more. I think they did more interesting stuff with the gameplay, different elements with like the going in the background and stuff. Even, I mean, yeah, going to the flip side or whatever, that was kind of lame. They hyped that up a little bit too much and then it didn't end up really panning out. But even just being able to walk in some sort of 3D uh, kind of environments at times, uh, just made this game a little bit more interesting in my opinion than, uh, than Wooly World. And there's also just so many different types of level themes. Like every three levels, there's just a completely new world you're in. There's like a weird clown robot chasing you in one level. Then the next you're doing some stuff in like a lava land, snow world. Like there's, there's a lot of cool stuff in Crafted World. East Origin, this is the only East game I actually have uh, physically on Switch. I think I have a copy of 8 coming. They recently reprinted that, but East, similarly to Legend of Heroes, is a franchise I would love to get into, but it's not the most accessible. We have East Origin, and then you have to skip all the way up to 8, I think, is the next one available on Switch. So, haven't given this a shot yet, but at least we got the, the first games on, on Switch. At least I'm assuming this is the first game, considering it's called Origin, but JRPGs are weird. Maybe that's not the case. Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelist Link Evolution. I think this one actually has a, uh, yeah, Pro Proglio card in there. Um, I grew up playing mostly Magic with my brother, but we did play some Yu-Gi-Oh! And uh, it was cool to have this. I think this came out back in 2019. I played this for a little bit. Uh, just kind of scratch that itch. I don't really dabble too much in like digital card games, but uh, this one was cool to have. And I, I'm excited for that Dragon Ball Super card game they, they announced. I think they're going to like do a digital version of that. So I'll definitely be checking that out. And then the final game I have for the Nintendo Switch, at least in an English copy, is Yoru Kill Deluxe Edition from NIS America. I believe this is kind of like a, a Danganronpa kind of visual novel. But that's not all because I do have some Japanese games. Let me clear the, the cat here from this mat. There is this, uh, this is kind of interesting. This is just a code in the box for Kirby Dream Buffet. I believe they released this in South Korea. Uh, I wanted to pick this up because I thought it was really just interesting how... They released a physical box with like a box art and like a back of the box, you know, fact sheet for Dream Buffet. I wish I wish we had just gotten like a physical copy of this in America, even if it was super limited. That would have been nice. But still, this is kind of a neat thing to have, even though it's literally just plastic. Here we have a Buddy Mission Bond, another Koei Tecmo game, but this time Nintendo published it. So this is a visual novel, and it's one of the few games that Nintendo released in Japan and nowhere else in the world on the Switch. So uh, hoping for a localization on this one, I was thinking like, oh, maybe I'll play this while uh, just translating it with my phone or something. According to how long to beat, this is like a 40 hour game. So I don't think that's going to be happening anytime soon. And that also makes me think they probably won't end up localizing it, which is disappointing because I have heard from people in Japan that apparently this game is uh, really good. Here's an interesting trio of uh, games for you if you are a Switch collector and you want to have some complete copies of games. So for three games in Japan, they've released the game with all of the DLC on the cartridge. So the first one, of course, is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. This includes the uh, Master Mode, Trial of the Sword, and Champion's Ballad all on the cartridge, which is super cool. Um, just, you know, I, I wish they had done this in America, but hey, this does have English on the cartridge. So it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like you really need an English copy if you wanted to check this out on your own but beyond that we also got splatoon 2 with the octo expansion on the cartridge uh, i'm not sure if there was any updates released after this re after this uh physical cart came out but it does have octo expansion on there at the very least and then finally we had that mario kart date that uh i had bought and then realized later on that they did do an esrb version so this is kind of maybe i'll just sell this one or something I also have a japanese copy of detective pikachu because for some reason these were selling for like nine dollars free shipping like a week after the game came out so i bought one Woohoo. Here we have Otogi Katsugeki Mamare Bakaru, something along those lines. This is that game from Goodfield, the developers of Epic Yarn and Crafted World and Woolly World. This is their like Goemon spiritual successor. A lot of fun. I really hope this gets localized. I didn't, you know, get too deep in it because I, I do think it will get localized, but I played, you know, the first couple of levels and I really liked what I played. I'm a big fan of Warriors games, what can I say? So, this was a launch title in Japan, Dragon Quest Heroes 1 plus 2. Uh, this never got localized for some reason, even though the games came out in America on PS4. I don't know why, maybe it has something to do with the, the size of the cartridge needed for this game. Uh, this is pretty pricey-ish. I think it was even above, it was like above retail. Like this cost more than Breath of the Wild on March 3rd, 2017 in Japan. I'm pretty sure because they had to use the uh, the 32 gig cartridge. But this is both of the Dragon Quest Warriors games that came out uh, back in like 20, 
What would it be like 2015 and 2016 respectively, I think. And speaking of Square Enix, we have Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remastered Edition. This one sadly did not get a English physical release, which is surprising considering like Romancing Saga Minstrel Song has one. But uh, Crystal Chronicles here have the physical version. This is the Etrian Odyssey Origins Collection, which is the first three games coming over from the DS on the Nintendo Switch. Um, this one does have English on the cartridge. That's the only reason I bought it. It didn't get a physical release in the West at all. So if you want to have a physical copy of this game, yes, it is, uh, you know, I'm not sure what language that is on the on the um, front. I know it's not Japanese, but maybe it's Chinese. But either way, uh, it does have English on the cartridge, so you can play this. It's just going to look a little bit uh, weird on your shelf. Yokai Watch 4 Plus Plus. I need to get the uh, the Yokai Watch 1 remake that they released in Japan on the Switch. I don't know if you guys knew that. They actually did remake the first Yokai Watch game for the Nintendo Switch early on. But I guess at that point, Nintendo had no interest in localizing it and publishing it in the West. So we never got them over here. Okay, these two I'll admit I know nothing about. They were very cheap. I was ordering some other stuff from Play Asia, and these popped up for like I think eight dollars or something a piece. Uh, this one, this one looked kind of inch. nah, nah. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what either of these are. Card Fight Vanguard's like a a long running series in Japan though. I don't think it ever really got localized, but there are some of these games on 3DS too, I believe. This right here is Onimusha Warlords. I adore the original Onimusha game. Uh, I, I played it when it came to Nintendo Switch. I've never played any of the sequels because I was hoping, like, they they remastered the first one. Surely they're going to bring back Onimusha uh, 2 and 3 and, and, and so on and so forth. But they just haven't done that. I guess this didn't do too well. But Onimusha is a fantastic game. I would say this is, like, right up there with some of those original Resident Evils for me. And then my final standalone Nintendo Switch game to show right now is Bloodstained Curse of the Moon Chronicles. Uh, not sure where to put this one on the shelf because it has English on the spine, but it also has the Saro rating there, and it is a Japanese copy, but it's just like, it is English, but this has uh, both Bloodstained Curse of the Moon 1 and 2 on the cartridge, which is super cool. All right, for this next section, this is all of like my, I would say, medium-sized boxed games that I kind of had on a separate shelf. There will be some redundancies here, like I have the Pokemon double packs, but I keep the individual cases outside of those. So some of these might be a little bit redundant, but for the sake of showing everything in my collection, we will go over everything. So starting off here in no particular order, although this is kind of, I guess it's close to being an order, Annapurna. This is the Annapurna Interactive Collection. This came out late last year. Super cool, super deluxe, super premium, super limited uh, kind of release from them over there. That includes a ton of their games all on one cartridge. So we have Donut County, Gorogoa, Hindsight, I Am Dead, If Found, Kentucky Route Zero TV Edition, Neon White, Sayonara Wild Hearts, Solar Ash, The Artful Escape, The Pathless, and What Remains of Edith Finch. I love quite a few of those games, so this was a no-brainer when I saw it go up for pre-order back in, like, August, I want to say, last year. Trek to Yomi Deluxe Edition, I think this was a... Was this an Xbox game or a PlayStation game first? I can't remember what platform it came to first, but this is kind of like a 2D black and white samurai film if it were a video game, and I thought I always thought this one looked super cool. Crypt of the Necrodancer, Collector's Edition. So I talked about Cadence of Hyrule earlier. Of course, I also love the original game here as well. This was signed by, I believe, the game's, like, director or something. I bought this at PAX West. I, I bought a sealed copy, and I wasn't intending on opening it because I have it digital. Um, and when I went to get it sealed, he just ripped it right open in front of me. I guess to sign it, that kind of makes sense, but I didn't really want it opened, so... That was kind of annoying, but Crypt of the Necrodancer, an absolutely great rhythm, kind of roguelike game. I love this game a lot. Two Point Campus, this was very cheap, I think, on Woot, Amazon's Woot service, so had to get that. Sonic Origins Plus, I really hate the packaging on these because if you just hold it up, it just kind of all falls out with a little art book and the uh, the game case itself. Not only do I have Sonic Origins Plus, though, I also have Sonic Mania Plus, so I showed off Sonic Mania by itself earlier, but I do also have the, uh, the Plus version here. And another Sega release here in the annoying packaging, we have a Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania. Here's the big box for that Our World is Ended game I showed earlier from Key Cube. And then these are cool. These were all on Black Friday sale at Play Asia from, I think, East Asia Soft, right? But these are all games I'd never really heard of. We have Chaos Code, New Sign of Catastrophe. Uh, this is a fighting game, I believe. Yeah, high-speed 2D combat with a wide variety of special moves anytime and anywhere. Um... Play Asia has a lot of weird games that like you never hear about. I don't know if, what that means for the quality of them. Here we have Sense 5, I believe, is the name of this one. Omen of Sorrow, I thought looked cool. And then the only other one I got that day was Twin Blades of the Three Kingdoms. A couple other smaller ones here. Active Life Outdoor Challenge. Had to get those leg straps. Only at Target. Weird release. Super Epic Badge Edition. This was another blind box game from Limited Run. I'll have more to say on this 
in uh, a little bit when we show the super big box stuff but uh, let's just say limited run was not supposed to send me this here's the big box that nintendo switch sports came in i do want to get there's a reprint version that has golf included like on the on the cover art and in the cartridge so i'm gonna be hunting that down here soon zombies ate my neighbors and ghoul patrol from limited run this was their packs variant they were selling for pretty cheap at the end of the year last year so i picked it up because it was like I think it was like $25 maybe might have been cheaper than that and then we have all of these empty cardboard boxes for the double packs for Pokemon so Sword and Shield Scarlet and Violet and Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl speaking of PAX variants my Castlevania anniversary collection it did actually come from this box from PAX West then we have the Zelda Breath of the Wild Explorer's Guide Edition already showed the uh the case for this without the ASRB but this just includes like a little little guidebook for Breath of the Wild I've got the Link's Awakening uh, Dreamer Edition that comes with the art book. Europe and Japan got a way cooler special edition than the United States, but hey, I'm glad we got anything at all. Some more PAX things here. These were, uh, I think, PAX West 2022, Shantae and Shantae Risky's Revenge. That's why I uh, I had uh, Seven Sirens and Half Genie Hero on the shelf, but not these two. A Missing Pirate's Curse, obviously, because that game is, I think it's the most expensive Switch game, right? But I'm uh, happy to have these two even though quite frankly these big boxes are kind of dumb here's the special edition of hyper light drifter i bought this before that annapurna collection came out this is a weird release so we have mario kart 8 deluxe with super mario party this is still sealed um i'm not sure when this came out exactly but just a weird little two pack of these games that nintendo released and then a couple of these vhs editions that limited run likes to do at pax west so we have river city girl zero in the vhs format alongside star wars knights of the old republic one and star wars knights of the old republic 2 um so i think i'm gonna sell because i had pre-ordered code War 2 on their website i think i'm gonna sell the standard edition of that game and um just keep these these vhs copies here these are really weird so gamestop was selling these i think for 15 dollars a piece like in this two pack not too long ago we have darius burst ex plus another chronicle and darius hd these are shmups for the nintendo switch alongside cotton uh, fantasy and cotton reboot another shmup series i believe yeah um another kind of like that umihara kawaze series i was talking about this is another series the cotton series that just has been going on forever like quietly in the background another weird one from nintendo this was just released late last year there is a version of this that includes an actual copy of the game but this is a download code for mario party super mario party with these red and blue joy con they did release a version like back in 2018 i believe that included a pair of joy con and a physical copy of the game that's pretty expensive now but uh, i bought this because i needed more joy con this is a recent pickup little town hero big idea edition this is that game from game freak that ended up coming out and not being very good another japanese import here this is the azure striker gunvolt pack kind of special edition from japan I, I saw this at pax west one year at the nt curates booth and i decided to pick it up it looks like it includes their the ova and a cd alongside the game which is pretty cool this is the only special edition i have for an nis america game i believe i guess not counting little town here which i just showed but uh, this is yomawari lost in the dark uh, there's another yomawari game on switch but these looked super cute and also sad here we have the gear shifters collector's edition from numskull uh this is funny so i got persona 5 royal early on switch but the person that had it early like they obviously broke the street date on their copies and they were selling them on ebay and uh, they were selling it alongside this so I was like, okay, I guess I'll get gear shifters to get Persona 5 Royal early and do a video on it. So this is just a racing game on Switch. Of course, I do have all three of the Pretty Presents collections. This is Soul Nomad and Phantom Brave. This is Pretty Presents Volume 2, including Makai Kingdom and ZHP. And then finally, Pretty Presents Volume 3, La Pucelle, Ragnarok, and Rhapsody. This is the original Rhapsody game. This is the one I actually did play some of uh, back when this came out. I think this was either last year or the year before. I think it might have been the year before uh, when this came out. Here we have the Frogun special edition. I also bought the uh, the plush of this character here. This game's cute. It's fun. It's not anything like too special, but it's it's a good game. Of course, I have the Fire Emblem Warrior special edition, which comes with the character card set, the poster, and the music CD set. We got the Aladdin and the Lion King Disney Classic Games special edition here. This was pretty cheap on eBay, so I picked it up. You know, I guess I could talk about this for a little bit here. I don't really necessarily go for, like, special editions unless it's a Nintendo game. Um, so some of this stuff, I, I kind of want to downsize a little bit. I know you're probably watching this video. You got to this point, you're like, wow, he wants to downsize, huh, with your 8 million Switch games. Uh, yeah, I think something like this I probably don't need. Here we have the Cruel King and the Great Hero Storybook Edition. Uh, this is the sequel, or not sequel necessarily, to Lia Princess and the Blind Prince that I was talking about earlier. Um, I hope this one has better gameplay but this was like 
super cheap on Amazon. I think this was $15 for the special edition, which includes a plush of the, uh, I don't know if that's the Cruel King or the Great Hero. That's probably the Great Hero, and the, I'm assuming the Dragon's the King based on their other stories. But uh, yeah, this one was really cheap and has a fantastic art style. I'm hoping the gameplay is better than Liar Princess. Here we have the Monster Hunter Stories 2 Wings of Ruin Collector's Edition that includes the uh, the Amiibo in there. Kind of hard to see. I don't know why it's so dark right now. All right, now for this next part here, I just laid out all my big boxes, or at least most of them, on this white table here. I'll talk about them as we go through. Not in any particular order. Um, as you can see, I kind of just stacked them up here below this uh, this soundproofing foam on my my wall. Um, so there's some Xenoblades up there I still need to take down. But uh, yeah, so starting off here, we have the Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes Special Edition. This was only released in Europe. I actually found it at a local shop here in... Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, though, which is really crazy. Um, yeah, I don't know why they didn't release this in North America, because, I mean, we got the we got the first Fire Emblem Warriors Special Edition, but not for Three Hopes. Um, so to find this locally was just super awesome. It didn't have the game in it, so it is just all of the contents, like the art book and the little uh, standees, but that's all I need, because I already had the, uh, the game. So this one was super cool to find at a local shop. I think it was like $40, maybe, which is pretty good. Here we have the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom Collector's Edition. This one is actually uh, still sealed. This thing is super heavy. I like how for most of Nintendo's special editions on Switch, they kind of went for this more uh, kind of uniform design, as we'll see with the, the Xenoblades and stuff, uh, like and with Metroid Dread here. But for Tears of the Kingdom, they were just like, yep, let's just make it absolutely gigantic. Just, just absolutely massive. Here we have the Metroid Dread Special Edition. This is where that disgusting steelbook came from, but... Obviously, super cool to have a, uh, a special edition of one of my favorite Switch games. And then we have this Dragon's Lair trilogy here that is absolutely massive. Now, I would never have bought this on my own. Like, I would never have bought this. However, I bought those limited run blind boxes that I mentioned, and one of the games I got in that um, in one of those special edition blind boxes was a game called Super Epic. I mentioned it earlier in this video. Well, someone commented on my video and told me, like, hey... Limited Run didn't even have that game on the list of possible games to get in their uh, in their blind boxes. So I filed a support ticket because I don't want Super Epic. I, that's lame. And uh, they actually ended up sending me this as kind of a, a apology for sending me a game that wasn't even technically eligible to be in the blind box, which is definitely a way cooler game to get from LRG in a blind box. Speaking of massive special editions, we have the Bayonetta 3 Trinity Masquerade Edition. This one is also still sealed uh, because I got a copy of Bayonetta 3 early from ebay but still a really cool one to have this one's really neat so this is famicom detective club this did get released in english just not physically so you can buy these games on the uh, the switch eShop, but there was only a physical copy released in japan unfortunately this physical version does not have english on the cartridge but it includes like an art book i believe and uh of course the game itself uh, just just a shame it didn't get released physically here i would say it's because it's too niche but then they released another code physically so i don't really get the logic behind this one I did buy the SMT5 Fall of Man edition here as well. And here's the No More Heroes 1 and 2 special edition from Unlimited Run. This one's kind of cool because there's like a magnet here. So you can kind of like magnetize these. Let's see if you can pick it up here. There it is. It's magnets. So definitely a cool kind of display piece if you are a big No More Heroes fan. This is the AI The Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative uh, Collector's Edition. This just comes with like a figure of the main girl from the game, I believe. Then over here, we have the Taiko no Tatsujin Drum and Fun Bundle. This was only released in, I think, Japan and Europe, but the game actually got delisted from the eShop, so I decided to pick this up. It uh, comes with, of course, the drum set for Taiko no Tatsujin on the Nintendo Switch. I already have the uh, some of the ones on Wii U over there, so wanted to get one for Switch as well, and it got delisted, so perfect timing. Here we have another limited edition from LRG. This is the Dark Crystal Tactics Age of Resistance Special Edition. Love, uh, love Jim Henson, love... Uh, you know, Dark Crystal is not like a great movie or anything, but just a really cool art and, uh, you know, practical effects and all that. So uh, this game always looks super neat. Haven't gotten around to playing it. I don't think it was ever reviewed that well, but uh, the special edition, cool to have that. And I already showed the uh, the standard uh, single individual copy there, but I do have the special edition for the Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster. This is unopened. I have no intention of opening it. Uh, there are some really cool, uh, you know, goodies included, like little 8-bit models of the, the Warriors of Light and all that, but... I don't know, it's not something I really, I'm not really itching to open this. It also has a really sick vinyl with like a cool printing on the vinyl, but not something I need to open. 
And then here are the final four special editions I have to show you all. So starting off, I have the Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, uh, Definitive Works, I should say, uh, for Xenoblade Chronicles 1. I already talked about that game a little bit, as well as Xenoblade 3. I'm actually, funnily enough, despite liking Xenoblade 2 more, I'm, I'm missing Xenoblade 2's uh, special edition, but Xenoblade 3 special edition, I love that game. Fire Emblem Engage, didn't get to talk about it too much earlier. In fact, I didn't even mention it because uh, this is actually still sealed. I bought the game digitally, so Fire Emblem Engage, I actually liked a lot more than uh, Three Houses, but there's definitely still some issues with it. You know, the plot and the characters are weaker, but the gameplay and, you know, the graphics and everything else are much stronger, so kind of pick your poison with Fire Emblem Engage. And then the final thing here, uh, I guess this technically counts. This is the Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light 30 anniversary special edition that comes with like a, a crystal cartridge and a download code for the NES ROM localized for the first time. But still, um, cool that they did it. And this is what I'm talking about with how Nintendo does like these more, sometimes more uniform uh, special editions where all of these are like the same size. I much prefer this. I hope they continue doing this with like Switch 2 special editions because I think it looks just way better on a shelf. And while we're at it, since we're doing everything here, I guess we'll show off all my controllers and stuff that I have. So I do have the N64 uh, online controller basically impossible to put these back in the box and make them look nice i have opened this i do play with it because uh, i actually really like the n64 controller but then down here we have a few more sorry about the lighting here we have the nes controllers we have the snes controller we have the uh the infamous joy con charge grip and then just a couple pairs of joy con here these are actually still sealed i believe uh, this one's open i used those back when skyward sword came out some pro controllers, we have the Monster Hunter Rise one, don't have the Sunbreak controller, we have the Splatoon 3 pro controller, we have the Tears of the Kingdom pro controller, and we have the uh, the Smash Ultimate GameCube controller from Japan. And then I guess the true, true final thing to show here before we end off is my actual Nintendo Switch collection. Now I do have, not a launch Switch, I actually sold that back when I was younger and upgraded to a V2 Switch, if you remember back in 2019 they kind of re-release the Switch quietly with like new packaging and a better battery life. I don't have the box for that anymore, but I do have that V2 Switch still. And then I have gone crazy <laughs> on the Nintendo Switch OLED. So I have my white OLED. I didn't even get it at release. I got it a few months later. But then I also picked up the Splatoon 3 OLED, the Pokemon Scarlet and Violet OLED, the Tears of the Kingdom OLED, and the Mario kind of red special edition. I also have, this is my only Switch Lite, the, uh, the Zacian and Zamazenta Sword and Shield Switch Lite. Yeah, I kind of decided to go for a full set of these uh, Switch OLEDs. I'm missing, they just released that like new Smash Ultimate bundle that has a black dock. I kind of want to get that. I also do want to get, even though I don't like the games very much, the uh, the Diamond and Pearl Switch lights Because I just like the Pokemon Special Editions in general. I always think they look really sleek. But yeah, I have a lot of Switches. Uh, I haven't done unboxings for a couple of these, so definitely go check those out if you haven't already. I know this was actually a pretty short video, so let me know in the comments down below, what games do you think I should add to my Nintendo Switch collection in the future? If you made it this far into the video, I do appreciate your support, and of course I would appreciate it if you did subscribe for more future Nintendo Switch videos, collecting videos, and also I do a lot of news and discussions on this channel, so thank you so much for watching, and until next time, folks, peace!